We continue this journey, Jim Cornette, CM Punk, and AEW Volume 2, Year 2 Omnibus. Let's get going, picking up right where we left off. Jim, before we review anything or talk about anything, well, we're going to talk about this. I was about to say before, we, well, what else is left? News broke yesterday as we are recording, a little bit before the beginning of WWE Monday Night Raw on the USA Network, that Raw in Chicago had an unexpected visitor, that being CM Punk. Reports have now come out that Punk may have been on the plane from Florida to Chicago with some of the talent. He came, he said hello to people, met with Triple H, or at least saw Triple H. I don't know if met with is the right terminology. I, 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 yeah, I think that might be a grandiose terminology. He saw and spoke with sounds to me like it would be accurate. Reports are that he was asked to leave by either Vince McMahon through someone or just by the head of security on his own, but that's the story as we know it. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, last question or statement first. The head of security, I don't care who he is, is not going to ask uh, CM Punk to leave unless he was instructed to. The head of security for the WWE, whoever that may be, as I said these days, is not going to eject any wrestling personality without uh, either being instructed to or at least asking somebody, is he supposed to be here or whatever? And I think, obviously, the... <laughs> hey, Punk saw some of the boys on the plane and said, hello, oh, why don't you come down and visit? Well, I've got some free time this afternoon. And do you remember when Jerry Jarrett took the Russian to Stamford, to Titan Tower, when he was still with TNA, when he was trying to yeah. get out of TNA, and they wouldn't Oleg Proteus. let him go. Um, He said, okay, and he went down and visited and said hello to a few people, and at some point, and I can believe it was Vince, because he's probably the only one that would have the... If it wasn't Vince, then whoever had the thought probably asked Vince, since Vince was from what we hear, making changes and corrections and additions and subtractions to the rest of the show all day. Not only does he look like a villain, but now we're supposed to believe he's working from some kind of villain's lair where everyone's calling in and yes. he just answers the phone. Yes, do this. And then they well, do no, it. no, no, it's not the phone now. Come on now. We may be jumping ahead, but it's not the phone. This is the fucking 21st century. He's got the big time video screen where he it looks like he's beaming in from the Romulan spaceship onto the deck of the enterprise but nevertheless vince or someone at a high level probably made the call that he's under contract to tony khan and this could be a litigation situation it's not like the old days where some some guy that wanted booked somewhere because he wasn't and didn't have a job, showed up at the back door and said hello to the boys and sat around to see if anybody would notice him. Punk is making, as we've talked about many times here on the show lately, a large check every week from AEW to sit at home and offer to come back and be shot down by the EVPs that are scared of him. But it's a valid contract where he's under contract and he's getting paid and if he's there, and it was already reported he was speaking with Triple H, then Tony Khan could, if he was want to do so, say that's contract tampering. So yeah, he, he's probably got to got to go. Um, <laughs> as well as the fact that it's just <laughs> the last story before this that we talked about was him being worth potentially. $52 million a year to AEW. Dollars. Yeah, and and now that he's heard that as well... Uh, he Give me a plane to, ticket to Chicago. <laughs> yeah. He, he's like, well, just, just to let you know, I'm worth $50 million to them, and we may be getting ahead of ourselves. It, it's The reports are, we'll talk about later, I'm sure, in the program, that... Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery Media Limited Incorporated LLC or whatever the fuck they are these days has said, well, we'd be interested in WWE programming. So, I mean, <laughs> or Punk could have probably already been back to work if the EVPs 
who have Tony's not only best interest, not at heart, but also his balls in their watch pocket, apparently, weren't such whiny little bitches that they sabotage it every time it's come up, and he wouldn't be able to be dangling himself around to other potential uh, interested parties, for fuck's sake. Huh. I imagine Triple H is in the back, busy doing stuff. It's raw. I mean, busy, his dad, or dad, his father-in-law. Oh. His dad. It was more like his grandfather, but his father-in-law's at home barking orders to everyone through his evil video screen. <laughs> Everything's going on. All of a sudden, it's a tap on the shoulder. You turn around. Hello there, pal. And it's fucking CM Punk. <laughs> Remember when Punk left, he had heat with Triple H more than even Vince. Yes, the infamous line, I don't have to work with you. You have to work with me or need to work with you. You need to work with me. If you're Tony Khan, how do you react to this? Well, you can't prevent someone, especially under the circumstances, from going to visit friends if they were invited on a personal basis. Punk did not appear on the program or do anything in any professional capacity. You can wonder if you're Tony Khan and you can have your legal department send a cease and desist or contract tampering or whatever the fuck, and then the WWE can deny it. But that that's stuff that they don't like to have going on because if there ever is a real legitimate case one of these days, then they don't want these little minor things to muddy the waters, you know, is like because now it's a track record, right? Well, they talked to this guy, and this guy was here, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's it's... He wouldn't be doing that if he was at work, at his job, doing what he wants to be doing. But he's got a lot of free time on his hands because the EVPs are gutless and don't have the company's best interests at heart. So he's able to wander around and do things to piss people off. And he didn't, he's not guilty of anything. He did nothing illegal nor to violate his contract by going over and saying hello to people in his hometown when they're there in, and uh, they're visiting him rather than the other way around. So... <laughs> Do you believe that wrestlers should in these times... Uh, Swami's going. He obviously has thoughts on this. In the era of contract tampering being a real thing, and very little needs to be done to trigger that, should wrestlers be banned from going to other promotions, major wrestlers, major promotions? To their shows. Well, they pretty much already are, aren't they? How often does it happen? It's not a wise Ricky thing Starks. To do. The Ricky Starks thing was a big deal. Well, but here's the thing. It only happens with Tony's guys because they know either, well, nothing's going to happen bad or <laughs> they're wanting to get fired. They do other things to try to get fired. He won't fire them. Or they just don't give a shit because, or it's like they do it on purpose to say, hey, remember me? I'm over here. You know, you, you're not paying attention to me when I'm around, but when I'm over here at the other place, maybe this will get your attention. It's all of those things. But for the most part, you don't see that happening. As I said in the territory days, and even sometimes in the old days of WCW and WWF, guys who weren't booked in any meaningful place, didn't have a spot at all, or had, or were somewhere that they wanted to get out of and didn't give a shit what that place thought, would come and hang around, visit people, and try to be seen or just catch somebody's eye or whatever. But it doesn't happen in, in the modern era with guys under contracts, except every once in a while with somebody in AEW has their feelings hurt and wants to get some attention or doesn't give a shit. When's the last time you saw a WWE contracted talent at any other show ever? When's the last... I mean, no impact, I guess, works with everybody, you know, at one point or another, but besides that, Tony's got guys under contract to Ring of Honor that apparently Ring of Honor is in their own homes because they never leave them. They don't, you know, so it just, 
But no, in, if, if you're under contract to a meaningful promotion, it's pretty much understood you don't go and hang out at the other company's shows already. Remember the what was the the discount bushwhacker that came to the uh, TNA show WrestleMania weekend fifteen years ago? We put him on television. He got fired. That was that's I don't know an what indication. About. What the discount bushwhacker? We just talked about that. Who was the? They were. Uh, they were oh oh the the no they were scottish or they, that's irish right or, what were the names god the, i know who you're talking about now scottish irish fellow highlanders no highlanders and yeah he was sitting in the fucking crowd and we were in between i've told this story now you remember yeah. it but we we were in between matches and they were getting crowd shots and somebody in the truck said well that's old so and so whatever his fucking name was and Jeff's sitting there. He's what? That's it, it was a WWF wrestler. E, I guess it was by then, sitting in our crowd. And he's okay. Well, when we come back up, let's fucking say so everybody's here in Orlando to see TNA Impact. And they had a shot of him, and they chironed his real name, not his gimmick name, because that would have been gimmick infringement, copyright, whatever. Because the stupid son of a bitch, he was on television in the crowd anyway. It's not like we shot him backstage. He's sitting in the crowd watching the matches. When he's in town for WrestleMania weekend and we're over at fucking Universal Studios with 800 people in a fucking... And NXT, and, remember, they showed Britt Baker on the sidelines, I think maybe during War Games or something, and they're like, that's here's right. Adam Cole's concerned girlfriend. That's right. So Everybody does it to Tony. So, because they know they're not going to get in trouble. I just saw Buddy Matthews in the Hall of Fame next to Rhea Ripley. There you go. Okay, <laughs> but so. All right, now we have to compile a list of all <laughs> AEW talent that has been seen or in some way affiliated with a WWE Umbrellas programming and see if it's more than 50% of them. Hey, real quick, back to Punk. Dave Meltzer reported, I have a quote here, the feeling in WWE was that he was there because he wanted back. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. Well, I'm, I'm glad he was so... Uh, first he says, well, this was the feeling, but I have no idea. Um, why would you want back now if the guy's paying you to do absolutely nothing for him? Now, I can believe he might want back when this contract is up and he gets away from these fucking children that he's been working with for the most of the last year and a half or two. But, uh, again, Uncle Dave has to, well, now he's going hat in hand begging for a job. He has a job. They just won't let him do it. He's still getting paid. He doesn't need to go anywhere and do anything. He came to fucking rattle some cages. And and visit some old friends and just just let people know he was around. Yeah, when was the last time a major salaried professional wrestler got a gig by just showing up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, son of a bitch punks out there, we forgot that he was still <laughs> around. But now that he is, has showed up and we see that he can still breathe now we're interested we never would have thought of that before what the fuck punk said i have an idea i'm gonna do what harley race did but just not light the ring on fire yeah well there you go because i think that's where harley went wrong was setting fire <laughs> to the ring yeah no that if if punk wanted to go back to the wwe right now right instantly Get me out of here. Let, I'll, I'll fucking, I'll tear up my own contract. Just get me out. He wouldn't go to the show and show up at catering to see if he could get booked. We would never hear about it until he made his fucking debut. But he knew, he knew that everybody would hear if he accepted the invitation of a few guys on the plane to come down and say hello. He knew everybody would hear about it. And he didn't have to say a word. And that's what he exactly what he wanted to happen. Hey, Tony, you remember you're paying me a lot of money and I could be performing for you or I can be 
over here saying hello to my friends and you can still send me my check every week. Do you think Punk should go on tour with Raw, where he just shows up at the venue and gets kicked out and no one sees it? <laughs> yes, I think that actually... <laughs> Three weeks in a row, and he would have the most downloads of any wrestling personality on social media in the world. <laughs> if he did that three weeks in a row, the people would be talking about nothing but CM Punk. And and Raw would be selling more tickets just for the people to be able to get in the parking lot and see if they can spot him. Because it would be fucking, it would, it would just be interesting and scintillating, which is what they need shit to be. Well, we will see how this turns out, but the uh, ever or never ending story of the AEW drama slash what's going on with CM Punk continues. We will continue to cover it here. All right. Speaking of other states, let's talk real briefly about now we've talked long enough on this program that a couple of other things have taken place of note in the state of Illinois. The city of Chicago, Chicagoland, the metropolitan area, it was technically Cicero, Illinois. I've been to this arena. The Cicero Stadium, one of the guests at the Impact Wrestling event that took place on Saturday night, April the 29th, was uh, our friend Mr. Brooks. Our Mr. Brooks, CM Punk, was seen visiting... Some old friends and colleagues. We just called at, this, didn't we? At Impact Wrestling. And it, it's it's in his home area, although Cicero is probably not anywhere around Punk's neighborhood in Chicago. It's still, it's where he lives. And he was there visiting some, as I said, friends and colleagues. And I, the from what I understand, the fans were very happy to see him when he walked in. And they, they along with the talent, uh, ushered him right in to where he could visit for a while. And I know now Uncle Dave may say, well, he's trying to cover his ass. He needs a job. So hopefully he's he'll get booked with impact if his other visits don't work out. No, come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I'm, I've, that's a preemptive uh, uh, fuck you to Uncle Dave because here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking actually impact. What's up? What's the feller's name that runs that thing? Nordholm. Oh, he's a goof. Ed Nordholm should have, at that point, when he saw that man walk in, he just said, Punk, tell you what, we'll make you our highest paid wrestler by a dollar a year, plus give you 25 to 40% of the company if you will just come and be on our TV. Now, he was too busy asking Lenny Asper to twist his nipples. Hey! No, uh, from what I understand, Dave Meltzer reported that uh, CM Punk went there, he was ushered into the show, but on the way in, he killed several small puppies. Oh, well, that's why he came. Because, you know, that stray dog problem in Cicero, and, no, you know, Punk is an animal lover. Uh, it was old ladies that he kicked, and he turned a wheelchair over on the way out. There were a few photos that got out of Punk with different wrestlers backstage. Everyone seems happy. Ricky Morton was one of them. Again, this is now two different companies, two Rick, different Ricky shows. Ricky Morton, by the way, people say, wait a minute, is Ricky Morton now wrestling? He was uh, producing this weekend for Impact, is what we're, what we're hearing. But, a picture with Ricky Morton, picture with some of the wrestlers. Smiles on it. He's putting smiles on people's faces. So this is now two different shows in a week, and if we want to go a little bit further back, he apparently attended that New Japan show they did in California uh, a few months ago. So that's three different shows, three different companies. He's attended. No one's been punched in the eye or had a chair thrown at them. Everyone seems to be smiling at every photo I see. There are some people that think this is all an act, that CM Punk doesn't actually enjoy going out and seeing people and attending any of these things. He's just doing this to, I don't even know what the argument would be, troll Tony <laughs> Khan's wallet? I don't know. What are your thoughts on all this? Well, again, he say, Tony... I got, I got so much free time on my hands because of your immature, gutless... EVPs that, you know, I got to occupy myself somehow going over and saying hello to some old friends, catching some some grappling action at the various places around Chicago land, you know. Boy, I wish I had more to do with my time, like draw you millions of dollars, but, you know, I, I mean, we, we, we think the return is imminent because they've got big plans for the United Center. 
and and Uncle Dave has tried to start softening the blow to the AEW faithful out there by saying, well, it's going to mean a lot of money to the company, you know, with what uh, they're paying for rights fees these days for that Saturday show. If if Warner Brother Discovery did indeed ask for Punk by name, he's the brand name, you know, ask for it by name uh, for that show. They could put him on the video game cover again. They, they could put him back on the video game <laughs> cover. Still doesn't well, come out. <laughs> God damn it. They may have to take him back off of it because he might die of old age by the time that thing hits the shelves. My God, he's 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 40 now. He can't be wrestling when he's 77. But uh, he's basically showing Tony, you fucking moron. If I walk out into a goddamn parking lot, it makes news. And And who else do you have on your roster that can that can be said that about so smarten up get your head out of your ass and in the meantime he's having fun visiting different places in chicago i understand he's going to be signing muffins at mindy's bakery coming up on tuesday at 3 a.m get there early where do you but, think punk uh, will be next i mean what <laughs> will it be triple a in mexico city Will he show up at Karakin Hall in Tokyo? Where in the world will CM Punk be yeah, found I, next? I don't know if he's going to take an international flight just to troll Tony. Um, I think it probably has to be somewhere in the neighborhood of where he's at already. He has a, a home in California and a, a, a mansion there in Chicago. And I think he's got a a winter home down in Key West also. But... Uh, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. He's, he's living all over the world. Why don't we start with the big news that's actually transpiring as we are recording, Jim? AEW, let me pull this up right here. As part of the Warner Brother Discovery upfronts, here's the press release TNT launches a second night of wrestling with AEW Collision, featuring headliners Thunder Rosa. Miro, Samoa Joe, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Andrade El Idolo on Saturday, June 17th. So let me stop there. That's not even the press release. That's just the headline. What are your thoughts? That, well, that that's the headline, and that may be part of the headline. Um, and no disrespect to any of the people mentioned, because we've said good things about pretty much all of them at some point or another. But Jesus H. Christ, I, I, who picks the names to be released in a headline? They're, they're not names that have been used prominently on the programming that they already have. Miro's been in witness protection because he didn't, he didn't like creative is the best reason we've heard. Thunder Rosa has been injured for quite some time, so... Again, yes, she was at a high level in the women's division, but she's been off TV for six months or more. Hobbs, my God, yes. But <laughs> he's, over the past month, been a flunky and a bad reality TV news show parody segment. Samoa Joe, I'm a huge fan of. And he's probably been booked the best of the bunch of the people that were just mentioned. And... He hasn't exactly been setting the world on fire on their television. I, I don't understand how that, they, that becomes the lead here. With these names, with a Thunder Rosa, Miro, Andrade, the rumor of CM Punk oh, and, being involved. Andrade, who, wait a minute. How, no, it, who was it? Was he the one that, that, they, that Tony said, don't punch? Don't punch Sammy. And then he don't went punch right, Sammy and right to Sammy, Sammy and punched him. Yeah. As soon as he got to the building, he punched Sammy in the face. <laughs> So you get rewarded for punching a fucking guy by getting sent home, paid for well over six months, I believe it is, and then being announced as one of the stars of the new program. But with these names and the rumor of CM Punk being involved and maybe some of the other names, do you think AEW, you think it's a missed opportunity to call it AEW Collision or Saturday Collision as opposed to Saturday Malcontent? <laughs> No, I, th I think they need to be building up the collision <laughs> when all the people that can't get along, they, they do a pay-per-view where they say, okay, now all of the people that really hate each other in our wrestling promotion are going to be on pay-per-view. They'll draw $100 million. 
they've created their own like island jail that they can send wrestlers to. <laughs> But and, and wait a minute, we're burying the lead now. We just please don't laugh anymore because you'll get me tickled because I'm slappy anyway. We've buried a lead and we just glossed right over it. Some allegedly CM Punk involved. Wouldn't this have been the time to turn allegedly into certainly with a press release from the network during the big upfront presentations to get people interested in new programs? Couldn't, shouldn't they have had their feces accumulated well enough to have announced that the biggest star in the company will be the big star on the new program, if indeed that is what is going to take place in that environment? Well, it could be one of two things. It could be one, AEW really does want to make it like the first, like the debut of Punk and AEW, not announce it, but everyone knows it'll be there on the debut of Collision, or two... <laughs> that there's some sort of issue still that isn't finalized with Punk and Tony Khan and AEW. Well, yeah, and I'm inclined to think more of the latter than the former because, okay, assuming still that if they've booked the United Center, right, June 17th, for this debut of this now that is confirmed this live broadcast is going to take place on this network. And... They have have is this official or was this just rumor, scuttlebutt, and birds chirping? They've named it the second coming. Did I see that? That is what I heard as well. I don't know how official it is or isn't. I gotta double check that. Okay, the United Center debut new show, second coming. What if it's like what when they get to the fucking to the foot of the mountain? Like like they always do when the forecast of the, the Messiah returning takes place, and he just ain't there. What the fuck are they going to do then? Are they going to... Remember my old... But he's in the parking lot handing out ice cream bars. No, 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 no. <laughs> if he ain't there... Remember I've said if you take these five guys off the roster and save X dollars, will the fans set the seats on fire? I think the fans will set the seats on fire. And so the and besides that, it's not whether or not they can do that again. They can replicate that moment. They can get a pop again. They are now involved in a press release. They're in a favorable relationship with their network. But if if anybody at the network actually was a regular viewer of the show or paid attention to the wrestling business and knew that those names were not exactly things that would send chills and shivers up strong men's spines, they then the the that high person up at the network might say, "Isn't CM Punk supposed to be involved in this? Why do we have this announcement? It was our upfronts." What 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 is kayfabe? Don't we want to tell people who the stars of our shows are? They would not understand. How is this not done? Fuck. And for the record, before we go with the press release here, the poster released with it again Saturday, June seventeenth, eight p.m. Eastern time. The premiere in the poster are the wrestlers we previously named, with several others. Some people are getting upset about one of the names in there as. I'm sure you will see and hear in a second or feel in a second, but maybe it's just that they're putting all their champions in it. I don't know, but also in the poster. Well, and now, now this, this pro, they will be on TNT. TNT. On Saturday nights. Saturday nights. As opposed to Wednesday nights where they got the dynamite. Who is on the poster now featured for the new Saturday night program? Samoa Joe, Thunder Rosa, Powerhouse Hobbs, previously mentioned also Miro, Andrade El Idolo, FTR, The House of Black, MJF, and Orange Cassidy. <laughs> and Orange Cassidy and MJF are the two biggest in the artwork. Their heads are bigger than the entire torsos of everyone else. My God, <laughs> Nick Goulas has come back from the grave and he's put George on the poster next to fucking Ric Flair. Tony, the pro here's one of Tony's biggest faults. Tony is insistent on finding a way, 
because he believes there is a way to get Orange Cassidy over with the people that don't like him. Not to feature him for the people that like him. If he's on this show, this is all about Tony wanting to get people that don't like Orange Cat, forcing them. <laughs> you will have to see this guy until you accept him. That's what it is. Uh, and how is that show then going to look any different from the shit they do on Wednesday nights with that asshole all over it? Different color ring ropes. So let's talk about the other night, FTR. They couldn't make the fucking press release over Thunder Rosa or Andre. But again, that's why with FTR, MJF, and Orange Cassidy there, you wonder if it's just, and the House of Black technically too, you wonder if it's just they're putting the champions on there, minus the women's champions. And that's why they're there, because they would be on both shows technically well, as champions. If, well, good God, well, then there's other champions. And by the way, the logo for this show is, I, well, I shouldn't say identical, but it would be impossible to see this logo and not think of WCW Nitro. I don't know if you've seen this logo yet. I, I have not, and honestly, I'd probably have to look at an old fucking magazine to remember the Nitro logo, because I didn't give a shit about that then either, but, and I just, uh, again, if they're doing this with a strategy for a new television program that will feature a different presentation as on Wednesday night, a different style of matches, a different maybe a different announcer setup or something with a different look and a different feel and a different vibe with different talent than on Wednesday night. If they have a plan for that and a, a separate sets and whatever the case, it seems that almost everybody that has been announced is a, it, it, for lack of a better term, not a fucking aggressive parkour artist or trampoline cowboy so we might get some actual matches it made some sense obviously mjf has to because he is the world champion and also because last time i checked he, he nobody is looking to punch him in the locker room and nor is he looking to punch anybody else so i believe he can travel about amongst the warring tribes and emerge unscathed and he's the champion and also one of the best performers. So they, they got to have him on both shows. That's an interesting thing though. You just said, do you think MJF should start a fight in the back just to keep up with the Joneses? Well, no, I was going to say to, to not have to work an extra night of the week. <laughs> did you mean? Is it what you, <laughs> now a bunch of it, people yeah. are like, oh, fuck now, you know, we'll stay over here. We don't have to travel on the weekend, whatever. But anyway, Tony, can I work it, Saturday? No, I'm sorry. You're booked for Wednesday. Fuck. Where's Sammy? So I can punch him. <laughs> There'll be a line in front of Sammy <laughs> Guevara, like the fucking on the plane on airplane. <laughs> 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 but anyway, if they have a plan for a different look, a different style, different presentation with mostly different talent and the major people that you would want to see that would mean something for business can vacillate back and forth as long as they don't get on the wrong side of the romper room section, then that's one thing. But if they're, if they're going to do the same kind of show, same thing with a lot of the same people in the same way, on Saturday night, that uh, as opposed to Wednesday, then what they're going to do? Basically, Wednesday we've said is a better night for television viewers because they're viewing because there's more people watching television. That's what they, the experts say these days. But Saturday night's a better night for selling fucking tickets to a live event, and especially if they're putting on a better live product, the Saturday night could dilute the Wednesday night live audiences. But they'll have, as Mama Cornette used to say, a longer road to hoe to catch up with the numbers of the Wednesday night audience because they've got a built-in disadvantage. But now it becomes, if there's no difference to this, if, if it doesn't have a more serious tone for people that don't want to see the guy stick his hands in his pockets and try to find his dick or play with his balls, and then, again, what backup do they have? Is Tony still going to be in charge of creative of a whole different group of people? Because now he's added 
an extra column of people to remind him of who can't be in the same building with the other person. But he's still going to write this whole thing, in which case the whole experiment may be fruitless anyway because he can't do anything different. Actually, everything he does is different. It, it, that's the problem. But so I, I still don't understand how this is a good idea based on having to keep your employees separate because they won't do what you tell them to do and they can't get along with each other. And you don't have the ability to just say, get along, get it on, or get the fuck out of here. Because they've now got, and a lot of people are not even thinking about this, the rampage is still floating around out there. They got five hours of national cable television per week now. That, my God, any wrestling promotion in history would have killed for, including all the good ones. Who never got that? It's a double-edged sword, though. Like, you want... It's great to have all that TV time, but it's almost too much TV time, actually. Well, yeah, well, here's, here's where I'm going. That's, that's the point I'm making. They've got five hours of TV time to fill in an entertaining way to get people to watch it and hopefully get bigger rights fees and blah, blah, blah. We'll all be free to pursue a life of religious freedom. And they're talking about splitting the roster up. Fuck, let's go into war and take half our guns. Because over here, well, those people ain't really firing at us right now, but we'll leave half the guns over there anyway. What the fuck are you doing? Jesus H. Christ. And if Punk's deal ain't done, Tony ought to fire his fucking entire legal staff. Bingo. Starting with the one that is probably causing most people to be at full staff. So, it, because how do you do, how do you do the, the network announcements? And how do you stop it? Over the, <laughs> how do you do the network announcements? How do you book a fucking NBA building? And you still can't fucking officially say this guy's fucking name? And besides that, now to go to your last point, we can talk about this. Five hours of AEW. Five hours of WWE. That's without any other... I'm not even talking about any other uh, promotions. I'm talking about any pay-per-views or Battle of the Belts or fucking Tribute to the Troops or Wing of the Ding Dong, whatever the fuck else they all do. Premium live events, Saudi Arabian nightmares. It, that just from those companies, and what, what are people supposed to quit their jobs and like they're going to go live in a convent that plays wrestling 24 hours a day and devote their lives to keeping up with it. At some point, what the fuck? And it wasn't like this when they said, well, wrestling in the early or the, the fifties network craze was a victim of overexposure. Like boxing, a uh, boxing may have been boxing. One particularly that fucking exciting and still ain't except at the major level. But wrestling wasn't on, when it was on network TV every night of the week, it still wasn't on this much. And there were 30 million people watching these programs. What killed wrestling on the networks then was Dumont going out of business. And then everybody folding their tent and going home. But it, this is impossible for anybody but a fanatic in the worst way to keep up with so by attrition the first thing i'd do is say you gave us rampage as a make good for switching the network on us take rampage back you just gave us two more hours pay us big money for that take rampage back we don't want it we don't want it you can have it it's no good for us but how much can you watch brian what is this going to do to our lives well, we'll get to that at another point, but uh, let's get to the announcement 
And then uh, a few Oh, other I forgot. Things. We hadn't read anything yet, have we? No, we haven't gotten there yet. So here's oh. the official announcement of AEW Saturday Collision. New York, May 17th, 2023. TNT launches a second night of professional wrestling with a new tentpole series, AEW Collision, on Saturday, June 17th. It was announced today by Kathleen Finch, Chairman and Chief Content Officer, U.S. Networks Group, Warner Brothers Discovery, during the company's 2023 upfront presentation at Madison Square Garden in New York City. That was one sentence. Wow, and I can already tell, I don't trust anybody with that amount of titles. We should see Tony's list down here. This live two-hour in-ring show will air every Saturday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time and feature more wrestlers, more stories, and more action to super serve fans. AEW Collision will feature headliners including Miro, Samoa Joe, Thunder Rosa, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Andrade El Idolo. In only four years... How, how did FTR not even get in there if, if they're going to be on this thing, if they're on the poster? Well, that's what makes me wonder if people on the poster are just there because they're the title holders, but then again, why are there no women unless there's not going to be... Well, Thunder Rosa's on the well, poster, a, so there are going to be women well, there's, there's 14 people and a woman. <laughs> in only four years following the launch of AEW Dynamite, AEW's footprint has more than doubled across TNT and TBS. Along with AEW Dynamite, Friday night's AEW Rampage, the recent follow doc AEW All Access, a follow doc, and now AEW Collision, TNT and TBS deliver the best matches and most entertaining moments in professional wrestling today. You realize that this same network, almost 25 years ago, when they had five times the number of people watching these shows, couldn't wait to get rid of the fucking wrestling program. AEW has reached 23 million total viewers so far this year across all its shows on TBS and TNT. Wait a minute. Goddamn, just to... I think we've done that, too. Add up... <laughs> it can, do, we, do we get that up our YouTube numbers and our podcast? I believe we've done that. I don't know if they're counting their YouTube numbers in here, to be fair. All right. But here's a quote. Well, we don't have a goddamn network TV show, either. Well, stay tuned. We're doubling down on wrestling with AEW Collision, which gives fans two more hours every week, said Jason Sarlanis, president of Turner Networks, ID, and HLN, Linear, and Streaming. Boy, everyone must hate their what? business cards nowadays. <laughs> Fuck! Here's a it back to the quote. sounds like a word vomit. AEW's roster of talent has expanded so quickly that we felt it needed another night to bring our audience the epic rivalries, unforgettable ah, ah. matches, and stars they love to watch. Adding collision to our programming mix on TNT will allow us to satisfy the massive it's, demand it's sati Satisfy or sodomize? Will allow us to satisfy the massive demand we've felt from our hardcore fan base and be the ultimate compliment to AEW Dynamite on TBS. Any quotes on that so far i have tony comments here i, I well, yeah go ahead because i don't know what he just said to begin otherwise then the roster has expanded he should have said well there's so many people that don't like those fucking evps that we've got the biggest roster on saturday nights that we've ever had all right go ahead with the addition of aew collision on tnt i'm extremely proud that a turner network will be the home of saturday night wrestling for the first time in more than two decades said tony khan CEO, GM, and head of creative of AEW. The debut of Collision is significant across numerous sectors, including television, wrestling, entertainment, and sports, and reinforces AEW as the bold property we envisioned when we launched in 2019. Collision will deliver live every Saturday night more of what fans and viewers tell us they want athleticism big personalities, exciting storylines, and hard-hitting wrestling action. Yeah, they, but they've been saying they want that on Wednesdays for four years now. All of which have become synonymous with AEW. 
And uh, the only, uh, that's really it here. Then it's just a little bit about AEW and a little bit about TNT, but AEW Collision coming to TNT, not TBS, but TNT on June 17th. Again, we, we shall see if they're really serious about having a different roster and a different presentation and a different program, or if it's just an exercise in, you know, massaging his EVP's private parts by sending the, the people that they're scared of to another television program. And then again, what about pay-per-view? Is it going to be like the the old Georgia TV tapings during the promotional war when they they had the NWA Georgia office guys come in and, and tape their show and then they left and then the All-South guys came in and taped their show at the same place, but they wouldn't be together? What I don't understand how that's even a thing. You If you're trying to compete with a company that now is... I'm going to say this and I'm going to quit because it's a lost cause anyway because he's not fucking listening because he's got his head up his ass. But if you're trying to even compete not to beat but compete to stay alive against a company that now with the WWE and the UFC and every goddamn Hollywood jangalang all working together in a $20 billion conglomerate Put all your fucking stars on the shows and push them all. And if they can't get along, get rid of the ones that can't. That's my statement. Jim, an interesting thing about all this, and I was just looking into it online. I have something here that Mike Johnson just wrote. But what I was looking for is there's no announcement about money and there's nothing about renewal. There's nothing about the rights fee. There's nothing about the future of the programming. It's just that there's a new show. Here's something Mike Johnson, a PW Insider, just wrote that I'm seeing because Meltzer said what tweeted it. (laughs) Perhaps even more interesting is that there was no media rights renewal announcement today. PWInsider.com is told by a source from Warner Brothers Discovery that there was never, ever a plan for either side to announce a new deal between AEW and Warner Brothers Discovery. There have been rampant speculation online about a new deal between the two sides being worth as high as $1.5 billion. What? What? That was the rumor started on the Observer website on the message board by one of their guys. But beyond that speculation, there had never been any inkling from either AEW or Warner Brothers Discovery that a new rights agreement had been locked in, much less was going to be officially announced today. We are told there is no announcement expected today on that front. But, okay, let's back up again. I'm just a small-town bird lawyer, and I've, I've, I've been closed up just watching the local news about poor Denny Crumb's funeral. Somebody said they were going to give them a one and a half bill, billion dollars for anything? Apparently, there was a rumor started on the Wrestling Observer message board by one of their contributors... And this is the same guy, I believe, that said that he heard that CM Punk screwed over Adam Page a while ago. So obviously he has great sources. And he said that, or he alluded to he wouldn't be surprised if it was something like this and people ran with it. And anyone who thought it was going to be anything like that is out of their he would, Oh, he wouldn't be surprised. I, I bet he's the kind of guy who wouldn't be surprised if he woke up and there was a fucking dead horse's head in his fucking bed next to him. But uh, Do you think there's any way that the Saturday show could even do Wednesday's numbers just because of the day of the week? Well, again, that will be a challenge. If it's a better program and with stars that people want to see, then it will probably do even with the eventually after it's established with you know something on Wednesday night because the handicap although it could get hot but we don't know anything about it including whether or not apparently see officially CM Punk's going to be a part of it but again again there's nothing and this is not even knocking AEW but there's nothing going on here that anybody would ever pay them a billion dollars for. I mean, especially now when, when the streaming services are starting to figure out that, oh, we've kind of massively fucked up 
and paid a lot of people too much money. It, like the the early days, thankfully, I was able to be a part of the early days when they were acquiring libraries for the eventual launch of a network. They knew they wanted to buy all the libraries, the WWE. But then when they realized that they had paid a lot of money for a lot of stuff and a lot of it they weren't going to be doing anything with, they started lowballing people on footage and figures and et cetera. Same thing happened with streaming services. So no, it's not possible that there's anything right now that Warner Brothers Discovery would pay AEW a billion dollars for. Could they, if they programmed their entire weekend, Friday evening through Monday morning, would they pay them a billion dollars a year? No. Well there, well, there you go. See, you heard it from Brian last, folks. I mean, part of the thing with AEW is that it's, all things considered, it's really good, affordable programming. And it does get a good number in a key advertising demo, and you're not paying a lot for it. You know, we hear like, oh, they're getting all these millions and millions of dollars a year. In the general scheme of things, it's really inexpensive programming. So if you have people at the network who are willing to embrace it, that's all you need. Because wrestling will get numbers. The question will be what Saturday could bring as opposed to a Wednesday. Saturday from 8 to 10 is a lot different than Wednesday from 8 to 10. From what I know about television production cost, and I admit I am not auditing the AEW books, but from just eyeballing, from what I know about the wrestling business and television production cost and et cetera and the things that go along with it, every time they do... Uh, well, with this new show, when every time they do a week's worth of television in AEW now, they will be spending as much money as as we use to run Smoky Mountain Wrestling lock, stock, and barrel for four years. And again, you know, you can only you can only expect so much from these rights fees going forward, especially if you can't show these people some kind of audience growth over a period of time. And they've got the people they've gotten. That's all the people they've ever gone after. There's, there's not enough about the AEW program that appeals to anybody who actually wants to see a fucking wrestling show with people that might be able to beat them up. I'm talking about the viewers. Why do you want to watch people fight that you're like, my God, he's 12. That's the problem. They've never tried. Maybe this new show has Miro and Hobbs. Except when Miro threatened to come all over me. I've, you know, otherwise I've thought he was, he was quite a massive monster until he got all romantic with me and everything. That wasn't even your problem. It was more the pajamas and the Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse The pajamas Mouse and the, no, the pink Minnie Mouse shirt. Yeah. No, it was Mickey though. I think it wasn't Minnie. Even though the shirt was pink, it was Mickey. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's Minnie. No, I think it was Mickey. Well, you say Mickey, I say Minnie. Somebody will give us a, a tweet us a freeze frame, but nevertheless, anyway. And we got some news actually right now, something that we've been talking about so long now, something happening as we are recording. Well, over the last, I guess, hour, hour and a half that we've been speaking, there's more on this punk business and collision. And let me, uh, we're going to PWInsider.com again, folks, because if you want to know the true story without any horse shit or people picking sides and you can't get to your morning edition of the wrestling news we always encourage you to go to pw insider because mike johnson does a great job he doesn't he doesn't have any friends that's why he doesn't have any friends he has to be beholden to he's just out he's like on an island he's got but friends anyway, i'm sure for the record but well but he tries to hide them but anyway so sports illustrated apparently noted earlier and you mentioned some of this that AEW's press release mentioned all the names, but the email and link to the press release had mentioned CM Punk, but then none of the disseminated material for the new Saturday Night Series today featured Punk, which surprised a number of people within the company, as the belief was today's announcement would be timed with the official reveal of his return on the premiere episode. Then Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics.com confirmed the 
report by Jimmy Traina in Sports Illustrated that Punk was listed earlier before it was edited. And then we go to, uh, and hold on, here before we come to the next update in a related matter, apparently at 1 o'clock, I guess Eastern time today, about less than an hour and a half ago, Andre Olio Leo, who was announced as part of AEW Collision today as part of the new Saturday night show, <laughs> tweeted, Orale, what news? I had no idea. He found out when they announced it that he was returning, or not returning, but coming to the new Saturday night show. Oh my God. So he had no idea. And now... In a report by Mike Johnson at 1.41 p.m., as we noted earlier, CM Punk was initially listed in the press release for today's AEW Collision Saturday Night Series on TNT, but was not included in the final release. Connor Casey of ComicBook.com reached out to Warner Brothers Discovery and reported he was told CM Punk is not affiliated with TNT's AEW Collision. Obviously, wow. a major factor in the launch of the series next month was CM Punk's return to AEW with the first episode planned for Chicago's United Center on June 17th. Needless to say, something has changed. And... Oh, so, I mean, again, going back to what the options are, one option is the person at the network's either lying or they don't know. The second option is... The deal with CM Punk is not done? Well, as a matter of fact, we have more reporting from 1132 this morning from Mike Johnson. It was on the Elite account. They do audio on PWInsiderElite.com. Yeah, we'll make sure you specify, not the Elite. But well, no, I mean, yeah, they, they had it, no, on the Elite website, their Elite website. They had Elite a long time before the Buckaroos did, but PWInsiderElite.com is, but the audio not transcript, but summation is there was a lot of surprise among AEW talents today when CM Punk was not announced for collision. We are told that as late as last night, Punk was expected by many to be front and center for the collision reveal. And we are also told, they say, that going forward, there is no brand split as much as some talents will be exclusive to the Saturday show and others will be one or the other, or perhaps on, on one or the other, or perhaps both, something that will be dictated by storylines. Well, <laughs> and if Punk ain't involved, there's no reason to do any of it, because the only reason they were talking about any kind of split of the roster was to keep Punk away from the gutless little fucking douchebags that started the fucking issue with him, and have been whining about having their pussies powdered ever since instead of getting back to business and getting over it. So if Punk's not going to be involved in this, they don't need to split anything. Because, except maybe Andre and Sammy, or Kingston and whoever the fuck he's gone into fucking uh, violent situations with, or perhaps some of the girls. Well, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, I guess they still got to split some people up. You know, it's interesting, though, the Andrade news you just said. We'll get back to Punk in a second. If Andrade's telling the truth, that he didn't hear from anyone in AEW, he had no idea he was being announced as returning on this new show, you know, Leva Bates, the librarian, was just released. Not a favorite of ours, but I thought it was interesting in reading about that. Apparently, she had no communication from anyone in the office and didn't know about it until they went out with it. So the communication issues with AEW talent and either Tony Khan himself or whatever person he puts in that role of communicating with talent, apparently there are still major problems right there. Hey, well, all he's done is put a line of flunkies in between him and the people that might want to talk to him. There's nobody with decision-making power it, the, you remember we read the list of names that he said, well, this will improve communication. Yeah, that'd mean more people for them to talk to, and then those people will tell you what they're saying, but those people do not have, as Mama Cornette used to say, the power to either fish or cut bait. They can't say, okay, I'll give you more money, or okay, 
you can win or lose that match or okay you can have your release or oh whatever they can just as reggie b fine used to say delay the information on to tony so until somebody's in charge of any of this this is all going to continue to happen for warner brothers discovery to state that cm punk's not affiliated with aew collision I mean, if we're playing semantics, that doesn't mean he's not affiliated with AEW Dynamite on TBS. That's not saying that he's not being announced now. That means he's not affiliated. When we announce him, he'll be affiliated. You know, we're looking at a lot of the possible realities, but it also could just be the general AEW management issues kind of playing into this. What do you think that Tony Khan is telling the people at the network? Well, I... We think it'll be okay. He, I, we think he's going to come back. Or if, 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 if I can make my executive vice presidents not be mad anymore, he can come back. Or if we can keep him and the people that they had a fight with apart, he'll come back. Because if I was a network inning, okay, I don't know anything about wrestling. What about those motherfuckers on that baseball team last week that had that bench clear and brawl? We got to keep them apart? Or what about the fucking guys on the NBA game that we telecast last Tuesday night or whenever? They started fucking throwing punches. We got to have separate buildings for them now? Or can those teams play again sometime? Do you see where I'm going with this? No, it's all how ridiculous. He, I agree. How is he conveying this information to the network on why that this guy's under contract to his company, but they can't have him on their TV show, TV network when he's the one that got him their biggest ratings. How is that? How is he delivering that news? Because Tony Khan, either wittingly or unwittingly, let his legal team more than likely run the clock. And now here we are, the announcement of the new show, the announcement of the Chicago show, word that it's going to be called the second coming and these issues are still in the air and for everyone who thinks so you're you're not saying it's somebody on the legal team that happens to be personal friends and on the side of the evps and against punk from the beginning would delay or throw monkey wrenches in any of these plans to prevent things from coming to fruition for selfish and personal reasons are you what i'm saying is that if tony khan the owner co-owner, GM, head of creative, CEO, whatever he is for AEW, wanted all this done and taken care of so we could move on, it would be. So either wittingly, in that he's only a hard ass to the people that work with him and everyone else he plays this soft guy who can't get anything done, or unwittingly, he is the soft guy that can't get anything done and his fucking team does what they want to do. There's something causing this shit not to get done. And it's ridiculous because the other thing is the drama in AEW is more interesting in, than anything in AEW. And while that's fun in games for us, that's not good for a wrestling company. No. And the idea that this would be drawn out drama with Punk because it's good for things, it isn't. The fact that they announced a new show today and all the news is already turning to CM Punk's, not on it. CM Punk's name being removed from it, Orange Cassidy appearing on the poster, now Warner Brothers saying CM Punk's not affiliated with it. Any positive spin you got out of this is gone already. Am I, am I wrong? I no, but that's the, it's the perfect analogy. They announced today a brand new two-hour primetime program, and within three hours, the biggest news is who's not on it. Fuck. Ugh. So what does Andrade do? Does he wait for a airplane ticket to arrive in the mail? <laughs> like, like what, is he, what is Andrade doing right now? <laughs> Miro, Miro, what's going on over there? <laughs> Jesus, age Christ. I get, yeah, I guess he, he needs to get in the car now. Where does he live? I like the idea of just putting wrestlers on the poster, even if they're not booked and don't know they're going to be there. Some interesting well, he, things could come out of this. Thing is, he was not only on the post, he was mentioned in the press release too. They had him by name. So he's... But anyway, yeah, so all of the people, some of them are just now finding out, but all of the people that are supposed to be on the new show are apparently going to be on the new show except for the one person that's supposed to be on the new show. And again, even if he appears on this show now, 
They've already induced a few more hours of drama into the story for no reason. For no reason. So now mm. Tony gets to announce this in a very clunky fashion on the show tonight as we Oh, recording. I forgot. Yes, we got well, we gotta you know what? We need to we need to break and come back tomorrow and report on what he said. He's gonna sound like Beaver Cleaver trying to explain to fucking Warden June how he ended up in that fucking giant coffee cup. You know what my favorite thing he does? When they do these really awkward, now they're doing it in front of a green screen so he could just stand there and practice and not His blink. announcement background. I like when he starts it because he goes, thanks, guys. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, <laughs> like he's actually, they're actually sending it to him and he's there waiting for them. Thanks, guys. You know guys. what, because it, it, it's already been taped. If one of the <laughs> fucking announcers wanted to fuck with him and said, well, here's that screwball with an announcement. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will return with the drive through in... At this point, a few hours with a little bit of an update on this and some of your questions and more. And uh, we're not leaving. They won't know we've left. We're not returning for the for the listener. We're just taking a break so we can examine all this news and see what Tony has to whine for himself tonight. And we'll come back and finish this program. Let's begin, I guess, with the mess that we left off with. The poop flinging over at AEW? We left it with... Word coming out, Mike Johnson reporting that TNT said that CM Punk has no involvement, I forget the exact wording, no involvement with the AEW Collision show that will be debuting on Saturday nights on TNT. That's where we left it, and then more transpired. How much of this are you fluent in? Because I don't have anything in front <laughs> fluent of in, I'm, I'm fluent in frontier gibberish. Um, actually, I have the article in front of me, an updated article on the reasoning uh, behind this whole deal blowing up again, and ladies and gentlemen, it is as we thought. We've been predictifying a lot of things over the past few months, uh, not only in AEW, but just everything seems to come to pass that we talk about. But in this case, apparently, another deal has been blown up uh, just in time to apparently now, as it stands now, prevent... CM Punk from appearing at the United Center in Chicago or uh, his name being mentioned on the network up fronts. And Mike Johnson on PWInsider.com has this updated uh, piece. Uh, the rumor making the rounds is that Punk and AEW are again at odds now over the status of the return of a steal. In asking around, there appears to be something to that situation. The belief amongst those we've spoken with is that Ace Steel was expected to return in conjunction with Punk next month, working behind the scenes. He was obviously an agent, producer, whatever they call that position there before. Yeah, get his job back, everybody back to work. And Mike continues, however, the story making the way around AEW backstage today at Dynamite is that a decision was made that Steele would not be working backstage at the collision tapings. As you might imagine, that left Punk and AEW on opposite sides of the discussion, which in turn led to Punk being removed from all promotional material released for the AEW Collision series. One person believed MJF replaced Punk in the promotional graphic, but we haven't been able to confirm that. We do know that Impact Wrestling sources noted today they had had interest in bringing Steele in for a tryout, and the invitation was passed on several weeks ago. Their belief was that meant he was either AEW or WWE bound. So, apparently, they had another deal, because, I mean, first of all, we talked... How long has this been going on now? Six, seven months, long enough to have had a baby uh, or a cow, man. Uh, we talked about even if Punk did come back, he would want Steele to his friend and trainer who was fired for defending his friend and his wife in the skirmish. He would obviously want him back. And one would imagine that would be the case because as we knew, there was no legitimate third-party legal investigation into the thing. Uh, everything is still is continued, is continuing, seems to be to be handled by AEW's crack legal staff. No results of any investigation were ever given out. Nobody was ever fired except for A. Steele. And how do, if you're not going to fire 
everybody from the same side. They could have fired either the bargers, the people that barged into the room and instigated, or they could have fired the bargees, the people that defended their standing their ground there in their locker room. But they didn't they didn't fire anybody except A. Steele, who was actually going to the aid of his outnumbered friend in a room with, as we know, his injured wife. So one would think that part of the thing that would get Punk in good graces enough to agree to come back to the company would be to give the man his job back. And I've heard everybody say, well, everybody ought to apologize. Well, okay, Ace, apologize for cracking little, whichever one it was, little twit or little twat with the fucking chair. Everybody shake hands. Are they professional athletes or are they high school drama class students that need parental supervision? So, but the point is, apparently that was coming to pass. Apparently, they booked the United Center. This, so this hadn't been a secret. It's not like I, that anybody is saying that Punk has now said, oh, no, but you got to bring A. Steel back. Just all of a sudden, this is a surprise he's flung on him. No. Weeks ago, the guy's turning down opportunities to go elsewhere. I don't know, he turned Impact down. Maybe he still didn't want to do anything, but you know what I'm saying. That's not going elsewhere. That's going nowhere. Well, there you go. Somewhere over the rainbow, maybe. But anyway, the guy's turning down other opportunities weeks ago. This is not a fucking state of mind that CM Punk's been in recently. It's been the whole fucking bone of contention, the way that his side was treated. They booked the United Center. They got a brand new Saturday night show. We, it was reported by even Uncle Dave, who does everything he can to crowbar anything negative about Punk into the press, that Punk had been instrumental in discussions with the network about the new show. The network was for be, having him on it. And all of a sudden, well, now maybe A. Steel won't be one. They are going to blow up the new network program, the new Saturday night television show, the rate at the gate at the United Center. They're going to do all, because now they have not officially announced. We in, in our break also, they've announced the first like six weeks of tapings for the new Saturday night show location except for the first one, which will be announced next week, because apparently in, they didn't realize that if they said, no, fuck you, boy, Ace, apparently they thought Punk was going to, well, okay, well, we'll forget about that detail. What the fuck? So they are blowing this whole deal up over not wanting Ace Steel to come back and be an agent in a wrestling program when he would be the, uh, the basically the Pat Patterson or Jack Lanza to the WWF champion, he would be that CM Punk and working with Punk. And the, he's a hell of a trainer, which they need worse than ever with bad examples like John Moxley around. They're going to blow this whole deal up because the EVP's asses are still chapped that this 40-something-year-old guy kicked a shit out of him? It, it doesn't matter how old the person is that kicks the shit out of you. It's just that they got bigger balls than yours. So get over it. Can you believe this, Brian? Speak to me. Earlier today, the Wrestling News' Luke Kippelman was able to speak to Ace Steel, so we have this exclusive soundbite. <laughs> He bit Luke Kibbelman and now lose in a hospital. So thanks, Ace Steel. You know, look, this whole thing is ridiculous, and it's crazy just... It's crazy how much bigger the drama is than anything that's actually happening on that show. And it's so big, and it never ends. And we always say it. It's always because of Tony. Everyone's pointing the finger at Punk. If CM Punk was led to believe that Ace Steel was going to be there with him in his locker room for AEW collision or whatever to and work be, with him and be his agent and work with him on his matches so he could do everything the way he wants to do it. 
If he was led to believe that was exactly what was going to happen, if he was told, yes, this is going to happen, if everything got to this point right before the announcement of the new show at the network upfronts, now's the time they decide at the last minute to pull the rug out? That's kind of bullshit. They waited until the very end. They're doing everything to like almost make it so you can't pull out. I mean, he can, and he, and he did, apparently. But the fact is, it's clear from all of this, everything that's been publicly reported, that Ace Steel had a deal. He was back with AEW. And something happened between that deal being completed and now, which is he can't be there, and reportedly CM Punk is not coming back if Ace Steel doesn't come back. In between that period of time, somehow enough concern from someone other than the person making the deal rose up to cause this problem. What would that have been? Who knew this was happening, and who raised a stink about it? And if he was going to be on another show... Did people that were going to be in that locker room raise a stink about it? Well, which, wait, let me, again. Did legal cause this to happen? Well, well, now, hold on now. Don't be casting aspersions like that because the legal department be, would be the ones handling this whole deal to make sure it goes seamlessly, wouldn't they now? What of think? the talent? What of the talent? Who on the talent roster would suddenly go and say, oh, A. Steele is coming back to be the top agent on the Saturday night show working with the top star CM Punk. I am going to complain to management. What would the motivation for any talent on the roster to, and what would be the justification? Hey, I've got a problem with that guy being on this show and being here because he punched a friend of mine. Well, fuck you. Then you've eliminated half the people in the wrestling business, at least as of five or ten years ago. And hey, maybe I farted in your fucking Aunt Lola's general direction one time. But here's the mistake you're making, I think. Even if, for instance, the EVPs did not want a steal back, the way this has been done makes me think that somehow voices beyond that were sought no, out. No, that, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Let's work from the bottom up. None of the other talent either would probably give a shit except their personal friends of the EVPs and the Buckaroos and the whole California Raisin Bran clique. But they have no personal issue because they've not had a goddamn confrontation with this guy or any kind of problem. So eliminate that. The only people that would have a standing and a reason to object to A Steel being there would be the people he had a fight with or the people that have been trying to put this or maybe not trying to put this deal together. See, you eliminate all of the people. And if some fucking guy on AEW Dark Rampage Elevation tube says, well, I don't like him. Well, fuck you. He's the fucking top guy's agent and you're a fucking preliminary jack off. So hit the fucking road. So again, we're talking about a very small circle of people that would both have a problem with the guy being there and have a legitimate enough voice in the matter and Tony Khan's ear or whatever orifice he hears through to be able to make these fucking complaints to sidetrack this deal. That's where I'm going. The fact that they have not announced Chicago, but they've announced all these other dates for AEW Collision. I bet you they were going to announce Chicago until a couple days ago, whenever this popped up. Even from what I've read in some of the emails this morning, even Dave Meltzer on his show said that without CM Punk, Collision is Rampage. Do you think they're going to move this out of Chicago? I, th I definitely think that they're looking around to see what they can do because why else would they have announced, like I said, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth week and the exact location because they're the same kind of buildings and, and the markets that they usually go to. Nothing's out of the ordinary there, at least that I saw. Maybe I overlooked something. Did you see, well, 
And they're they're going to be in Canada for four weeks. But what I'm saying is they're not playing NBA arenas, and they're not going to markets that they normally you know wouldn't be expected to do well in unless it was some specific attraction. United Center, CM Punk leaked subtitle of show the second coming you know that's what they had planned and apparently they thought that they could then jack this deal up at the last minute and he'd just go along with it and apparently they found out very last minute that he wasn't going to and they couldn't announce that because if he's not going to be there they'll look like idiots if they run a what do they seat in the united center Twenty thousand. I'm not sure. And it, it, whoever would show up for that show would be chanting CM Punk at the top of their lungs as a fucking protest. So they can't do it without him. And as a result, he's he's bluffing, stalling, whatever you want to say. I've, we've, I've done it in wrestling promotion. Every wrestling promoter has done it. You think you're going to do something, suddenly you find out not. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't want to back yourself into a corner. If you've got a week, you won't announce anything. You'll announce an announcement or something. Did you see the announcement on Dynamite? We'll do the Dynamite review on the experience, obviously, but did you see the announcement? Well, yes, it was the announcement that we've already heard announced. No, but you did Ad nauseum, my... <laughs> but with Tony standing in front of the announcement background to announce the announcement that had been announced earlier in the day when they made the announcement. He did my favorite thing once again. Back to you guys. No, thanks, guys. Oh, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. As soon as QT points at him. And then back to him, you guys at the end. Thanks, guys. <laughs> but that's... Uh, thanks, so guys. I'm here on a set that you've never seen in any other segment on this show ever. It's like I'm on a spaceship. But at least they're pre-taping him now. He's not <laughs> coming out there and just winging it. But So that's the point. They got seven days now. He's bought himself seven days to, because you can't, I mean, buildings are booked. I mean, not as much as they used to be, but, you know, when you've, still when you've got seven days to come up with a, a suitable location that you can sell hopefully most of the tickets in the building to, and that it will host a, you know, national cable broadcast. And, you know, it, unless it's one of their buildings that they work with on a regular basis, especially, then there would need to be insurance forms filled out. If it was a new place, they I mean, insurance, proof of insurance and uh, building contracts and et cetera, et cetera. So it takes a couple days if you knew exactly where to call and they were open. So I, you know, but and I like the fact that you know for so long everyone's like you know CM Punk, he's just a disloyal guy. He's all out for himself. He's literally standing by the guy that fought with him <laughs> to help him. And people are like, look at what a what a baby he is. Yeah, he's doing the right thing. Yeah, and again, how do you fire one half of one side of a fight? and explain it away by anything other than, well, we need Punk, he's a star, but they're really mad, so we're going to fuck with the other guy. Well, let's don't fuck with the other guy then. That's what this has come down to. Put everybody back to work. It's grown up enough to go and do it. And if the assholes won't, fire them. You know what? This is a good thing too, though, because Punk, in delaying this, or in this, whatever state we're in now, and it not happening yet, Punk got to see the announcement. He got to see the poster. So now when Tony calls to make the deal, he's like, you know what? By the way, this roster, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Come on, help me out. Well, no, you know, here's the thing. I bet you if he, if he was a picking, if he was told here, pick, and he was a picking guy, he would pick most of the names that were on that poster. I don't think he'd pick pockets. I think he would pick pockets as pockets and send him back penniless to the fucking pocket farm or whatever. But he would, I don't think that Punk would say, I don't want any of those other talents on the show, but it, I think he would have the problem that we had in that these are all people that have either been off television completely or featured in such middling roles that it, you need some juice with him and FTR. And yes, I'd put MJF on it. He's the champion. He's the, he's the, if Punk is the top babyface, which he will be, 
MJF's the top heel. He needs to be motivating between both programs because he's the champion. That would give you some juice at the top, and the other guys are fine. But they kind of, you know, like you said, it was left because it wasn't in the press release, just the poster. It was left to the individual's debate as to whether FTR and a couple other people are in there just because they're champions, or are they going to be on the program? Obviously, he'd pick them too. Have FTR even defended the belts? I can't remember the well, last tag team match. Who knows? Who knows? Who fucking knows? Because all the people that they want, the majority of the public wants to see, hear from, and talk about are either hidden or goddamn off work because they can't get fucking their management shit together to fucking uh, apply the all the tools that they have in their toolkit because it's a goddamn mess. And then they make deals and renege on them because somebody else doesn't like it. And it's Tony had to be the one to make the deal because how does somebody else make the deal and then go tell Tony? That's right. So that's the, what, <laughs> that's the biggest problem. When Punk did the famous speech, whatever you want to call it, at the uh, press scrum, and he said, I work with children. He may be harmless, but Tony's the lead child. And that's the problem because he's in charge of the company. Doesn't behave in a way that any CEO that's effective that I've ever seen does. Right about did they weren't they weren't big huggers? No, they, in the, in they the, didn't request in the hugs. Record industry or the music. Well, no, I shouldn't say or... that. I mean, some people do that. Some people go for the handshake into the hug. Usually, people don't, you know, request them or you know, beg for them or whatever. Yeah, um, or linger or malinger uh, excruciatingly and un uncomfortably long. Again, you know, I haven't had these uh, meetings with people. I'm, I always think the option is I could leave the room or just say no. So that's always the thing. But uh, where was I going before you took me here? I don't know where we were. We were trying to hug it out. But that's the thing. Tony made a deal because how can anybody make a deal if it's not approved by Tony? So when you assume you have a deal, when everyone is assuming, that means that Tony has made the deal. And then somehow the deal changes how does the deal change unless tony is changing his mind and then why is he changing it and who's talking to him and why is it changing now because that's the thing the forces that didn't want a steel to return to the company were the same forces that didn't want him to return to the company months ago it's not like that's changed so why was this timed so that once everyone thought everything was smooth over it appears all of a sudden now right before the upfronts right before the announcement of the new show, right before Chicago. Apparently just hours before. Why now? That's the thing. The people that were insisting that Ace Steel wasn't going to return, their thoughts haven't changed. Why was this timed so that this, this boom got lowered right now? Did they think they could get by with it without him finding out? One would, how, I, I mean, we since we don't know what the exact timeline at Eastern Time or whatever, A Steel or CM Punk or whoever's involved in this found out exactly what do you you think maybe they did they send out an email too early to somebody? Is that that would be a thing Shitstain might do? Or did a loose lip sink a ship? Or were they gonna try to get this announcement made and then let uh, the offended party Steel and Punk know that the deal was being sent south. One wonders. I mean, how do you do business like that? Again, after all this drama, and whoever you want to blame for the drama at this point, whether it's Punk or Tony Khan, who's to blame for all this, let's be honest, or the Elite, or Ace Steel, whoever. Whoever you want to blame. They got to a point where it was done. Okay. I'll go back. It's not perfect there, but I'll go back. And okay, he's not perfect. He may slug someone, but he's coming back. And the network likes him, and he's a big star, and we could really use him. And then the drama gets introduced again. It's like every time there's progress, boom. And this one seems like a big one. Again, they lowered this boom right before this announcement. The timing of this is pretty suspicious to me. They tried, to it, run, they tried to run the clock on CM Punk is what it seems like. 
Well, let's just uh, sum this up with apparently Ace Steel in, I believe, I, I, I've been around wrestling longer than Ace Steel has. I haven't followed his career on a weekly basis, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time, and he's been around wrestling at least 25 years, that he's ever punched, bit, or clocked with a chair any of, of, of the other wrestlers in a locker room skirmish. We haven't heard any others reported all these years, right? So in that case, it's a small pool of people. Again, I will restate what I said earlier, a small pool of people that would have not only a grudge or a, a reason for him to not be around, but also the standing to say that. You can say all day long, well, I don't like what he did to this guy that is a friend of mine. Well, it has nothing to do with you. Well, the question is, did they bring so, it up on their own or were their opinions sought out? Well, that's, an, that's what I'm saying. So if this deal was made, they didn't have to goddamn do a popularity poll on the guy. One would think only a few, it would be a small pool of people that would even be consulted. One would think, because why else would you, you wouldn't want something like this getting out. So you wouldn't just go willy-nilly around and say, hey, is anybody mind if Ace Steel comes back? Just checking. Well, that would tip the whole fucking thing off. That would be the stupidest thing you could do. How would you so feel you, about Ace Steel coming back? I, I wouldn't like it. All right, thank you. How would you so, feel about Ace Steel coming well, back? Yeah, that's what, and then the friends of the friends are going to, so that's the stupidest thing you could do anyway, because if they like the one side, they'll say, oh, yeah, and if they like the other, oh, no. So that's stupid, but nobody should even have on the roster have that say anyway, because they weren't involved. It's between, so it's a small pool of people. The EVPs and or the legal representative and or a couple of the other agents that were in the room and Punk and Steele and, and his wife and Larry. Let's not forget about Larry and all this. He got some of his teeth loosened. So that should be the only people involved. And if everybody agreed on a deal and then suddenly something happens and it's being reneged on from the AEW side rather than the Punk and Steel side, then somebody's jacking around. Maybe so. I have a comment here from Larry that uh, Lou Kippelman was able to get a little bit earlier today. Let me go to this. <laughs> Apparently he's unhappy about all this. Well, but see, if everybody was as professional as that in this situation, we could move on. Then Ace Steel bit Lou, and again, Lou's in the hospital from an Ace Steel. But he's, he's, he's having all those shots in his stomach for the rabies. You know, a good tetanus round every now and then does help the system. Sounds fishy to me. You know what else sounds fishy to me? Young Brian Last, the whole situation going on in AEW um, that we just reported on on a couple days ago on the drive through your program, it was unfolding and the news was slipping out, eking out, dripping out, whatever, as we were recording the program. But just to bring everybody up to date, AEW has a brand new two-hour primetime Television broadcast set to begin to debut on June 17th on Saturday nights on TNT called Collision. And at the network upfronts and the big announcements of same, they were supposed to announce that the star of our show would be CM Punk and the debut taping, or not taping, it's live, the debut broadcast would emanate from the United Center in lovely Chicago, Illinois, the Windy City, and the title that we have heard leaked for the, uh, for the event was The Second Coming. And within, what, less than 24 hours before all those announcements were going to be made, Tony or someone in his periphery or orbit in the company managed to either fuck up <laughs> or I, we still don't know how the word got out that close to the, I say they were trying to fucking run one by him. I say they were trying to pull a fast one and he found out about it in the nick of time. 
but they uh, reneged on their previous agreement, as has been reported by multiple sources, to not rehire A. Steel because A. Steel was rehired now, we come to find out, a number of weeks or even months ago, part of, obviously, their contrition for him being the only one that got fired over this to begin with, when he's not the, he wasn't even the one that started it, he was just the one that finished it off. So they managed to fuck this up because Punk got word that no, they're not going to have A. Steel come back to work to do what he's supposed to be doing, which is being the agent and producer for the top star in the company on the brand new two-hour national cable television program. But instead, they'll, they'll send him a check. I guess they're, 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 they rehired him. They'll pay him, but he can just call Tony on the phone and tell him what tell Tony what he thinks over the phone about shit. And that somehow they think that that is going to honor any kind of deal that was made to get all these parties back on television and moving forward with the new television program. And so obviously those announcements that I mentioned were not made because Punk said, oh, hell no, what the fuck? And again, Brian, and I will turn it over to you for any comment you might have or update you might be aware of, but it's another example of Tony making a deal that's a deal until somebody tells him they don't want him to make a fucking deal. Am I correct in this? Again, we don't know because we can't really say what Tony Khan's mindset truly is, but it seems like from everything we've seen publicly reported, Tony Khan is agreeing to certain things to the top talent that he's negotiating with, and then somehow from that point until execution, monkey wrenches keep getting thrown in the way that cause what we're supposed to believe is the boss's intent to not happen the way he wanted it to. And how many times does that need to happen before you make some changes? And again, the information being leaked out or the, well, sources have said that some people in the company wouldn't be comfortable with Ace coming back to work in person. And we mentioned on the drive through well, those same people weren't comfortable with punk either, which is why this whole ridiculous farcical fucking brand split that's not is being instituted to put him over there because the other ones are so fucking childish and immature and it's romper room that they can't fucking be in the same building with him and they're scared. And if you're, if you're a man, say you're a man, if you're a mouse squeak, but nevertheless, then the same guy that was on the same side of the issue that is being sent over here to Saturday night. Now the other guy can't be over there. Who's going to be uncomfortable over there. Does a steel have a long history of ax murder here is, is it a case of, you know what? I'm pretty sure if you don't fuck with this guy and you're not in a goddamn fist fight with a friend of his, he's probably not going to bother you. But again, we're assuming that or you're assuming because I don't I don't know if it's necessarily a fair ass assumption that the talent are really the ones causing this not to happen. Well, in, in uh, <laughs> double duty talent or EVPs. The point is the the offended parties that are still have their panties in a twist over a fight in a locker room six months ago. Them or their friends would have the only reason to have any issue with this whatsoever, right? But is this not happening? Or the way this didn't happen? However you want to look at it. Because it happened. Ace is, apparently Ace Steel, from what we've seen publicly reported, has been under contract to AEW since April. So, for everyone who thought Jericho pitched the idea of Ace Steel, no. He was already working there, apparently. And for everyone who thought it wasn't going to happen until everyone cleared it, no, Tony already said yes. So now it becomes about the execution. And again, 
Because they, they're paying him to work. They just won't let him come to work. Yeah, no, they want to give him an... They want to give him, it seems like, an Iron Sheik deal. Where it's like, here's all this money. Stay home. Just we don't want to see you. Here's a bunch of money not to be seen. But the question really is, is Tony Khan's legal team or his advisors, whoever you want to think of here, are they telling him Ace can't be here because the talent are upset? Or are they telling him Ace can't be here because you and your dad will get sued if he bites another person? <laughs> like, what is that? That's the thing we don't know. We're all making assumptions. What is Tony okay. actually being told by his team? Okay, I've got a great gimmick then. Put him in the fucking Hannibal Lecter mask and he'll be the hottest heel in the fucking company. Wheel him out and he's got the thing where he can't bite anybody. But it, be the hottest heel in the locker room. Again, I think back and in the history of wrestling, how many fights and incidents there have been amongst people that then whether they either turned it into fucking uh, money in, in terms of at the gate or just learned to coexist or this one guy moved on and went somewhere else to defuse the situation or whatever. And I've n this was not that big of a fucking deal. A guy got a fucking black eye punched in the face. A guy got fucking whacked over the head with a chair. A guy got bit on the arm. For fuck's sake. And this has been six months ago. And if again, if you're talking about someone who was involved in something asking other people or, you know, the legal liability or fucking... You know, is someone uncomfortable with this person around? This is a fucking wrestling business. Do you think in 1996, Vince looked across his dining room table from me at a booking meeting and said, Hey, Jim, I know you're, you're friends with Arn Anderson. You guys have known each other for a while, but do you mind if I book Sid Vicious, even though that he stabbed Arn multiple times with a pair of scissors and sent him to the hospital with a goddamn blood loss? It never came up. And I knew not to fucking bring it up because he was going to do what he was going to do. And also, we were pretty sure that if we kept a halfway good eye on Sid, he wasn't going to fucking stab anybody anymore. Someone called the seamstress, hide all the scissors. Sid is in the house. Well, they did go to plastic utensils in catering, but nevertheless, <laughs> that may have been a co coincidence. But I actually likened this truthfully more to Randy Savage, Bill Dundee, Jerry Lawler, Jerry Jarrett. Think about this for a second. You've got two guys that have tremendous heat because of a real life situation, Randy Savage and Bill Dundee. And everybody knows the story. Savage ambushed Dundee in the parking lot in Nashville at the gym and broke his jaw. And Dundee was off for about, I think it was about four, four to six weeks that uh, it not only cost him money, but it cost Jerry Jarrett money because Dundee was a main event guy. But then, what was it, two years later or whatever, all of a sudden now, ICW is folding. Angelo calls Jerry, tries to make some peace. Well, as we've talked about with our Mid-South deep dives and our retrospectives on the Midnight Express and all the things that were happening at that time in, Mid in Memphis and Louisiana, Jerry Jarrett was best friends with Bill Dundee. They'd been, Dundee had been his booker and he, one of his top stars for fucking years. And here's goddamn Randy Savage, who not only had worked for the Outlaw promotion that had done everything they could to damage their business, but it actually fucking broken Dundee's jaw and put him out of business for fucking six weeks. Cost him all money. But Jerry Jarrett says, I got a fucking way to make that money back. And at the same time, Lawler and Dundee had been grading on each other, so Jerry Jarrett gets Bill Dundee uh, the job as booker for Bill Watts, Dundee makes more money in 1984 than he'd ever made in the wrestling business up to that point, which was a pretty penny. Bill Watts has his record year with Dundee booking. We all get jobs. Then Jarrett brings Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo in and Angelo. 
And he didn't ask any of, of, of fucking Dundee's friends. Do you mind? I know he broke Bill's jaw and fucked with him for a long time, but no, because it wasn't, there was no more personal issue. The, it was diffused and now they were doing business and Lawler works with Savage and trusts him with his body and they draw money. It's God damn it. And actually, I should mention if people think, well, a broken jaw and getting clocked over the head with a chair, depending on which story you believe, he was either fucking had knucks in his hand or was using Dundee's gun that he'd wrestled away from Dundee to fucking pistol whip him. Because there was a firearm involved in that and it was almost used. There's serious shit that goes on with people. But they... Again, this is well, this was nothing but one of these fights in Major League Baseball. This wasn't even nobody was after somebody with a gun in the parking lot. Nobody used a razor blade. <clears throat> you know, a couple a couple seasons ago, uh, the Mets got a big uh, shortstop, Francisco. Well, and Heidi's short, but Francisco Lindor, who is a all star shortstop, and he didn't necessarily fit in so great that first year. It was a little awkward, and there was a situation where he and Jeff McNeil, between innings, reportedly he had Jeff McNeil against the wall by his throat. They were having some kind of physical issue because it's something that happened on the field. After that game, when the media asked about it, both guys said, oh, there was a squirrel. We were looking at squirrels in the, uh, <laughs> in the hallway. They protected it. They were mad at each other. They settled it. Now they're good. But they weren't going to let it spill out. They were going to deal with it, not go and say, I demand to be traded away from this team because that animal is there. And, and again, and either handle it or don't handle it, but keep it in house. Everybody had to hear about this because everybody's a drama queen now. And most of these guys in the locker room had never seen anybody have an actual fight in the locker room before. But there were, that's why I'm saying for, if you're in the wrestling business, and even if you've only been in it a while, if you had some whiff of the actual business before it turned into this Disney on ice on tour thing, this was not a big goddamn deal. As we talked about at the time, the only unusual aspect of the all out post scrum bench clearer was that number one, there was a group of people involved on each side it's usually one on one side and one on the other and a bunch of people trying to break it up and two that there was actually somebody representative of the office that was on one side of it uh, but the otherwise this was a minor incident and i think you know everybody's told the story about bruiser and bruiser bro dick the bruiser and bruiser brody guy that uh, brody especially but a lot of guys if they weren't mad about their payoffs that's the way they fucking went in and registered that displeasure and they either got fired or fucking paid. And then does anybody now that I've said that, I guess half the people don't know what I'm fucking talking about. Probably not. Okay. Basically Dick, the bruiser. And I remember this because I was still watching the TV as before I got into business, 1980, 81 Dick, the bruiser, the dying days of his promotion in Indianapolis brings in bruiser Brody who they called King Kong Brody, uh, to work Indianapolis because Bruiser had no territory left and he needed a big name opponent. And he was well, like Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and a spot show or two, right? That was kind of it. And he was obviously expected to be fair with Brody. So anyway, one night Brody gets in his fucking, gets his check and says this is bullshit and goes through the building to the babyface locker room and into Bruiser's locker room. And this is Dick the Bruiser. In 1955, he was Brock Lesnar. But this is 1981, and it's Bruiser Brody. And give and I think Brody even said, give Dick credit. He stood right up to me, and here we went. But Brody had Dick around the neck and was bashing his head against the fucking lockers and busted him open. And so the next night they walked in the fucking building and here comes Bruiser and hands Brody his fucking check. Point taken. It's not that big a fucking deal except for these kids that are festering about it because they got beat in a fight 
They got fucking told off at a press scrum, and everybody knows that the points were valid that Punk made. So they fucking pussies need powdered, but move on. Get over it. It's ridiculous. Now they still keep putting, as you said, monkey wrenches in this thing. When deals are done and people are assuming that things are going to happen based on what they've been told, and then suddenly it's never that way. And every time that it's close to an announcement of punk or a return of punk, something like this happens. And they act like it's punk's fault. It's Tony Khan's fault. He keeps allowing this to happen. It's his people. Tony Khan, I don't care who he gets on the phone with and tries to be a peacemaker in this, he's letting this all happen. So in one way or another, he likes this drama. Anyway, what... One more real quick, because I love the Gary Hart missing link story. But it illustrates that this is childish shit these days. Fucking missing links work in Dallas for world class, Fritz von Erich. Gary Hart is the booker, Uncle Gary. And Link was a different type of individual. And at one point, he went up to Carrie. I don't know if they were married yet. I think it was still Carrie's girlfriend, later wife, and asked her if the carpet matched the drapes. So Gary, of course, hears about it. And Gary fucking calls Link over one day. And you, I, I don't know if... I'm sure it was probably more heated than this. I'm sure it was a longer discussion gary told me the story in brief but i can hear in gary's voice brother you cannot talk to the man's girl that way if fritz tell me to fire you i'm gonna fire you like that and that's gonna be a shame for both of us so be cool right but apparently this did not sit well with link and he walks in the next day, and Gary's sitting on the goddamn bench in the lock in the sportatorium locker room there, those swinging doors and those old wooden benches. And Gary said he was sitting there and he saw the door swing open, and suddenly, bam, the side of his head exploded. Link, who was 260 and jacked up, had just sucker punched him right in the side of the fucking head, right in the temple. Knocked him to the floor with a goddamn, you know, a blind shot, right? And Gary's on the floor and he's on his knees, on his bent over. But what Link was too stupid to realize about Gary, and I've seen it, if you ever see pictures of Gary Hart in the old days when they had heat in Florida or Texas or wherever, 60s and 70s, he's coming back from the ring, the cops are around him, he's got one of his kabuki or one of his tag teams, somebody with him. A lot of times you'd see he'd have his hand inside his jacket. Look like Napoleon sometime. Inside his, every time that Gary went to or from the ring, inside his jacket, not in his pocket where he would have to dip, but just taped right in there, he had a single-sided razor blade where he could lay hands on it at any time. And goddamn, nobody uses razor blades to shave anymore, Brian, but do they still know that there's the double-sided that are sharp on both edges and there's a single-sided that you can grab? Like when you scrape paint off glass and shit with one of those. When you get shaved at the barber. Well, well, a lot of people aren't that fucking opulent. <laughs> opulent? But, it costs like eight bucks. Well, it costs me fucking dick all of shit to shave myself, and I don't Sounds have to too expensive. Any, don't have to let anybody next to my throat with a fucking blade. But anyway... So Gary had a single-sided razor blade inside his jacket every time he was on the way to and from the ring, but even in his personal daily life, I've seen it. He had one of those flip-open wallets, like a, you know, two-sided thing, and you could just flip it open, and right inside that wallet that he kept right inside his jacket pocket was a single-sided razor blade with a piece of white athletic tape on the sharp side taped right there. He could pull that thing out. And when Link had clocked him and he had gone down on the ground face first on his knees, he reached in his jacket pocket and as Link got him to pick him up and do whatever the fuck, he just sliced the missing Link across the middle of his fucking stomach from asshole to appetite. And that'll change your fucking emotion real quick. And Link looked at that and fucking took and grabbed his bag and left and that was his notice. On both parts, he never came back and 
they never expected him back. And no cops were called and nothing ever happened. And Link went to work for Vince in the WWF. Remember, it was managed by Bobby Heenan. Well, that was very brief. And that actually may have been before then. I don't th- I think it was... It was the last time Link was in Dallas was 83, wasn't it? No, no, because no? he had the brief run with Vince, and then he worked for Watts in 86, and then I think he went back to work after that. that. It was the last time. It yeah. was the last time, because that was pretty much, yeah. Actually, that was pretty much his notice from the business. He worked some outlaw shows in Texas after that. You know, but. and again, an interesting figure, not to go off on a, too much of a side thing, but in an era when everyone had those big physiques, he had already been a veteran for a long time, so all of a sudden he changed his physique and got really, I mean, I hate to say roided up, but that's what it looked like. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. And then it was said and that he shaved, also... Sh- shaved the head. Nobody knew it was Dewey Robertson. Shaved the head, may have indulged in some extra uh, party favors during that period of time, so he was Dewey Robertson in the 70s. He was a completely different guy you talked to a lot of people in the 80s. Yes, and, and also became a nudist, from what I understand, at oh. one point. With that haircut, that's interesting. It was, yeah, it was, well, he didn't, he, nothing was, there was nothing sprouting anywhere else on him, just right on the front of the top of that was the only hair. Maybe that's the move. You go to the nude beach and no one looks at your tiny dick because everyone's looking at that hair. What the fuck's going on there? Well, what the fuck's going on here? So the point, I don't even know if we finished the topic, but basically that's the update with, uh, (laughs) with punk and steel and any, um, I guess not, because I was about to say, I'm thinking of the repercussions of the Rogers, Bill Miller, Carl Gotch incident, and that was kind of the end of Buddy's career, or towards the end of it, within the last few years, so there weren't like 10 years after that where we could have seen how everyone coexisted. Yeah, that's, well, I guarantee you that uh, if Buddy Rogers had not had the heart issues and retired, that if he was still around as a booker or you know, top guy or whatever, that he would have tried to figure out some way to get even with both those guys. And it probably wouldn't have been hard to stop Gotch from being booked because the promoters didn't like him that much anyway because he's so fucking bland and didn't want to get beat. But Bill Miller was a star for another, what, 10 or 12 years. Wait a minute, we got some news that's broken. I just saw. And the king of broken news, Uncle Dave. Oh, that wasn't what I saw. Well, I'm seeing that he's tweeting the belief is that CM Punk will debut on June 17 at the first collision show in Chicago and that the issues have been settled. Unless things change, Chicago will be announced tonight. And we're recording on Wednesday afternoon, folks, because of my toe gout yesterday. Thanks, guys. We're going to be in Chicago. It's going to be great. And Dave continues, how the announcement of Punk's return will be handled is unknown. So that's the report that I'm seeing. What kind of report have you got? I was going to tell you, uh, I'll save it and we'll talk about it as a separate topic here. But what do you think about this? The idea that... Well, just just milk me then. Just How do you keep an idiot in suspense? I'll tell you tomorrow. Um, obviously, they've got something settled. Who knows what? But not even obviously, because yeah, these things have been obvious before and they don't happen. I'll believe it when I see it, as Mama Cornette used to say. I think there had to be some desperation with the collision ticket sales that we've talked about earlier and the fact that if they had to come out there tonight and announce, my God, this this new network two-hour primetime television show that we've got, supposed to be just the biggest thing you've ever seen, is going to debut live from Daly's Place in Jacksonville, Florida, that nobody even knew existed until AEW did TV there in the pandemic. That's not exactly an NBA arena, United Center, Chicago, Illinois, etc. So their backs were up against the wall to make this thing succeed on a number of levels. But they still are, and for the reasons we've talked about early in the program. How much damage have they done to the reputation of their number one babyface, their number one attraction, their biggest name, babyface or heel, CM Punk? How much have they made some portion of their fan base not dislike him because he's a good guy or a bad guy, but because they've said he's a cancer? And he's a problem. 
So we'll see what happens. Should we, should we just take a break right now, Brian, you think? And since this news will be announced in a mere five or six hours and come back and finish this program in the morning with the fresh announcements. Well, let me ask you just a couple of things before we take a little break here. I like that idea. Do you have CM Punk in Vegas? They're in Vegas tonight. They're in Vegas. I don't I don't know if it's a live rampage uh, or not, but usually they do a live one before the pay-per-view. And then, of course, for the pay-per-view, they're in Vegas. Do you have Punk make an appearance? Or do you try to just sell the show? And not just the show in Chicago, but at this point, because of the ticket sales that we talked about earlier, the show off the name CM Punk, does he need to make an appearance? Well, since I'm pulling this all completely out of my ass as I've just heard this and read this tweet and blah, blah, blah. What about if they announced that the debut of Collision would be in the United Center in Chicago on on June 17th, but didn't say anything about CM Punk? And what if then later on in the program... Possibly even while there's a fucking match taking place or b- b- coming out of a commercial break and the announcers are d- something that's there's already something going on. And suddenly his music hits and out he comes and everybody stops and stares slack jawed. And he grabs the microphone. And if there is a match going on, they just say, fuck it. We want to hear this, too, or whatever the VTR, they cut it or the announcer pitch, they stop it. And he says, did you really think you're going to go back to Chicago without me? And he proceeds to tell whatever the story is that he's going to fucking tell when he does come back. I don't know. (laughs) There's going to be a large portion of the audience that is going to be ecstatic to see him back. And there's going to be a significant portion of the audience that are in the camp of the buckaroos and the video game characters, they're going to hate seeing him back. He's going to be at the same time the hottest baby face and the most hated heel to vary to one side or the other in the company. And it's going to overshadow everything else. So they've either got to play along with it and give the people the explanation for it that they want, that they can make the best use out of, or they're going to ignore it and it's going to, because of legal or whatever, and it's going to be a continuing distraction that nobody can get any business done around. Punk is the best wordsmith they've got when it comes to telling a shoot story, working and shooting at the same time, and where does one end and the other begins? And I would think that they would be able to agree on something that he could say where he could both defend himself against some of his naysayers, announce that he was back to go back to where he was before, which is the AEW world champion, and at the same time do some, you know, immediate at a triage or repair work on all the damage that's been done to the company's credibility by coming out and and talking like a shoot. Yeah, me and some people in the fucking locker room don't like each other to the point where we've gotten in fucking physical fights because it's a physical business. Now I'm going to do my thing just like I always do and everybody else can do theirs and we'll see which one you like better. Well, we and should... Oh, go ahead. Well, hold on. On the pay-per-view, they haven't advertised him. If they advertise him on Thursday for ticket sales, I guess some last-minute ticket sales, but I would go ahead and I would see, because Tony's got some money to play with, he's not desperate, I would see what the fuck, with knowledge that maybe in CM Punk will not be at the pay-per-view. I don't know if I'd go that far, but don't tell him. don't tell him he is and see if there's any last-minute jump into this thing, like a bunch of last-minute buys or a bunch of last-minute tickets sold, and then decide whether to have him show up based on if there is, maybe you've got to have him do something. And if there isn't, 
Well, he wasn't advertised and they took you at your word. But at least you would know that just the mere tease of him might have created a little oomph. But I think it's too late to advertise him to mean anything. Unless, you know, so maybe would it be better that he came out after MJF finishes with the other three pillows and may, they had some kind of confrontation to tell people that Punk is back in the title hunt and that was unannounced, but people that, wow, we got a bonus on this lackluster pay-per-view. Maybe in the future we might buy some more of them that don't look too good on paper because a big star might come out unannounced. Who knows? But there, it's late to shoehorn him into anything meaningful three days away. But they could at least kick collision off in a better, a better fashion, and hopefully do some damage control on the mess they've already made in their own bed. That's my opinion. The announcement on the last night, as we are recording, is dynamite, which we will talk about on the experience this weekend. Tony Khan's big announcement this week. The big announcement of this week, the weekly big announcement. And yes, we are going to save the rest of Dynamite from Wednesday night. I believe it was the 31st of May. Uh, we're going to save that for the experience because we're going to have time to digest it. Potentially have some Pepto-Bismol and maybe get that aftertaste down. But the newsworthy thing of the program was Tony. He had announced another announcement. Thanks, guys. And there we were. <laughs> there he was on the announcement set, the bridge of the Starship announcement. And he's again, they found the the they have found the way to make Tony look palatable on television in terms of they're teleprompting him, they're toning him down, they're turning it at just the speed he should read. He's being pleasant. He's not hopping about and vibrating. But obviously, in the last seven days, since they tried to fuck punk around the last time and steal to a steal, they have apparently now come to some type of agreement. We have not heard that a steal will be coming to collision as he apparently was supposed to, or that they thought he was going to be when they hired him back apparently months ago. But since that was, that was what, queered the fucking deal last week with Punk finding this out apparently at the last minute. And so now they've had a week to talk about what, who knows what they did. Maybe they gave Ace another raise on the job that they're paying for, paying him for, but won't let him come to work to do. Because that's, Tony is like that. He doesn't want anybody to, to be mad at him or to yell at him. He'll pay them just hey. not to be mad at him. I'm so yes. mad at Tony Khan. Yes. I hate you. That's Tony what Khan. I'm saying. He <laughs> he figures if he just sends somebody a check or gives them a job or pays them or whatever, and but he doesn't give them bad news or he doesn't make them mad or he doesn't give them any information whatsoever, communicate in any way. He just, as long as they're getting their check in his mind, he's not mistreating them when he won't talk to them or he won't honor the rest of his commitments or they just disappear and they don't know what the fuck's going on. Cause he can't be, he not only can't be confrontational, he can't even fucking walk up to you face to face unless there's a big smile on your face. He can see from miles away apparently. But anyway, so in the seven days between then and then, he talked Punk into coming back to Chicago, even though that they have again now lied to him on numerous occasions and screwed up deals at the last minute several times. So Punk will be a part of the new Collision series on Saturday night, first episode, June 17th, from the United Center in Chicago. And if you noticed when they announced it in San Diego, California, or when Tony announced it, CM Punk, and then they came back to the announcers and into the live arena where Taz said, like Mussolini! The reaction was mixed from the crowd, as we knew it was going to be. But again, this actually hearing it, some people cheered and got a CM Punk chant going on. Other people went, ooh, and then when the CM Punk chant started getting loud, they tried to chime in with the booze to 
compete with that. But what these fucking mental midgets, these goddamn microscopic nitwits have managed to do over the course of this last nine months, I'm talking about Tony Khan. I'm talking about all of the EVPs and their various stooges, the Cutlets and the Nakazawas, Oil Boy. And I'm talking about, we can't leave out of the equation Tony Khan's legal team, which, good God. I mean, I, if I had Tony Khan's legal brain trust representing me, I'd be in prison right now for the Manson murders. So all of these nitwits have managed to create a situation over the past nine months where not only have they alienated their top star, their biggest name, the guy that proved to be a bigger draw than anybody else, CM Punk, they have made him not trust anything that they say from anybody in the company. They have lost the use of their biggest drawing card because I assume he's probably been cleared from a torn, was it a bicep or a pec? Now I'm trying to remember. I thought it was tricep. Tricep, one of those arm things. It's been nine months. He could have had a baby. He's probably okay by now. He could have come back earlier. But these whiny-ass little fucking romper room bitches and their whininess about their, oh, they're working for everybody's supposed to be friends here. He doesn't like us. He's going to talk mean to us. So he's a cancer. Trying to screw the deal up has deprived the company of their biggest draw. And now when they do announce he's coming back, they've managed to poison a significant portion of the fan base against him which is what the EVPs were trying to do to begin with because they were upset that he was more over and a bigger attraction than they were and also a better wrestler and a better promo. He was showing them up at every metric. They didn't want him around. They find they were trying to put the mouth on him behind his back. And he finally, when Tony wouldn't do anything about it, came out and aired it out at the press scrum. Said, all you motherfuckers are slandering me behind my back. You hangnail, you little prick, you went into business for yourself on live TV with me for your fucking silliness over being a friend of Colt fucking Cabanas. Like he could be an, an aluminum siding salesman could fill Cabana's role in professional wrestling. And Punk airs it out. And then they take him up on his invitation to come in and have a fight. and They get their ass kicked. And then they're pissed about that. And here we are nine months later. Now they have managed to poison a significant amount of the fan base against Punk by all this fucking falderall that he's the problem. And that has cost and will continue to cost Tony Khan all kinds of fucking money because they can't sell the tickets. They can't draw the money. They can't attract the viewers and they can't sell the merchandise that CM Punk can a real star with a real name from when people actually watched wrestling to some extent instead of what we go, got going on now, which is a bunch of kids jacking themselves off and playing sticky finger with each other on a billionaire's fucking dime. So that's where we're at. Now that we've seen a couple of examples, I mean, when they announced Chicago, everyone kind of thought that meant punk, obviously. We've seen the crowd's reaction a couple times. Now that you got what appears to be a mixed reaction and different cities will have different reactions, do you play into that? I mean, Punk, oh, yeah. was, Punk was great as a veteran babyface who hasn't wrestled in several years. Like that character returning was great last year, but there were always those moments where he very easily could have been heel. And it works either way for him. So what do you do now to play into this? Well, he's going to be simultaneously the biggest baby face and the biggest heel in the company because the people that are prone to like him are going to be so happy he's back. And they, they, the people who are prone to like Punk also don't like the fucking buckaroos or the buckaroo fans or the fucking whole bunch of fucking pussies. So they're going to be louder to try to drown out the fucking neck beards and the cosplayers. And conversely, those people are also offended because... Look at Punk. He, he's had pussy before. Fuck him. 
So they hate punk. So they're going to try to be loud. So, and punk is the best promo in the company. And, and I saw some people say MJF, MJF's great orator. Punk is the most experienced best promo in the company. And he's going to be able to fucking take each section of those people, whichever direction he wants. And, but the problem is, is it, it didn't, it didn't necessarily need to be this way that he would be the hottest baby face and the hottest heel at the same time. He could have just been the hottest baby face and it might have been better for business, but he will turn whatever this is into something he can work with, but it's no, through no fault of the EVPs and the legal team uh, that, you know, that, that he's going to be able to come out of this and still be over. They were trying to cut his nuts off, but they just weren't good enough at it, but they cost Tony Khan some money in the process, a lot of money. And what do you think about this return all happening on collision? A new night, Saturday, a brand new show, as opposed to the established dynamite. Any thoughts on that? Well, again, First of all, I I saw on the internet this morning that they don't have the United Center set up for a full capacity. It's like set up for half a building. So already they've dicked around and they've taken the edge off of it. And maybe if they, I'm sure they could probably open it up if they sell the tickets. I understand they moved like 500 in the 12 hours after Punk's name was announced or some figure like that. They got a ways to go there, but they're not selling 500 tickets in 12 hours anywhere else, except anywhere else in the United States. And they're not even doing that at Wembley anymore. Cause they already did it They're and they're plateaued there. So it means something, but they've dicked around and they've obfuscated the issue and they've waited until 17 days beforehand and they've had a bunch of shows in Chicago. So as far as the live gate, if they'd have had this button down for the big network upfront announcement and there wasn't any doubt about it at all, they probably could have done better on the live gate. As far as the television show, I mean, unless you're going to put Punk out there to wrestle for 20 minutes and talk for an hour and 40 minutes, it's still got to have the rest of the AEW talent and apparently not all of them. So we've got a show with part AEW talent and CM Punk. And is Punk going to write this thing? I haven't heard that. In which case, if it's more Tony Khan effluvia, then it's going to be Punk doing a good segment or two on a show that looks like Wednesday night, but not with all the talent. So I, I can't, I can't be excited unless there's going to be a new look and a new presentation and new, new creative and possibly people being serious and take the children off my television program. But I can't be excited over, I'm excited Punk's coming back so we can see that once a week, but God damn, what's he going to do for two fucking hours? One last question on all this. When CM Punk first came to AEW, it was rumored, it was presumed, they announced the show in Chicago, the first dance, never announced him, and there he was. It almost seemed like they were going down the same road here. Everyone knew he was going to be there. They called it the second coming, all these things, but this time they're announcing him. Do you think that's anything other than ticket sales issues? I don't know. See, here's the problem. The problem is, is that they never follow through with their original idea in in full without significant alteration because there's in that company there's always somebody that has an aggravation or an altercation or a whatever with somebody else and and screws the thing up at the last minute i if it had been me would have announced at the network upfronts and the same day on the program everything Collision, brand new show, two hours, Saturday night, debuts at the United Center in Chicago for the second coming featuring the return of CM Punk. The reason why he's returning is because he's been hurt. He got hurt in his last AEW match and he had surgery. And now he's come, so that fits the second coming. For the people who aren't smart about all the behind the scenes 
shenanigans since they have yet to ever explain anything that happened on their television program, including even a kayfabe reason, as the kids say. He was the world champion, remember? Of course he was. They announced the next week the world championship and the world six-man belts have been declared vacant, and those guys have been suspended. I, I They did announce the suspension, right? Actually, I don't or did recall. They, no, I they don't recall if they did. No, on they just said the belts are vacant. And we're going to find new champions. That's where we left it in September. If you don't get on the internet, you just watch the television program and you expect it to make sense. So he's got to be, he's got to come back remarking about what happened to him the last time that he was in the company. He won the world title and got injured, was off and had surgery. Now he's back. However much more detail that he wants to go into or that he'll be allowed to go into without ruffling the feathers of the pussy brigade, it would be good if he could tie in some real-life heat to that. Because to be honest, nobody ever said that the tricep that he tore was completely torn before the fight, the legitimate fight he was in, rather than the the fake one with the plumber. Sure, if he got hurt in the ring, that's one thing, but now you're in a, a legitimate, real fight with a torn tricep? Could it have been just a small injury and then that made it worse? So why not say that? These motherfuckers don't like what I say, they don't like what I do, so they came to my locker room and I kicked the shit out of them. But in the process, I aggravated the injury that I'd gotten in the match. And I've been out with surgery and rehabilitation. And now I'm back. And I'm ready to take on any of those fuckers, either in the ring or in my locker room, if they want to come back there again. And I would get a standing ovation from half the crowd, and the other half would be pulling out switchblades and pitchforks. And based on how his first year went, and all the drama... That really eats up the entire second year. Really, if you think about it, it was the first year on TV. The second year was all the drama off TV. Right. Here's the third year. Based on the audience reaction, based on his track record on the show, based on all the drama, how are you not going to want to see every single time this guy's on TV unless they do something to screw that up? He's the most intriguing guy there. You never know what's going to happen in one of his promos. What's he going to say? Who is he going to piss off? Is anyone that he's pissed off going to do anything about it? Who's he going to feud with? How long is he going to stay face? Can he be a face or a heel in this town? Every single time, like right now, yeah, I'm so intrigued to see where they're going to go with anything with him. They've got a chance. They've blown their chance with almost everyone else with me, but they've got another chance, and I'm really intrigued by this. And, and you're a prognosticator. You've been doing good on predictions. I'm going to make a prediction. I don't know. There may be a chance in hell that you would see Punk in the ring at some point with old Twinkle Toes. But I guarantee you, even though there's money to be made for the company that they supposedly helped start, and they've drained plenty of money off their billionaire boyfriend, but you will never see Maddie or Nikki have the guts or the nuts, either one, to get in the ring with Punk, even though there, there would be money made off of that because of the issue, because they're scared. And also they know that their boss won't make them attempt to make any of the money back that he's paid them for little to nothing and causing trouble. That they cost him by storming into the locker room. Yes. They can make him some of that back, but they won't because they're scared. I think Kenny would probably get in the ring with him, and I think Punk would probably have too much compassion to just kick the shit out of Kenny, because that would be like beating up a puppy. He doesn't even know what the fuck's going on around him. Hey, listen, say what you want about Omega, and you have uh, many, many, many times. Yes, yes. But after everything happened at All Out, we talked on the air, my reporting, that night, Kenny Omega was the one talking to CM Punk. Chris Jericho was yelling after the fact, trying to make a scene. The Bucks were screaming at Punk and Ace Steel, but that was more childish shit from the Bucks. But Punk and Omega came together and it wasn't, you know, another layer of the fight. It was almost trying to soothe things down. So when you say you could see them in the ring, I agree with you. I'm not saying it's going to happen, 
but that's the only one of those options that would happen. I yeah, predicted it's... after all out, there would be two people gone from the company. A Steel, and he was gone. Now they brought him back. And Kenny Omega, based on a number of things. We'll see what happens. Again, the other thing is, we'll see how much longer the Elite are in AEW. We have to see what happens there. Well, I don't really think they ought to be packing their bags because whatever contractually time is left on Punk's deal, you know as well as I do, he's just rolling his eyes, holding his nose, cashing his seven-figure checks per year and going to finish that out and then have a two-year run up north in the WWE, make several more million dollars and say, fuck it, at least I ended on a high note instead of with the idiots over there in the outlaw group. That's exactly what he's going to fucking do. And I don't blame him. That's what he should do. Well, that is it. That's CM Punk, and we'll see how he mixes in now with the mud line over at AEW. But, Jim, with that, this drive through is finally closed. Well, speaking of spending more time in the company, a long-lost friend is about to spend more time in the company because Tony Khan then, it was time for him to be on the bridge of the starship announcement thanks guys to, to announce his announcement on the announcement set and that announcement as we have talked about briefly on the drive through this past uh, past week a couple days ago collision the new program on saturday nights will feature cm punk and that's the very last thing he said and then they do the wide shots, the jib shot around the arena as the people reacted. And as we mentioned, it was mixed because you got the initial yay from the people who were waiting to hear that and the people who weren't waiting to hear that because they didn't want it to happen. It settled in on them after a few seconds and then they started the booze and the grumbling. And that went on that wave. And another thing, a good thing that, uh, or a good point that people have pointed out they were in California, so that's the Buckaroo's backyard. So they were ready to not like that announcement to begin with. But whichever way you look at it, they've done damage with their childish foolishness and Tony's inability to put his foot down and to turn personal pissiness into professional business, even though Punk has been trying every indication we've got they've damaged a number of their top attractions whichever way you look the people who like punk now probably didn't necessarily like the buckaroos to begin with but they hate them now and vice versa the people who like the buckaroos they probably weren't enamored of punk but they didn't hate him they do now because their boyfriends do so, you know, and meanwhile, the tickets for these TV shows are $500 a piece. I think it was Taz after the announcement. Like Mussolini! That's what I was going to say. He didn't do it, unfortunately, as bad as that, or fortunately as bad hey. as that. Well, you sound like crap. You know that. No, I do. Now, I'll have you know. I do know. I'll have you know. I already that, know. I just said it to you. I'll have you know that my music teacher, when I was, <laughs> when I was a kid, yeah. said that I was the best pupil that she ever had. Actually, her exact words were, of all the students I've ever had, you're the only one I can't teach anything to. See, there you go. See, I knew it all already. I think you threw a rock at her head. Well, no, it wasn't her, but... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't welcome back in the fucking history class for a few. Nevertheless, so <laughs> so anyway, now we got this big announcement. And again, when they come back east on the uh, on the uh, right side of the Mississippi River, then Punk's going to be tearing the house down. When they go over there and they're on the left side of the Mississippi, actually probably the left side of the Nevada state line, then the Buckaroos will probably have the... Uh, home court advantage but well actually done nobody any favors and the the inability to advertise this in a coherent fashion etc cetera, etc cetera, blah 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 it's just ridiculous the other question i guess we don't have an answer to yet is are you going to get the split audiences because if it becomes quickly defined that cm punk 
and whoever else, based on that poster, FTR, Andrade, Miro, whoever else, they're going to be on this one show, and the other show's going to have Kenny and the Bucks and Moxley and whoever else. If it's a clear break, when you're buying tickets, you know you're going to the CM Punk show. Are you going to go there to boo him? Or are you going there because you want to see him? Well, it it can't be a hard split because, for one thing, that'll tank the fucking ratings that they've still got on Wednesday night because there's not enough people that people give a shit about to watch to go around. It can't be... A, they can't... Who... We just talked about on the last program we did, yours, the drive through who are MJF's logical challengers? And... Yeah... How are they going to split that roster up? MJF and Punk is money. That issue has not been settled. MJF and Darby looks like something they're going to do based on the finish of the four-way because why would you have beaten the only challenger in the match that was worth a shit unless they were coming back with a single match? Past that, what the fuck's going on for the world title? They don't have depth of talent. They've got quantity of talent. They have a plethora of guys on the roster and they're mispositioned to where nobody... Can you do MJF and Danielson again after you just did it in February? You could always do anything again. Will people buy it again? Should you do it again? That's the other question. I don't think you should do that match again right now. Not to say, not to say it wouldn't be great and we wouldn't enjoy watching it, but right. I think Danielson right now is going to play with his friends. Well, yeah, and, and that's been muddied and muddled to the point where it, it wouldn't draw now, even though it was a great match. A rematch now would not mean as much as it would have if they'd announced it right after the previous match happened. So the point is, hard split, blah. They ain't going to be able to do that, and he's going to realize when he started to put these formats for these shows together, sooner or later, that he needs all his goddamn talent available, at least, for both shows. All the talent, I'm talking, not all the roster, all the talent. All the people that fans would watch and give a shit about. And this this program that we're talking about shows that. Because it, even if he hadn't split anything, it's not that deep. The next match was a triple threat match between Swerve and Big Bill and Cupcake of the Puddin' Gang. You mean to tell me that is flagship TV show worthy? It, if you had any other alternative? So, no, I, I honestly, I think Saturday night is a better night to sell tickets to a live event, but are, is it now, have they, have they aggravated a, a segment of the audience to the point where people are going to say, well, fuck, I'm not going to go support AEW because it's AEW Pink with Punk instead of AEW Chartreuse with the Buckaroos. So I'll only go if it's Wednesday. And the other people are saying, well, fuck them fucking trampoline cowboys. I'm only going to go if it's if I get to go Saturday night. And then you're... <laughs> and plus, they are adding a second show in the United States of America every week while the number of towns in the United States of America remains the same. So that means they're going to... Whatever they've been doing at whatever pace, they're going to do twice as much of it, and that's going to be twice as many tickets they got to sell. And I guess this kills any Saturday house shows going forward, unless you're going to run a house show against your own TV show, even if you have a split roster. Well, from what I saw about the house show, the the card, rather, that they just ran, and the ones that they ran in Corbin and Salem, I think they just ran Tupelo with a, a fucking entire roster. It was on the Federal Witness Protection Program. That uh, They probably killed that as it was. They probably dropped that idea already. You don't hear more being announced, but... At the same point, they do their pay-per-views on weekends. And now that WWE is going on Saturday night, they're going on, uh, and, and AEW is going on Sunday, at least they won't conflict with their own pay-per-views. They'll have the night before as a go-home show, but they will be conflicting once a month with a WWF pay-per-view. And if they're Saturday night Go home show for a Sunday pay per view does not feature everybody, all the top stars that are on the card on the pay per view. Then that's kind of stupid. And if all the top guys are going to be on pay per views, which one would be led to believe you would want every 
top name that you could have on the lineup on the pay-per-view, then all these fucking fussing and feuding parties are going to be together in the same building anyway. And they're just going to have to avoid bursting into the other guy's locker room and fucking starting a goddamn hay rube. So how's that going to take place? Anyway. Anyway. Why should we talk about the big controversy on ESPN uh, that didn't happen this past week that was pre predicted and predictified by some of the... Uh, the journalists and pundits in a kind of another whisper campaign that for once didn't work. Well, I think that before we even talk about the CM Punk ESPN article, that's a bigger story, maybe, because the article was kind of a nothing burger. The fact that in advance of the article, which the public didn't know about, word started coming out that Punk said things again, he upset people again. And then you read the article and it's like, that's it? There's nothing there. But they tried, and this time it didn't work. And I saw Punk tweeted out something, or not tweet, Instagram. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> and I think people are starting to pick up on it now that haven't been stooped over to, to grab it, even though it was laying in front of them all this time. We've been talking about it. And finally, it backfired. Finally, it didn't work. Finally, it kind of made it clear what's been going on. And just to summarize, bring people up to date real quick. You've told them most of it there. But in the days before the ESPN interview with Punk was due to come out to promote the debut of Collision, the whisper campaign started. Oh, he's he said a horrible, inflammatory thing. He's going to stir this up. and. And boy, this is going to be terrible. Wait till this comes out. It's going to throw a monkey wrench into the deal again. Who knows? Pot again, potentially putting in doubt that the biggest star that the show is built around will not be there on live TV Saturday night. And the call coming from the house or coming from the house was from the their own company. The Wednesday night crew trying to do a little sabotage again, and this time it didn't work because when the article came out. And and he actually, you'll read a couple of uh, paragraphs from it or comments from it, but not only did he actually apologize and say that he was wrong to put Tony Khan in that position at the scrum, because like we had talked about, and I could see it, he knew he was hurt, he was fed up, pissed off, and he worked with children. And it came out, but he apologized, said it was wrong for him, <clears throat> he also said that he had tried to been in contact with the other side to apologize or to at least sit down and talk, settle it, whatever, you'll read the quote. And he was told by attorneys, no, don't try to contact these people. And a bunch of things, and his problem with Paige, which was has been well documented, but if, if if you should you go ahead and read a couple of these really inflammatory things that threaten to shake the foundation of AEW and throw things into turmoil again that this no good lion gum bump and sack of snake feces was predicted to have told ESPN. Well, again, I'm scrolling down because some of the early quotes in here are not really. Uh, it's really just the things you think you would see here about his rehab and his wife's support, and just all these things, not being there for a while, lost his, uh, or left his champion. Here, I guess, are some of the quotes that the elite fans could probably get their panties in a huff over. And I proceed to have what I think is a garbage match. He's talking about Adam Page here. Because I'm trying to protect myself on stuff instead of actually just working and trying to put on the best performance I can. I'm keeping an eye out. He chopped me in the mouth one time, and I'm like, Okay, did you do that on purpose? You chipped my tooth, and I'm like, all right, should I give him a receipt? It changes the dynamic. It poisoned everything for me. And it made it all really, really ugly. And that was what set all of this off. And here we are over a year later. And, and by the let me pause. Somebody on Twitter, I saw the... Uh... The footage, what they they took the footage of that exchange of chops, right? 
and slow mode it and even did like the Telestrator graphics and showed that Punk had chopped him across the chest and then Punk leaned in, spread his arms out, had his face up, chest out, did not move, and Paige chopped him right in the fucking mouth. Bam! And it was plain, it wasn't like it was a moving target. So I can see where he might have had that reaction. Go ahead. And here we are over a year later, and ain't shit's been done about it. Let me scroll down a little further. The first thing I said to Tony when I sat down with him and spoke to him after it was, Man, I'm really sorry I put you in that position, Punk said. I apologized for the scrum. But when you watch that scrum, you're looking at a very, very frustrated guy who had told people. That's not the first time he heard all that. It's not the first time the lawyers were told all that. And I was just looking for something to be done, and nothing got done. So if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And I just didn't approach it in the right manner, but tension was high. I was very, very pissed. I pretty much knew that I had just injured myself again. I was hurt, and I was disappointed. Yeah, it's very easy for me to say I regret that, and I handled it all wrong, 100%. So let's stop there. For everyone who says CM Punk hasn't admitted he did anything wrong, there it is. But what happened in advance of this was the Whisper campaign, blah, 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 right? And then it comes out, and there's nothing out of the way. There's nothing untoward. He's honest. And the, the basic issue he had that he mentioned there was with Paige, but that he had tried to be conciliatory and had been rebuffed in those efforts, and it had been blown up, and blah, 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 we know the rest. What did one of the EVPs do before the, uh, the, uh, um, actually was this, hold on. Ah, this was after, after the ESPN article came out, Nikki Buckaroo, puts on his Instagram a picture of Paige the other night from TV and their six man trying to kill Wheeler useless while well, he's flying flips off the top rope where they just dropped him on the floor and says, not only is he good at wrestling, but he's an even better human being. Hangman Adam Page. The defender of Colt Cabana the defender of us all from this evil force. So that's what an executive vice president is supposed to do, right? To again, try to get this thing sabotaged because they're children and because they're petty. But it didn't work this time and there was a lot more backlash to them on the internet and on social media because... They were too obvious about it this time. So, uh, Dave Shearer at PW Insider wrote a nice piece, an article, on the whole issue entitled Tony Khan as a group of people who he has been nothing but good to, doing their best to destroy the thing he loves, which is a heck of a title. But... I'm not going to read the whole thing because I encourage you guys to go to pwinsider.com and do that. It was The article is up on June 16th at 4.28 p.m., but the last two paragraphs, he says, Tony Khan has a big problem, and a big part of that problem is Tony Khan. Now, let me state up front that as long as he wants to spend his family's money, AEW is fine. It'll stay around. The question to me is, what does he want his legacy in the business to be? Right now, he is seen as the nice guy who some of the talent takes complete advantage of. Some even see him as a marked promoter. AEW started so hot and with so much buzz, now it's settled into a place where its core base likes it and growth has stagnated. His management style and booking is the reason that's happened. And at a time when WWE's business is up, AEW's is down. It's not the business, it's, it's not the business, it's AEW's business that's the problem. And he said again, 
if any of the things that have happened just in this ESPN article controversy or above had happened at WWE, heads would have rolled. After one event, there wouldn't have been a second. EVPs would have been stripped of their titles and been told to toe the line or don't let the door hit you in the ass. But Tony hasn't done that. He needs to. These wrestlers are not your friends, Tony. Friends wouldn't do things that hurt your business and make your life more difficult. So that that's what, again, and Dave Shearer is an impartial person because even though Mike Johnson is the nicest human being that ever walked face the earth and hates to hurt anybody's feelings and has a high tolerance for, well, it was a good match or whatever, he's very honest, but Dave Shearer is brutally honest because he doesn't give a fuck and none of these people are his friends. He's, if, if Mike Johnson is the editor of PW Insider, Dave's the publisher and he doesn't speak to or befriend or, you know, whatever, either side in this. He's just an adult looking at it. Let me read, so, there's another quote know, here from ahead. the ESPN article that I think is important. Now, we all got to roll in the fucking mud, and that never should have happened and has never been course corrected. So I understand people want to say, oh, man, Punk is a dick. Well, yeah, because I'm defending myself and I will always defend myself, I'm open to having a full-blown fucking sit-down powwow discussion with everybody about it, but it hasn't happened yet, and it's not because of my lack of trying. There it is. The guys who say they're Christian don't want to forgive. The guys who try to pretend like they're the saints in this matter don't want to even hear what the other party has to say. Everyone wants to talk about the legal issues, what were the legal issues holding up everything. It's because Tony's trying to protect his company and his EVPs. They put Tony in his position. And now look where we are. I will say one more thing coming out of all this, Jim, that's interesting. What we've been talking about, I think a lot of other people are finally starting to pick up on. If you're in the Young Bucks fan base or camp even, CM Punk's not the problem with all this. It's all been Tony Khan. And if you're in the punk camp, it's the same thing. It hasn't been the elite. It's Tony Khan. Tony Khan has fostered an environment where this kind of shit happens. You could argue it was encouraged to happen. And that it happened. And as Punk said, nothing's been done for course correction. That's true. Nothing's been done to change everything. To change anything, excuse me. And my fear is, even with Collision and with Dynamite and the separations that appear to be there, I don't know if the problems are going to go away, and I think the problems, whether they get a new deal or not, with the original elite and the owner of all elite may be a growing concern. You think the Wednesday night crew is going to be cheering for the success of the Saturday show in their hearts? <laughs> I think anyone who's not a main eventer will. Probably, hopefully. Well, yeah. I mean, the the rank and file, the uh, you know the the regular guys that just want to get over and be in the wrestling business. But I'm talking about the ones that Tony's paying the most money to, the big yeah, stars, the that main have, eventers have a chance of being exposed. I'm sure an Adam Cole and probably an MJF because he's the world champion are probably rooting for that. That was the opening match this week. The main event though, the BCC and the Elite. I'm pretty sure we know where Moxley and the Bucks and all these people stand on. CM Punk and what is basically the CM Punk show. Well, there you again, this time it didn't work. Let's see what they come up with next. But remember, folks, we were calling it before it was so see through, weren't we, Brian? Transition from the sweeping crowd shots to Lack Mussolini. It's our man, Phil. And he's back and he's going to raise some hill. Oh. Well, I couldn't call him Fell, could I? Pathetic. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this review is brought to you by the official Cornette Face T-shirt, available at jimcornette.com. Wear it to collision tapings and CM Punk will wink at you. <laughs> now back to our review. So it was a huge ovation, and he brought the bag with the belt that he never lost, his wrestling shoes around his neck, 
And uh, his first words were basically, I'm tired of being nice. No more Mr. Nice Guy for the punkster. And this is the professional wrestling business. And he put over Chicago and the fans. He started the, the first of several times that he said what may be a new trademark. I don't like the word catchphrase. It's so a trademark line for him. Tell me when I'm telling lies. Which might be something that he can use quite often around that place. When everybody else is singing, tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies, tell me lies, tell me, tell me lies. Stop singing on the show, please. So he please. said some, some people, some people hate me for the same reason that you love me, Chicago. And I understand that the sheer magnitude of me makes some people uncomfortable. This would guy, and then the fans start chanting, fuck the elite, of course. And again, he is so brilliant verbally, such a cunning linguist, that he doesn't have to do the cheap shit that's obvious to get people to chant derogatory things about people he doesn't like. He can just make a blanket statement and they get the point. And uh, one that got a lot of traction as they say on social media with david zaslav who i had to check on that one but he's i guess the president of warner brother discovery media conglomerate but he said david zaslav calls me one bill phil because i'm the one true article in a business of counterfeit bucks <laughs> and that one landed and then he winked at the guy in the cornet face shirt and, you know, this was, it was a, a brilliant double-edged promo, I thought, because for the casual fan, if there indeed exists that animal, but just for the sake of logic and continuity on the television program, if nothing else, he talked about never having lost the belt. He talked about his tricep injury, tearing the muscle off the bone. He talked about surgery and the rehab. He talked about always being himself and never compromising. And it, it, he, it was a straight, and he's coming back to regain the recognition that he never lost with that belt in the bag, et cetera. If you didn't know anything past what you'd seen on television, it was a strong babyface return promo in his hometown arena with a, a bunch of people there. And for the majority of people, honestly, that are into this company in this day and age, that do know what happened, there was enough remarks without coming out and saying things that he addressed that too. And with the pops that he was getting from the crowd, one would think that Chicago would fall into that category of being the people who were up on it. And, you know, again, he said... For those of you who feel they're owed an apology, I'm sorry. The only people softer than you are the wrestlers you like. And we know exactly where that's going. And he's not wrong. And then a brilliant line was, he reminds everybody when he reminded them that he had the, the uh, or that he won the belt and never lost it. He said, because I didn't have the best dog collar match, I won the dog collar match. And this is mine until somebody pins me or submits me. And until somebody can fill these boots, they belong on my feet. Mic drop. Boom. 12 minutes. He had them on the edge of their seats. They liked everything he said. It was well done. It hit all the right spots. And here we go. There's not too much I could add to that strong promo. You know, I think with some people, there's a little bit of disappointment that there aren't going to be more direct shots, which I'm guessing there won't be until everyone decides to work together and be friends. But it was the reintroduction that he needed, exactly where it needed to be. And it was a promising start. You know, I wanted to go into this show with some optimism that AEW will do something right. They did his debut right. And I think his return was really good. The only thing I wouldn't have done, minor thing to go to your uh, point earlier, I wouldn't have had the commentators say anything until after this, and you could show them, as opposed to hearing any voices at all before that. 
because you could barely hear them with the way AEW mics the crowd and yeah well you know and that would have been a way to that would have been a way to do it and i can see that at the same point i think they feel like they had to welcome everyone at the top of the brand new program and never been a program in this series but the bigger issue i thought it was me and my bad hearing and i tried this on two different televisions but in a lot of cases the mix of the announcers oh, yeah. was oh, yeah. buried in the crowd. And I know it was a, a rowdy crowd, but these things are controllable. Did you have problems hearing them also? I did. And in general, I always have issues with AEW audio. And I get that different people get different feeds. Like if you're watching it on TV versus the internet feed, you may get different audio. But on TV, traditionally, it's rough. Now, sometimes you could tell it's not you. It's them. Now, sometimes you can tell. <laughs> sometimes you can tell it's in the house. It's on the mic. Like there's nothing going. There's nothing that's going to change it there. But other times you can tell it's the mix. And Kevin Kelly's not Excalibur, and I mean that in a very good way. He's not yes. just screaming at you. So maybe they weren't prepared for a human being, an adult, doing commentary here. But also the fans are loud. That's why I would have just start the show with Punk. That's what everyone's there to see. Started with Punk. Then go to the commentators. I then the crowd argue. would have started dying down anyway. You would have been able to hear them better. Yes, because when you got the crowd screaming and the music and the and the announcers vying for your aural a u r a l attention, it does get problematic. Which and two commentators yell less than Nigel McGuinness and Kevin Kelly? Well, and, and I mean that in a good way. I'm um, not saying that in uh, a bad way. Well, um, Ian Riccoboni and Caprice Coleman. That's true. And so now there are there are two accomplished announcing teams out there floating around in the wrestling industry. One is now finally employed in AEW, Ni uh, Nigel McGuinness and Kevin Kelly, and hopefully... Our friend Ian Rick, a boner, and his sidekick Caprice Coleman will land somewhere that we actually care about watching. Yeah, on Wednesday Night Gorilla, whatever that show is. Yeah. All righty then. And now it's time for our main event of the evening Samoa Joe and Gin and Juice against FTR and CM Punk. And they gave it to us with 30 minutes left on the air, and the big entrances, and the place is ready for it. And I got to tell you, again, besides the fact that this is the first time we've had a chance to see either Jay White or Juice Robinson in a, a long competitive match with other people that can work and something sensible, instead of just jumping in from behind or doing an angle or having hoo-ha match, whatever the fuck, there's their top heel team to work with FTR and their Samoa Joe we already know that he and Punk want to work with each other. So this six man gave us a tease and a very good one of what we can see for the tag team title and what we can see for the Ring of Honor, uh, whatever title Joe has or still has, or potentially the AEW title that Punk may reclaim or some kind of title. But Punk and Joe and FTR and Gin and Juice are going to be fucking just swell in my opinion and i mean the difference in this i've it just jotting things down six pros that look like pros like athletes they look serious they're wrestling their timing and execution is good the pacing the crowd is hot good high spots good action but it's a struggle no furniture no combative parkour no aggressive tumbling Nothing endless on the floor. The announcing, the production, everything makes this look like a major league wrestling show. And that is a completely different vibe on several of those levels than AEW usually reaches, except when, as we mentioned, there was the, the, uh, you know, the run that Punk had where his shit made sense and MJF has reached heights, but overall with the crowd, the announcer, the whole nine yards, everything, it's not something that we normally see on an AEW TV show that you could say this is as good or this is competitive or this company is apparently on the level of the WWE. 
I mean, am I just overstating this or did you get that vibe? I don't want to compare it to WWE right now, but I think it was certainly a clear difference. There was a clear difference, I should say, between this and Wednesday night. And the commentating to me was the biggest thing because I always say how Excalibur and that Wednesday night team were the least effective commentating team out there. It's the tone. It's what they're saying. It's how they're saying it. It's constantly yelling at you, speed talking to you. You know, not, and I've, I've, I am not anybody to say on my announcing, you know, constantly yelling, but with conviction, with meaning, with purpose, with delivering information, instead of just sounding, sounding disingenuous and hokey and it's over the top winking, uh, you know, at the audience. I am a wrestling announcer. Yes. Because they all think they're mean Gene Okerlund somehow. But and and let's uh, while we're talking about the announcing, this was the match, the main event, where Kevin and Nigel were joined by Jim Ross. And boy, howdy! Apparently, everybody knows now. He said it on Twitter. Jim Ross had one of those days, a bad day and bad trip, bad performance, unfortunately. But apparently, somewhere or sometime the night before, I guess, or early in the morning that he was supposed to go to the taping. He was, he's at his place in Florida and he was in a fall and blacked his eye and it was swollen closed. He tweeted a picture that morning, bad fall, still going to, you know, Chicago for the dynamite debut. And then when he was able to be in the booth, he had no voice. It just, it was gone. And that's, I have had troubles with my voice in the past. Remember, we had it on the show here, and it was it was from overuse. When I quit doing announcing and screaming in loud arenas, you know, it's it's better. But there's no worse feeling than trying to be an announcer and having no voice. It's just, it's fucking unbearable. So I felt so bad for him. But he really couldn't contribute. He was trying. Uh, but the morning after... The show this morning, he basically tweeted out that, you know, he apologized for his performance and is going to step away and heal is what his quote was. I don't know whether the, I don't know whether he was sick on top of the fall. I can tell you that if he fell the night before, and obviously it might be hard to get sleep in a situation like that, then he's flown in an airplane from Florida to, to Chicago and it's fucking. 9.30 9.30 Eastern time, if he's been up for 14 hours, JR's 10 years older than I am. That kind of shit makes you lose your voice too. I don't know to that extent, but, you know, I felt bad for him, and I hope that uh, he, he can take a few weeks off and just rejuvenate. But, again, the dedication that JR has to... <laughs> it, 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 I will say about Jim Ross what Jim Hurd once said to Jim Ross about me. I haven't seen such loyalty since Korea. He refuses to call in sick or to not show up or to not be there to do the best he can with whatever. To the point, Remember, in Baltimore, he passed a kidney stone in a pre-tape on a pay-per-view and didn't tap out. But... He needs to, none of us are as young as we used to be. And I'm not saying that anybody's too old to not be able to do what they used to do, but they sure can't do it as often or for as long. And and maybe they ought to try to pick JR spots where he's an analyst for the main events on pay-per-views and he can come in and do production you know, during the daytime, not in fucking hectic arenas, not after dragging him across the country with one eye or whatever for 14 hours, that might be a better use of his talents at this point. Or they could just listen to him when he gives the wrestlers some advice on what to do, but he tried that before and they mocked him on Twitter. So there's that. Back to this match. 
Dax is, I thought was as smooth as ever, although he makes me nervous because he doesn't wear a sleeve over that knee brace. And I saw the top of the, the thigh strap on his knee brace was loose. I'm like, Oh God. Cause that's another one of my nervous Nelly, you know, situation, bad knees, but Dax was great, but cash is phenomenal. And he doesn't get enough recognition for that. Uh, especially that dropkick series he uncorked and some of the other shit that he did. And he's so smooth. And and as I said before, now that I've seen Jen and Juice in a real wrestling match, I think they're the top heel team in the company. Uh, and that's they were bringing Jay White in like he was going to be a big singles deal. And I mean, they, I guess they could still make him a big singles deal, but I don't think, I think they need to be the tag team. Because that they're perfect for FTR and they work well together. And then you get, you know, Joe and Punk in there, and they did some good stiff shit. And Joe can still move like he did 15 years ago when he's motivated and involved in something important. You know, he was doing his shit. And I like the babyface team uh did the Midnight Express Midnight Express. Who are they? Midnight Express suplex pickup into the power slam the spot. The Midnight Express. Stop it. Um, I stole that from Sl I researched it from Slater and Orton, 1983 Mid Atlantic. We did it, but the job guys back then weren't great at going up for vertical suplexes, so we switched it to where <laughs> Stan would fucking pick the guy up in an ass bump and hand him to Bobby who's sitting on the top rope and he'd do the spine buster. Anyway, um, major league look and match. Cash, great buzz, saw your power slam at one point. Juice Robinson might be my new favorite wrestler. And he was I the, told you, he's great. I know, you, you don't have to keep saying that, though. I told you so, I told you so. I learned that from you. <clears throat> well, you learned too good. <laughs> but I love Juice. And then finally, Punk got the last big hot tag and made the big comeback, and they did lots of back and forth. And this match had flown by. Instead of being a 30-minute series of chaos that you couldn't keep straight and nobody could possibly ever live through, this was an athletic contest that went back and forth with twists and turns and believable fucking bumps. They stayed in the ring. No dives. And then finally... As I mentioned, Punk made that big comeback, and then they set the deal up where <laughs> Cash and Punk tagged each other in at the same time, which you can't do, but fuck it. People were with it, But and, and Kevin Kelly... You can't do it, though. ...who is just as quick like that, saw that, and so as not to bury himself, but as not to shit on the match, said, well, they might be taking a little liberty with that tag... And so it was registered and noted, but it was moved on. And But you still, you can't do it. And then uh, Punk and Joe stood and traded. Boom, 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 boom. And it broke into a big six-way. And Joe got Punk in the sleeper. And Jen and Juice were holding FTR on either side of the ring so they couldn't make the save. And finally, FTR came out. Cash hit that big body block of Jay White, I think, off the apron. And Dax saved. Uh, the punk from Joe with the headbutt to the back, and that's they that got was me. Brilliant. They got. I thought there was a chance Joe was going to choke him out there. They yes. got me. Yes, and it, there was. It, they milked it enough that you bought it, but then they didn't go too long that it 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 lost the momentum. And then FTR broke it up just in time, but that was brilliant because they've showed that Joe would have choked Punk out, and even the announcers said it. If it hadn't been for FTR, Joe would choke Punk out. And that can be brought back in a single situation. And at the same point, FTR cleared the path for of, of Gin and Juice and then saved Punk. And then FTR hit the big rig on Juice and who took a bump and bounced into Punk's go to sleep. One, two, three. And what a finish. It built. It built bigger. It wasn't like they did every big move they knew. And then when they were done with that, somebody just won with a simple thing or tapped out or whatever. It was that they built it and built it. And finally it was slam, bang, pow. 
one, two, three, and then a big pop. And I'm losing my voice like JR from staying up and watching too much wrestling. But that's the way you build a finish, and then you blow it off, and then you pay it off, and then the people loved it. This was the best six-man tag match in AEW history. Now, I know that ain't saying much because normally they're the shits. But they proved here you can have a good one if you try and you know what you're doing. By far, this was the best six-man tag they've ever had. And it wasn't for their bullshit trios title. It was just six guys, three on each side, that wanted to fight each other. So, again, I, you know, we don't know what the ratings are. This is Sunday morning, I guess. Good God. I don't know if this is planet Earth anymore. It's afternoon now. Well, well, there you go. We talked too long. But we won't get ratings for a few days. We'll see. It's a new show. It's Saturday night, et cetera, et cetera. But one would think that if they keep doing shows like this without the silliness and the softness, that they'll get some of the disaffected fans back. They're going to get the punk fans and if they keep having wrestling like that, then they may get some of the wrestling fans that have given up on all this other bullshit. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, I would think that they will have a better audience retention on this program because the last two segments were just as good as the first one was. All right. Well, that was AEW Collision. That, you have no opinions? Are there no opinions, no workhouses? Well, to your overall thought, I think the most important thing, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't like the House of Black uh, blackout segment, even though I like Buddy Matthews' match, I want a different tone here. I think the experiment should be a different tone. Let's see how a different, a serious tone. The original concept of a sports-based wrestling product. Mid-South 2023. Let's try to do that. And it was a promising start. Excellent six-man tag match. FTR looked great. Juice Robinson, I'm telling you, he's really good. And I think Jay White, when you see him in the States, you realize he's not... Not that everyone has to be a bigger guy, but he's not a bigger guy. And him and Juice together fixes that. Yeah. Because Juice has some size to him. The crowd, when Joe and CM Punk squared off, this is with... Zero time being spent on TV building up the history of these two guys. Showing the old ROH tapes. Zero time. Which he owns, by the way. Which he owns, which I'm sure we're going to see clips of and interviews about pretty soon. And that was the reaction these guys got just squaring off. That was promising. FTR, you know, I think there's something with FTR to be said for mentally working against people who you know you're not going to have an issue with behind the scenes or whatever else, working with people you want to work with. Again, the new show, the new tone. I think it showed in the work there. These seemed like guys happy. Not that, like, you know, like happy, like, hey, they're smiling and shit, but they seemed like they were happy to be doing this. They were motivated. They were working hard. You could tell there was extra aggression, extra, we, we've all got something to prove here. We want to stand out. Because they've seen the other side of the coin. A few weeks ago... They would have been in that Aubrey match on Friday night on Rampage. <laughs> that was what these guys were mixed up with, Mark Briscoe and Jarrett and all that. And now here they are doing this, and it was an excellent match. Can't wait to see what they're going to do with Punk and Samoa Joe. You have to think Punk and MJF long-term has to be a thing because he still has the belt. But we yeah. have a world champion. I thought this was an excellent debut episode. Other than the Wardlow match, I liked every match, although the Miro match I thought was too long, but promising. I mean, now it's going to be really interesting going from this to Wednesday night, just seeing the, again, the difference in the tone of the show and the quality of the show and who's on the show. The opening video here, it was noticeable who wasn't in the video. No Bucks. Yeah. No Adam Page, no Omega. I, I don't I think it was disturbed. Moxley. I, well, I was disturbed to see Pockets was still there. And my God, that's a pox that they can't infect a brand new program with. But it is, um, it is Tony's personal religion because Tony loves Orange Cassidy. And Tony believes he's doing special stuff with Orange Cassidy. 
And Tony is... Yeah, the, the word special could apply in there somewhere. And Tony's insistent on converting non-believers into being believers. If a wrestler doesn't get it or doesn't want to do something with him, Tony will try to get them to understand the brilliance of Orange Cassidy. <sighs> which is why he's going to put him on this show, because he wants to stuff him down your throat. <sighs> well, I'm going to cough him back up. But anyway, I thought this was a, a great debut show also, and it's not as laborious to watch as Wednesday night. It's not nearly as silly. It wasn't as repetitive. There was some control with the guys to what they were doing so that everybody's match stood out as somewhat different. And just some logic. No Justin Roberts, no Excalibur, no Shivani. Hate the no Bar Brady. No Bar Brady. Hate to put Taz in that mix, but, you know, Taz, Renee Paquette, various people who are the sounds and the faces of Dynamite were not here. Shivani shouldn't have been here, but I think that's important. Set a different tone to the people who are already disinfected by AEW. <laughs> Let them know there's something else to embrace. The Hardys and the Guns. And we've talked about... This is Dynamite. Way, this is, this is Dynamite. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> 621 on your calendar, June 21st, the summer solstice. Everybody's brains were baked. The Hardys and the Guns, we've explained the folly of what they did with... They reunited one of the most popular tag teams of all time and gave it away on free television in a meaningless match. And then... Sometimes they're around and sometimes they're not. We mentioned they could have had a cohesive strategy. I would have done something to Matt Hardy to make him not only a raving baby face, but in an injured, sympathetic position looking for revenge to bring Jeff Hardy back as a surprise. Boom, 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 to clear the ring and lead to a pay-per-view match because the first time that you would see the Hardys together in this given all the conditions what prevail would probably be even the most popular or the most profitable one the big reunion in a grudge match on pay-per-view where the people got to pay it pay to see it and then possibly about a month or six weeks down the road you've maneuvered them into a huge match on free television for the ratings and then if you were very careful they would earn their money if you had them work in some fashion, back and forth between pay-per-view and television, six or eight times in the year. But you would get descending returns because... <sighs> look at the condition of them. In term, and it's not... That's not like, you know, an insult. Look at what they've done to their bodies. Can't do that shit anymore. And I actually thought this was the best they've looked in a while, this match. Well, I don't, then I'm glad I haven't seen what Jeff did last because what I saw was him just jumping up in the air and landing wherever the fuck he lands and the other guy's supposed to catch him and break his fall or fucking cushion Jeff's fall somehow at the expense of his own body. But anyway, they could have made something out of this. The Hardys are icons. Now, what they did was they, without giving them their due as legends and having a couple of big matches that really got notice and you could have hid some of the weaknesses and people have been happy to see them. Now they just been here and been here. And now they want to get somebody over with using Matt and Jeff to do it. The guns young team, but they don't do, they don't, the guns don't beat the Hardys, the interference from the two other fucking guys do. So you've just, negated the Hardys doing a shocking job for this young team of the future to set up a, a, an eight-man tag team match that didn't doesn't involve either one of them. That was the most interesting thing because, again, I thought the match, because I've seen some of their recent stuff, I was ready to shit on it. It wasn't as bad as some of the other stuff I saw, and it was a hot crowd, and the guns were doing everything they could to move around. So I wasn't going to kill the match, but then I was like, oh no, they're going to do something, I guess, with Ricky Starks and the Hardys and someone, but then the Hardys just vanished and they were gone. And it was almost like they weren't even there to begin with. <laughs> well, and, and also, and I understand what you're saying about how it was one of the better Hardy matches, but unfortunately with my eagle eye, 
and a discerning mind for this, it was because the guns were bumping like human super balls for uh, the guns were literally working around Jeff to a big extent being immobile and Matt to some extent being Im immobile and all the action and movement, whether offense or defense was the gun boys in large part. And except at one point, Matt, it made a big comeback and gave one of the guns a twist of fate and the gun sold it like a stunner. Cause I, I don't know where that, but, but anyway, the point is the, they, they created a situation where the green guys were having to, to carry the veterans. And yes, there, there's been the bruiser and crusher effect for many years in wrestling where the opponents had to carry the icons, but the opponents were usually, Bachwinkle and Stevens for Bruiser and Crusher, or they also experienced, or the Horseman for Nikita, or whatever it may be. And so it didn't do the Gun Boys too many favors to do this, to get this win when they had to do all the work, and then the Gin and Juice come down, and they're the ones that beat the fucking Hardys, basically. And then Gin and Juice come back and get heat on Matt and Jeff, too. And then here comes Ricky Starks, and the heels stop him. And then here comes FTR, and they get a big pop. And they have a big brawl, but the heels are still up. And then suddenly, here comes, and I love the staggered run-ins. No so, music. And no music for the run-ins, because it's a sense of urgency. They're trying to save somebody. And you got the pops. And the people are going fucking batshit. So th this part, yes, as soon as they got Matt and Jeff out of there, they, they, you know, business picked up. But it's just, it's been a mishandling, unfortunately, of the Hardys reunion. But anyway, Punk clears the ring, gets the microphone, makes the challenge for the eight man on collision. And, and, and so we will see Gin and Juice and the guns against FTR, Starks, and Punk. And uh, boy, I hope the third episode of Collision is not a 10-man tag team match, but at least we got some hope here. So the That is the third episode. The, oh, for God's sake. They said we're gonna we wanna have the match next week, not this week, next week. Or Nick. Well, that is next. All no, right, now how do you look at this? This is an uphill or downhill situation. Next week would be next Saturday to me. Rather than Okay. Not a week and a half, not a show and a half from now. I think right? if, I think if it was going to be on this weekend show, it would be we'll wrestle you this weekend. We'll wrestle you this Saturday. Not we'll wrestle you next Saturday. Well, the this Saturday is the next Saturday that we have. No, it's the it's the Saturday that's coming up. No, it's not the only one. There'll be more, It's the but this is the next it's one. It's the very next one, but usually the phrase is used for the week after. Well, you don't have to put the qualifier very in, because just the next Saturday that we have, as a, as a, as a humanity here, as a race of people on this big blue marble, the next Saturday we have is next Saturday. When they announced the matches on Dynamite later in the show for Collision, the only I remember they announced uh, Brody King versus Andrade, continuing the Andrade House of Black feud. But I don't think they announced the punk match. Well, I'm goddamn confused then. Or maybe they are. Or maybe they they confused me. See, that's the way it became. But we're going to have an eight-man coming up. It's what we're going to do. A lot of multi-man matches, but at least it gets punk and FTR on the screen they produced last week. So. Yeah. You know what? That's the thing. They had that six-man match, and they gave it time. And it was great, and it was different, and it was paced well, and it was exciting. And if you're going to have Ricky Starks as one of the top baby faces on Collision as well... He gets a good rub. Gets a good rub from that. And once again, to me, Juice Robinson stood out in this thing. Just his screaming, yeah. just everything Shit. about the fucking guy. Jay White looked good. It's weird to say this. They're trying to elevate the guns. These guys were the tag team champions. It's easy to forget that but they're trying to elevate the guns by having them involved with all these guys. And the guns have looked good in there. I have to say, Oh, they, they did a, uh, a masterful job of bumping and feeding and falling and 
et cetera, et cetera. But uh, they're, they're, they're animated. They're so animated. But anyway, so basically Punk made that challenge for whenever it may be on Newfoundland time or whatever. And then he called for his music. Like Mussolini, he saved the day. And the Hardys had completely disappeared. Gone away. See, Gone you could have made it rhyme. You could have worked it. Well, I, you you see, you scold me about singing <laughs> so much. Now I'm frightened. And by the way, wonderful shot. Um, pretty much all night, but especially in this match of this big bulbous head across from the hard camera, the the sign being held up. It looked familiar. As a matter of fact, it. For those of you who might not realize it, you can purchase the official Cornette Face t-shirt at jimcornette.com, available in sizes small to 5X for our portly friends. And you can have that right on your chest, just like that guy had the big sign. My head's not that big, though. But I'm looking down over everything. That was a gigantic sign. <laughs> it was pretty A gigantic big. head. Yes it, yes, it was. It hit well during that Jericho match. <laughs> Well, we ain't there yet. Except for the main event, that was the whole program. And that's why we were, Brian and I, I'm, I'm speaking to the greater assemblage of listeners out there, why we were downtrodden and downhearted and kind of bummed out by what we thought was going to be a, a, a kind of a guaranteed bright spot after last week on Saturday nights. But they brought it up at the end. Should we go into the main event, Brian? Please. It was actually good. An eight-man tag team match. We've gotten away from the six-man tags. Now we're going to... And now, if they call the six-man tags trios, does that mean this is a quattro or quadraphonic? Well, definitely not quadraphonic. That would be with the sound. Okay, then it's got to be a quattro, right? Uh, I, I guess it could be. See, that's how silly trios is to call a six-man tag match a trios match. But would it be quattros? It's not trio, it's trios. So would it be quattros match? And that's what I said, a quattros match. Oh, I thought you said quattro singularly. Well, whatever it may be. Point is, and then if they have a ten-man like the Anarchy in the Arena, is that going to be a quintos? Might better just use the goddamn numbers. What about quartet match? Well, that would be a tag. A quartet match? Yeah. Well, your tag team, your your team is the quartet. No. The whole match is the quartet. Well, why does that have to be the rules? And then, and then give them one of them a violin and the other one an oboe and the other one a guitar, and you'd have a string quartet. I'll take the guy with the oboe. Well, I used to know a guy played an old oboe. Used to play it across his knee. Play me a song, oh. Curtis Lowe, oh, Curtis Lowe. All right, anyway. These are so, the breaks, Curtis Blow, Curtis Blow. No. No? Curtis Lowe, not Curtis Blow. The Ballad of Curtis Lowe by Leonard Skinner. Play me a song, Curtis Lowe, Curtis Lowe. I wish that you were here so stop, stop. would know. Come on, you're upsetting people. All righty then. So the eight-man tag was the Gun Boys and Jen and Juice against Ricky Starks, FTR, and CM Punk. And they did all these separate entrances and saved Punks for last, and then you heard Like Mussolini with cheers and boos. And everybody was standing. Some people were cheering. Some people were flipping birds and going, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> and then the people that were cheering tried to drown out the people that were booing and vice versa. And now they have made it to where that punk is now not only the biggest baby face, but then also the biggest heel in the company. And. Huh, it wasn't the. EVP's plan with their slander campaign after they got their panties in an uproar because Tony wouldn't powder their pussies by firing the guy that kicked the shit out of them 
after they put the mouth on him, slandered him, and then instigated a physical confrontation that they were not equipped to handle. And he has done absolutely nothing, he being Tony, to punish the officers of his company who have devalued one of his assets and basically come out and told the most dedicated part of his audience do not like this guy, don't support this guy, and don't watch this guy, even though he's in our company. Because we're mad, and he's a bad person. But now the guy that was universally being cheered, at, and he's still an attraction. Punk is still at it, because now he's the most controversial person in wrestling, because he's the only person that in, in the business that can get the biggest positive reaction and the biggest negative reaction on the shows that he's on. But it wasn't the EVP's plan to make him attractive in that way. It was their plan to poison him to their fan base so that they wouldn't want to see him and Tony would spend the millions of dollars that he's paying Punk unnecessarily throwing it down a well because he couldn't get his full value out of Punk because he'd been poisoned to the fans. That's what the EVPs tried to do. And it still remains to be seen whether it's going to affect, is it going to affect his merchandise business? And the merchandise he sells, are the AEW faithful going to buy Punk's merchandise like they were? That's going to cost Tony money. Are they going to come to buy tickets on Saturday nights, much as the people who like wrestling and want to see a program that makes sense and is not pointed at and written for and catered to children and childish minds, they don't want to go on Wednesday now. They want to go on Saturday. But that wasn't punk telling them don't support the Wednesday night show. That's just demonstrably we're going to get wrestling on Saturdays, hopefully, rather than childish trampoline cowboy bullshit. So is Tony going to do anything about these motherfuckers that he's paying more money to than they've ever seen in their lives and more money than any of them deserve from a wrestling promoter for their limited talent that they possess? Talking about Hangnail and Maddie and Nikki and old Twinkle Toes and their assorted crew that's even less valuable than they are. How long is Tony going to pay them all that money while they continue to do nothing but cost Tony money by devaluing things he invests in? So the people, every time Punk gets in, the booers want to boo him, then the cheers want to out-cheer the booers, then the booers want to out-boo the cheers, and it gets a reaction but it's needless and unnecessary. All that Maddie and Nikki had to do was take their ass kicking that they asked for and get over it like men. That's all they had to do. Anyway, like last week, this match was... The in-ring work and general professionalism was way up compared to anything else on this show or anything else in this company. This is the kind of match that the guns need to be in to learn because they're opposite guys that know what they're doing, pacing and fucking execution and etc. And again, with FTR and Punk in a match, it looks and feels like a wrestling program. And Jen and Juice are holding their own every step of the way. I love Juice Robinson. And the guns, are they have such promise, and they're so animated, and they work so hard, but they need direction that these guys who are more experienced and more talented than the guns' normal opponents gave them. And the match, it moved at 100 miles an hour for a long time, but it flew by because they kept it fresh. It made sense. They didn't bury the referee. Everybody was tagging in and out. There was no extended floor fights. Was there a dive in this fucking thing? Thank God I don't think I saw one. Yes, 
Cash did the dive at the end of the finish when everybody went crazy. Cash did a dive and it looked like he killed his opponents and him too. Himself, yeah. Yeah. So it was a goddamn wrestling match instead of a bunch of guys on a trampoline jacking off like the California contingent. And then uh, again, the match made sense. They got heat on Punk. And finally, he made the hot tag to Starks. He made a nice comeback. That's when it broke down into an eight-way and some guys went to the floor and Cash did the dive that all, he almost overshot the barricade and everything. But it was during the big build to the finish and the blow-off of everything. That's when all the big shit happened. And then Starks hits a spear on everybody. But as he ends up through the ropes head first, Juice nailed him from the floor and he spun into Jay White's finish. Boom. One, two, three. So now the heels have won. And holy shit, where are we going to go from here? Great match again for a main event. Unfortunately, most of this program felt like dynamite instead of what we got last week from collision. But you can, you can see that they're trying with Hobbs getting a decisive win with Miro getting a short promo where he just, you know, gets his new gimmick over with the main event delivering in the ring with even the matches that weren't very good, not just doing all the bullshit that happens on Wednesday night. You can tell they're trying to make this show different but they do apparently need a, a better line of demarcation crossed in the sand on what talent is going to be allowed on this program. Well, there's the problem. How much of this is going to be an ongoing problem whenever there's a pay-per-view the next day and everyone's in town at the same time? And the, the, Tony forces, and I understand there's, there, there's financial reasons. You've got a national television show and you want to plug the pay-per-view you've got the next day. It's not Collision's fault that the pay-per-view has a bunch of matches nobody gives a shit about except for the people who would buy it just to see New Japan's Howie the Mailroom guy. Just random people, but uh, that's why I'm sure he did a lot of this because it's the night before the pay-per-view and they wanted to push it, but you know, they're going to be preempted on Saturday nights. And Saturday night is always the night before the pay-per-view. So if Collision is going to be a good show, except the night before a pay-per-view, or except when it's preempted, we might not be able to find it. That's going to be a handicap to overcome. I wish they'd switch nights. Wednesday, they never fucking move anywhere. Can't we have the good show on Wednesday and the shitty show on Saturday? Anyway. Collided with Collision. They're batting 500 so far with two winners of a main event. You know what? I like the energy for the Punk match. I know it's not perfect. In a perfect world, he wouldn't have his reputation and whatever value to AEW diminished however much it's been diminished by, can't even call it a whisper campaign anymore, the campaign to <laughs> destroy him. But the John Cena-esque reaction? Yeah. I like that. And I don't think... I think the one thing John Cena showed is it doesn't drive people away. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm well, sure I'm we, sure we his were... merch will be great still. And I'm you're going to get this kind of weird reaction in certain towns. With Cena, you weren't dealing with a subset of a niche audience. You were dealing with what was still a if if the WWE audience is is three times now what AEW's was during Cena's heyday 15 years ago it was three times what WWE's audience is now that was a lot of people and there was plenty to go around the people that liked him the people that didn't like him kids would buy his shit grown men would boo him whatever it was great reaction but it didn't hurt business but when you're talking about a much smaller group of people that are AEW followers. You've got your base audience that likes the trampoline cowboys. You've got some significant portion of other people that just like to watch all kinds of wrestling. And then you've got the, you know, a couple hundred thousand or however many it is that punk brings because they were wrestling fans and they'll follow punk, but they haven't been, 
particularly paying that much attention to what's going on these days since he was gone. And you can't really afford to run any of those off. Now, it's not bad for Punk besides his reputation being slandered by these nimrods. He still gets the same amount of money. He's on contract. And as we said, now he's the hottest guy on both sides of the roster. He's going to get more reaction positively or negatively than anybody else on the card. But again, if I was Tony Khan, I would run these fucking vice presidents over with a car that they worked this hard and this long and right under my nose without me having the balls to do anything about it to poison people from spending money on or wanting to see or pay attention to the biggest star that Tony Khan has in his company because of jealousy. And I can't believe he doesn't take a stick to these motherfuckers. Not just the EVPs. No, all of their, all of their associate associated friends and well, beyond hangers. that, beyond that Jericho, we heard about some of the things Jericho well, said. I put Jericho in that friend and hanger on camp now because he, hello fellow kids. He wants to be with the fucking, you know, the problem is now the problem is now, Jericho wants to be with the young kids. Well, the young kids 40 years ago were the ones in wrestling doing all the fucking drinking and drugs and partying and carousing and getting in trouble and kicked out of hotels, all the shit that Jericho's doing now when he's 60. And the kids that are 20 now, they're playing video games and diddling themselves in their hotel room because they don't want to get outed for actually going out and trying to get laid. So that's some kind of goddamn time warp there with old Chris, isn't it? Yeah, they want to go play video games, and meanwhile, Dr. Roxo is getting kicked out of the hotel. Hey, Derek. But anyway, so, yeah. When you were going to make a thought about it, I can't believe Tony hadn't taken a stick to these people for costing just, him money. I was just going to say, in terms of the slander of CM Punk, it wasn't just the Young Bucks and their friends. Don't forget, there were other people in the company who saw Punk as a threat for one reason or another. But because the next match was the Owen Hart tournament match with satoshi kojima versus cm punk and as we mentioned i think there that maybe they flipped a coin and said okay heads gets first tails gets second we're going to tony but you had again in toronto and this time with an actual big crowd not like they had the other night with the tv taping they shoehorned in but the original show they actually announced was 13 or 14 thousand people and when they hear Black Mussolini, they went out of their fucking minds in both directions. And again, now they've got, the, they've ended up where their biggest star is now, again, the most popular and most unpopular guy in the company. Because now he gets more heel reaction than. MJF does because while everybody enjoys booing MJF because he is a fabulous heel, the little buckaroo fans really are booing punk because they hate him because he beat up their heroes. And the people that love punk are trying to conversely out yell and out cheer and out chant or whatever those assholes. So, and Toronto is where, but you couldn't hear the music practically. And they could have had my vocals on Cult of Meat with Extra Cheese. Nobody would have noticed. It was so loud. But And let's be honest, it wasn't as much a mixed reaction as it was more anti-punk than pro-punk here. Well, yes, cause, and also because the boos are the loudest, but also they're in Toronto and one of the one of the group that punk turned away with fucking you know, their hat in their hand and their dick in their hand was Twinkle Toes, who's from Canada, and they loved him here. And there's a, a lot of soft little buckaroos in Toronto, apparently. But it, but that's the thing. And then Kojima, by process of elimination, became the fucking baby face. So Punk, Punk went with it because he was loving it. He's making a big fucking check regardless of what they do, and he's doing his shit, and it's getting more reaction than anybody in the company again. And so, in this one, Punk put 
Kojima stuff over. So he leaned into being a heel and subtly switched to put himself in the heel position without kicking somebody in the balls or gouging eyes, but selling a little bit more on an exchange or coming out at the uh, the worst end of the exchange, specifically to keep the thing moving, keep it entertaining, and give people what they wanted to fucking see. And, I mean, for the most part, Punk was keeping it entertaining. Again, Kojima's... Eh. And then he made the comeback, and I get is he the one that Kingston got it from that does the ridiculous fake fast chops in the corner that's no. so ridiculous and childish? No, I think he got it probably, if I had to guess, originally from Kenta Kabashi because he was doing it in the 90s. But this guy does it too, and this guy did it too. And at one point, Punk finally just put his hand up and shoved him up and said, all right, that's a fucking enough. It's so ridiculous looking. How can you be a grown man and want to do that? And and I can't imagine a grown man would want to take it. It's just... This whole show, there were way too many chops. Way too many people standing well, there letting the other... Too many matches. I mean, even if you're going to do it one time on a show, which they do it so often, it's probably too much right now. How many matches had that spot? Well, this wasn't even the you hit me, I'll hit you spot. We'll fucking eviscerate that later on this was that thing where it's so ridiculous where he's slapping the guy's chest with one hand and slapping his belly with the other hand and just do it you're not even making contact and it just makes the guy that's having to stand there look like an idiot phony fucking bullshit anyway so kojima goes up to the top rope and more or less fell off the top rope with an elbow drop right in punk's nuts and that's what they said. Kojima is a 31-year veteran. And I'm like, how the fuck old is this fucking guy now? Do they have young wrestlers in Japan these days? They do. Um, Takeshita is a young wrestler from Japan. He's not in Japan these days. What are they doing on the New Japan cards? Is it like goddamn chaos at the rest home? Do they, do they have a fucking hover round to get him to the ring and then a fucking Stairmaster lift to get him up in the ring? Well, it's a long process. You have to be trained. They have to teach you all the submission holes. They have to really grueling techniques to stretch your neck and everything. And then they send you to Sassoon and you get your hair done and you're ready. How come all the young guys that were working for Anoki and Baba in the 80s didn't look crippled? They looked like they were the baddest athletes on the planet. And they didn't fucking sissy slap each other. Anyway, Punk took back over and went to the top. The crowd booed like crazy. And he glorified in it. And then hit a nice elbow off the top. And then he got the Anaconda Vice. But old Kojima fought out and started with the Mongolian chops. Which again, oh my god. But Punk was selling him great with the fucking la body language. And then they did a, a false finish. And then Punk went for the lariat. Or no, the other guy went for the lariat or something. But Punk hit the kick and a go to sleep, a one, two, three. And he did the best he could, just like MJF did. He got all that they could get out of these guys. You know, the... <laughs> I mean, you can't deny that people like the idea of seeing these people more than what they, if they'd have just been honest about what they were seeing, it was a different fucking vision. You may be right, but I actually thought this was a great match. I really got into it. I thought Punk, Punk's facials are the most underrated thing about his game because you believe everything he's going through in the match. Yeah, he's reacting to everything. It's great. And that crowd reaction, I'm a major mark for crowds going nuts like that. and. I don't know if that's going to go away, and there's going to be different towns where it's different, and it's going to create a unique energy you're going to want to see and hear every single week. Punk played into it perfectly. He knew what he was walking into. Oh, yeah. And he dealt with it perfectly, and he delivered a fantastic match, I thought. Well, I mean, if, I really like this match. I, I'm I, not as down I, on Kojima, uh, especially this performance here, as you are. I rated Punk's effort five stars. Well, Kojima was the best of a... A bad situation, as Mama Cornette used to say. Um, here, but uh, again, the the goofy chops 
and just the other, and, and just goddamn, they all do the same shit. We're going to see, this was the first time we saw some of it that night, but we're going to see more of it and more and more. And I was tired of it. I'm a, I'm tired of it. I can't handle no more of it. Old Anderson, if you move. All right. You know what it was time for now, don't you? Old Brian. Like Mussolini on commentary. That's CM right. Punk is on color commentary for the Owen Hart tournament match between Rowdy Roddy Strong and Samoa Joe. And did you notice Punk may not be that mo that popular in Toronto or a Hamilton or whatever, but the front row loved him. Everybody that could get within range of touching him or getting his autograph, they love him. It's just those cheap people up in the fucking stands that th they don't have enough money to be able to like CM Punk. Anyway, um, you know, how can I say I didn't like Roderick Strong and Samoa Joe? Because that was the reason why that I was involved with and interested in the Ring of Honor style. This is what, and these guys, and of course now they're the previous generation, but they were the generation of guys that showed what modern pro wrestling could be. They weren't fucking constantly breaking furniture. Nobody was doing goddamn somersaults and flips. They were in shape, believable guys, hitting each other hard in safe places, acting like it's a struggle. Roddy's cardio is incredible. He's in tremendous shape. He wasn't blessed with size, but he's strong as a bull, and he he works the way that he should for his size and gimmick. And Joe the same way. He's believable because he's a fucking beast. And he can pull out a dive every now and then, and it looks like a goddamn flying greyhound, but he will beat you and pummel you down. And he's a got a mean countenance when he does it. And and that is what I wished that instead of this silly joke crowd, the buckaroos and their ilk, that the passion of these guys could have been looked kindly on by a gullible billionaire so that you could have modern-style, athletic, competitive, serious pro wrestling that people could enjoy instead of a bunch of goddamn silliness from the fucking Ringling Brothers set. It, their chops and forearms landed. They weren't standing there daring the other guy to take a free shot. They were trying to avoid him, which is what you would do. Aggression... Uh, you know, Roddy sells and fights from underneath. Well, Joe is a very formidable looking guy. He moves his fucking weight around. A punk was good on color. He mentioned he has never beaten Samoa Joe, which is important to say. And he's, he's named Brian, the fans of collision. We're the colliders out there for all the colliders out in the audience. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Um, <laughs> But anyway, they went back and forth, Roddy and, and Joe, and uh, again, two really good workers doing what they do. And finally, Roddy had built, he had tried to get some kind of backbreaker for a while and he couldn't pick Joe up. But finally, he hit a backbreaker, but he sold his own knee. And then he hit a kick and got a two count. They go back and forth again and Roddy gets an angle slam on the big son of a bitch for a two count. But then, boom, just seconds later, Joe ma maneuvers behind, gets the rear choke, and takes Roddy down, and he passed out. And the referee stopped it. There was no tap. I don't mind a heel using a sleeper or a choke or a submission hold, but I hate it when the fucking babyface taps. Should always either referee stop it or pass out. And again, it was a good, solid match, and... I bet you this kept the audience like the last week's. We don't have ratings yet. It's holiday. We may not have them for the drive through I don't know, but you wouldn't, if you wanted to, to watch a wrestling program, you would not have changed the channel on this match. You wanted to see what was going to happen. And then afterwards, Joe comes back in the ring and picks Roddy up and gives him a power slam on a chair in the ring. Just one, just once. 
and Punk rolls in and Joe leaves and they stayed with it. And this is the most important part. And there's a couple points to be made about this. But you saw the EMTs putting the neck brace and on Roddy and putting him on the backboard. And I wrote, amazing, it's like a wrestling show. And then the, they showed them wheeling Roddy out on the stretcher after a power slam on the chair. This show is not embarrassing to watch. This show, honestly, right now, as I'm going to mention, in a vacuum, would make you care and want it next week. Well, how is Roddy? And goddamn, who's, who's going to do something about this? And is he still in the hospital or whatever the fuck? But here's the problem, not only with the, I talked about the girls' ladder matches. How can the fucking 250-pound guys get hurt? taking a bump that the 120 pound girls get up from, but this is how it's supposed to be done. A guy was power slammed by a 300 pound fucking heel on a goddamn metal folding chair. He should go to the hospital and get checked out. We should have EMTs and there should be drama. But the problem is when these little hatchet headed nitwit college dropouts wearing their flowery fucking skinny jeans, come off the goddamn roof through three flaming tables and pop up to take a selfie with their opponent immediately afterwards, it kind of dulls the response of the fans to when somebody tries to do it right. Which is why I've always said that all that shit, not only irresponsible for your health and the longevity of your career, but also... Even if it's some wrestler, I don't give a fuck whether he lives, dies, turns blue, or drops dead. It's bad for the business. Because you're limiting what you can do to get a rise out of people and get a sympathy on somebody that's been injured. When you've proven to them time after time that none of this shit can possibly hurt you, even when much of it does. What do you think, Brian? I thought it was a good match. I think if you want to talk about sports-based wrestling, Samoa Joe and Roddy Strong are two of the guys that exemplify that. Roddy Strong's not a big guy. And next to Samoa Joe, Joe looked massive. Yeah. Like twice the size of him. But he's an athlete and he works that style really well. Really good match. I'm not as bothered by the tap-out finish. Although I think you have a great point. Uh, the post-match. Post-match was good. It was serious. It was a great way to go off the air, leaving you intrigued for next time. I thought Punk's acting was a little better than Adam Cole's. Maybe this is well, why I'm so accepting of buddy film Adam Cole right now with MJF, because I like it better than the dramatic Adam Cole. I've seen too much of that recently. You're okay, Roddy. You're okay, Roddy. You'll be all right, pal. Yeah, that was too much for me. Uh, beyond that, Punk was really good on commentary. Besides that, a, a friend like that, I just got run over by a fucking locomotive. You'll be all right, pal. You're okay. Beyond that, though, Punk great right on commentary, and they've done a good job of building up the anticipation for Punk versus Joe, and you have to think it's going to be more than a one-time thing. That could be what this show needs, because right now, I think part of the problem, we don't know what the rating is, there's some real good talent on the show, there's only one star on the show. And that's not to take anything away from MJF, because I don't think he's going to be on the show every week. Jericho was on the show last week. He's not going to be on the show every week. Hopefully. It's all about CM Punk. But you need another star. Whether it's Samoa Joe, and it's obviously Samoa Joe's not at the level of star of CM Punk, but in terms of in-ring work and treating him like a credible star, you could do a lot with him. But they probably do need some more star power. Wednesday night needs the star power of CM Punk. And Saturday night needs more than just the star power of CM Punk. I agree with you there. And one more thing, we make the comment now. Wonder what is in that belt bag that Punk has carrying around? Because it seems to me odd that if it was the AEW world title belt that he never lost, that he would have pulled it out and showed it by now. What do you think? It's the spinner belt, the old WWE spinner belt that he I don't there's, there? maybe there's something going on or maybe now that i've said that that will plant a seed and there will be something going on maybe a snake maybe Jake just, gave him a bag with a snake in it well i don't know it, it it's not moving so i don't think it's alive but it seems odd that he wouldn't pull it right out right and say i well, never lost this 
Well, that's how Vince got in trouble by pulling it out and saying, I never lost this. Maybe it's his laundry. Maybe it's his laundry in the bag. Well, no, Vince, Vince got in trouble just because he pulled it out and hit it several times, not because he ever lost it. All righty, we get to the main event, and this is the one that they sold the program on, obviously, Samoa Joe and CM Punk for the Owen Hart Tournament semifinal. And somebody told me on Twitter that I was not crazy, that the initial bracket that I saw, I thought it looked like it would be Joe and Punk in the finals. And it's not, but somebody said that the original bracket they saw was, it was the same thing and somehow it was changed. And I don't know for whether that's true or not, but I would love clarification, just so I know if I have a brain tumor. But nevertheless, this was the main event. Joe comes out and then, like Mussolini! In the wilds of Canada. And, you know, they had to follow, basically, I know Scorpio Sky would, was right there, but they had to follow the match, FTR and Gin and Juice, and nobody could follow that match, but it was a completely different kind of match between Joe and Punk in that they, were, they had the people. The people wanted to see it. It was over. They were in no hurry. They didn't open up 100 miles an hour and have nowhere to go for 20 minutes. They did the stare down. They, they did the feeling out because it had the big fight feel. And the story they were telling earlier was Punk was evading Joe's chops, right? He'd always duck it or get out of the way or whatever. But then Joe did the deal where he walks off on the cross body and Punk crashed. And then Joe started landing the chops and Punk would sell them big. And then the jabs and Punk could fight from underneath because he's the smaller guy. Joe's the big bully. He's on top. He's a good heel. He taunts the fans. He has the facial expressions that we're having a wrestling match again. Imagine that, two on the same show. And then they took a break, but when they came back, Punk started fighting back. Both of them were tired and selling. Punk, his mouth was bleeding. I don't believe he bladed his tongue, so I don't think he's got Moxley's disease, but they were, they were landing some shots. And then Joe gets the sleeper, rear naked choke, whatever. Punk gets a belly to back. Boom. Then they go back and forth. And Punk with a series of knees in the corner and a clothesline, the elbow off the top and gets a two count. And then again, they go back and forth. Punk goes for the GTS and Joe drops, gets the cross face. Punk gets the ropes. Joe hits that quick power slam, gets a two count. And then because the precondition... With Punk earlier at the top of the show, the people are chanting, Owen Hart, Owen Hart, which is great to hear. And then finally, they have more back and forth. Joe went for the sleeper. Punk dropped out, reached his legs up, hooked Joe, rolled him up, one, two, three. And so Punk advances. And both of them were still selling the result and then recovering. And then they milked it and stared at each other. And then Joe comes out and offers his hand. And Punk looks at him and takes it, and they shake, and the people cheer. <laughs> and then Joe snatches him into the sleeper. And did you see, as soon as they went down, the bell started ringing to give it some sense of urgency. And the referee was in there, and Kevin Kelly sounds like Lance Russell. Oh, come on! And it, he snatched a sleeper out of a handshake, and it sounded and looked like a dirty goddamn deal. And Joe puts Punk out, and then rolls out and gets a chair, but before he can do damage, here comes FTR. And then the last day is Starks comes out to survey what's going on. And they had a good match, but this that's why I was saying this is... It to me, this is billed for an eventual bigger Punk and Joe match. Because now Punk and Starks is the final. Well, that's right now the way it's presented to baby faces. But will Joe cost Punk the win of the cup out of heat over this without Starks knowing, so that Starks is still nominally a baby face? And then could Starks get mad at Joe and say, well, goddamn, I want to fight you, Samoa Joe. You you tarnished my win. And then Punk make it cost Joe a match with Ricky Starks. Starks gets a win over Joe. 
but it's because of there's things you can do out of all of this to eventually want Punk and Joe to collide again on a in a bigger match on a bigger stage. We'll see what happens. Let's talk about um. And by the way, great match, great commentary, great match. I'm happy that we're going to hopefully see more from these two. Ricky Starks, though. So he comes out there at the end. You're not really mentioning him. And, you know, we're talking more about the future of Punk versus Joe. What do you do with Starks? He's now one of the baby faces on that show. If Powerhouse Hobbs turns, he's a baby face. I don't know what Scorpio Sky is officially. I guess maybe a heel. But Ricky Starks versus Punk, who would you have go over? to win the tournament and secondly any consideration you think should be put into a ricky stark's heel turn <sighs> have they ridden the wave of him as a baby face especially if he's not going to be a top baby face as far Poss as they can possibly because they keep they keep ruining their own waves in a one-on-one -on -one match fairly and squarely punk has to beat starks in a one-on-one -on -one match, if Starks was to turn heel and fuck Punk, I think it's early or misplaced for that. In a one-on-one -on -one match, if Joe causes Punk to lose to Starks, whether Starks knows about it and turns heel or doesn't know and remains a babyface, that works for me. Um, That's the thing. I think... If Punk wins this, there could be some backlash from some segments that have already been preconditioned. Well, I, well, now he has to come in and win the Owen Cup, and Owen wouldn't have liked him. Well, he would have, but Owen wouldn't have liked him. Whatever. And Punk doesn't need the Owen Cup. But Punk could certainly get a good program out of the guy that fucks him out of it. But right now, Starks is, I know you want to elevate Starks, but I don't think he's ready there unless it's a TV match thing, but Punk would have to win. Punk would have to win, and it couldn't be a long program. So I'm pretty sure with the heads involved in this Saturday night program, there's something that's probably going to make sense, but that we're not thinking about, or is going to be in some element of the parameters I just talked about that's going to happen rather than Punk just winning the thing and car being carried out of the ring on somebody's shoulders, possibly. In terms of what he's been saying in the promos or anything, now we saw him injure Roderick Strong, even though Roddy's more part of the Adam Cole, MJF canon. And now this with CM Punk seemingly leading to bigger things. What is Samoa Joe's motivation? Well, again... If everybody had that has gotten to this point had had proper build from the start, Joe always works best when he's presented as just the Samoan submission machine and the fucking badass that doesn't put up with bullshit and bullies people and uses his size. And he could be a dominant heel on a champion of some description and on any program. So... Hopefully, he's going to stay in the top singles mix on Collision. I don't care what he does on Wednesday nights. And, uh, you know, again, with Punk as firmly a, a, the top babyface and Joe definitely at or near the top of the heel list on this program, that's why I say their, their paths are going to collide, no pun intended, again. And Joe's motivation is just he's got to want to win and to beat as many people as he can beat. And it would help if there was a good babyface secondary champion in this company, but there there's MJF is the champion and everybody else in the company has a fucking belt. And I know Joe's got the ring of honor TV title. Ring of honor doesn't have television. So that tends to compromise that somewhat. I would, I would, if I were operating this fucking vehicle, I would have Joe as the secondary, not secondary, I hate to term it that way, but the United States champion or the intercontinental champion on this program exclusively. That's what I'd do if I were me, because we still got to get back to punk and MJF, but that's going to take a while.
Yeah, and the other problem, like you said, is everyone has a belt. Even people who aren't even wrestlers here show up with other yeah. belts. So that diminishes everything, but... It happened on this show with uh, Willow Nightingale and Athena. Oh, I forgot about that. I was petting Harley's belly. They're talking about Willow losing... I get Was it the IWGP women's title? She just lost that in Japan to Julia. So they're talking about this other title loss, which I don't know if it had been referenced before on the show. And then Athena walks in with another belt because she's not the AEW women's champion. Was she Ring of Honor women's champion? Again, there's just too many champions on these shows. But overall, excellent program. We have no ratings. It's the weekend, but we will update that, I guess, on the drive through this week. Let's go to the main event, the men's division, Owen Hart final, that was surprised us when it came down this way. Ricky Starks and Lack Mussolini in Calgary. CM Punk in Calgary Stampede Territory. And boy, howdy. You know, I, I said, okay, I said the Stampede Territory was where they liked men, not as pussyish as Ontario, right? Maybe, maybe that'll be all CM Punk. But no, even there, the Buckaroos have infiltrated. So again, CM Punk was simultaneously the most over babyface and most over heel in the goddamn company. And now, as I believe I predicted, we predicted, it didn't take Nostra Dumbass to predict it, the booers are trying to drown out the cheerers, and the cheerers are trying to drown out the booers, and now it's just a goddamn duel. And Punk is sitting there clearly loving the level of both reactions and fucking milking it for all it's worth. But have you ever seen anything like this? Half the crowd would like to fucking shank him, and the other half would like to carry him out of the building on their shoulders. I love it. I love that energy. And it, not that this match wasn't good, but it covers up for things in matches when the crowd is that into the personality. Yes. When, when, when the people or person is this over, it's like cholesterol medicine. It covers up a lot of sins. You can eat more donuts. Anyway. As soon as the bell rang, they got dueling chants on arm ringers and a big chant on a headlock. <laughs> and they went, and again, this is the wrestling show. And finally, they went back and forth with headlock takeovers, and then Starks scored with a shoulder tackle and got a big pop out of it. Imagine that. Nobody was stabbed in the head with a screwdriver, but the people are still enjoying it. How in the world can this happen? And then they had a break spot where Punk, you know, they reversed hip tosses and Punk hip tossed Starks over the top rope with the momentum and then held the ropes for him, for him to get back in. And then when they came back from the break, Starks was in control, but he threw Punk to the floor and Starks hold the ropes for, or held the ropes for Punk, and Punk walked around to the other side. A little subtle shit, because he's, he's enjoying... Here's the thing. If somebody didn't know what they were doing, as soon as they got a bunch of the audience booing them, they would start healing. They'd be pulling the hair and kicking in the nuts or pulling out a fucking foreign object. But that wouldn't make any sense because that's not who Punk is. So he's doing little subtle things that control whether people, it magnifies the cheers or the boos, but he's not doing anything out of character. He's not suddenly becoming someone he's not presented as just because one crowd is reacting in a certain way. And it's, it's difficult to do that on the fly. And he got heat from the crowd with doing Brett moves. The fucking forearm drop off the turnbuckle and etc. This is where I wrote Ian is trying too hard. I think by the end of the show, he was just beside himself. And anyway, then they started getting some two counts. You know, Starks missed the elbow. Punk hit a clothesline. 
They did a double cross body and both went down. When they had the slug fest in the middle, Starks won the exchange. That's a little subtle thing. And then Punk hit a pile driver and got a two count. Wasn't that on the completely banned list? I guess someone approved a lot of things this week. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking maybe he said nobody tells Phil Brooks how to fucking wrestle. Maybe. Maybe. We will find out. Anyway, so Punk calls for the go to sleep, but Ricky Starks hits the spear and Punk goes to the floor and Starks goes out and has to roll him in. And he goes for another spear, but Punk hooks the front face lock on him on a roll through. Starks gets the ropes. And then Punk Hurricane Ronas him off the ropes and they go back and forth with roll ups. And suddenly, Starks rolls him up and reaches up and grabs the middle rope. One, two, three. And beats CM Punk. And uh, that was fucking perfect. And I know everybody's going to say, what the fuck? You had all but called for the. Victory party, Punk had to win this thing in a match with Starks, and I would have said that, and I did say that. Because Starks is a babyface. I could not see Punk doing a job for Ricky Starks as a babyface unless, as we mentioned, Samoa Joe got involved or there was something else that happened. But Starks cheated. Just holding the rope, that's all it needed. Because in a battle of the baby faces, the baby face that won had to cheat. And that saves Punk, but it gives Starks the biggest win he's ever had. Your thoughts? I thought it was very interesting having Ricky Starks leave there as a heel. Because not only did he cheat, I don't know if you saw any of the, uh, I don't know if I'm going to call it an overrun, the beginning of Battle of the Belts. I did not. My DVR froze right at the fucking one, two, three, and uh, arm up. They go, we're going to go to battle the belts. And they do this big intro. And I'm like, oh, shit, did they tape this somewhere else? And then they just go right back to Ian and Nigel sitting there. But you see Punk in the ring and Stark's leaving. And he grabs the trophy from Liger, Jushin Liger. Ah! On the stage, he grabs the trophy in a very disrespectful way and just walks off smiling. I mean, he's happy. He's not like an angry guy. Yeah. But he doesn't have time for Jushin Liger. He just held the ropes against CM Punk. We've been saying they got to do something with Ricky Starks because as over as he is and was, and he still is, it may he be never time. never does anything. It may be time to do something different with him. And you need guys on this roster, on this Saturday show, to do different things. And this is an interesting twist no one expected, maybe. And uh, we'll see what happens. In the first segment, they had Tony Schiavone, who is... The interviewer now, I guess, uh, the live interviewer, but they took your advice from some time back. I'm starting to regret that advice. He's starting to slip. Well, well, but at the same time, at least it's it's better than hearing more of him. They B-rolled the win that uh, Starks had over Punk last week, and he disrespected Jushin Liger. And I wrote, it's almost like they're trying to explain what's going on, and it makes sense. It's amazing. So Tony asked Starks about all the controversy, but meanwhile, the fans are chanting, you deserve it, because they know that Starks cheated, but still they wanted to see Starks get ahead, and they're, they're going to be starting to pick up on that he's switching heel, because he agreed with him, yeah, I do deserve it. And he had a Louis Vuitton satchel there, and he, what's in my bag? Nothing. I just bought a new, a new a new Louis Vuitton bag. A Louis Vuitton? A new, it's a new Vuitton. It's a, a new. <laughs> it's an offshoot brand. He got it in, at boxofawesome.com. No, he did not. They have real brands there. Not Louis Vuitton or new Vuitton. Well, Louis well, like, Vuitton's a real brand, but they don't have hey, that at Box you, of Awesome. You know what? When I was in TNA, uh, the only time that I've... What's that goddamn bag The uh, that all of the rich people have and used to have in the wrestling business? years ago with the initials all over it the three know. initials the goddamn um fancy luggage with three initials oh goddamn you know it's got, this, this is a great story it's got it's got the initials all <laughs> over it i've forgotten the name of them now but jeremy borash <laughs> got me one of those they regularly are like fifteen hundred dollars or whatever but he knew somebody that had black market 
shit of this brand that w- the somebody that worked at the factory went in at night and made their own shit out of the real materials and then sold them under the table. So I got one of these fifteen hundred dollar bags for like a hundred dollars. What kind of bag is it? It's one of those bags with the initials all over it. Whose initials? I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the name. I thought you'd know having all this fancy shit in your own home. <laughs> and he plugged his Prada shoes, too. <laughs> I know. I've, I've heard about the Prada shoes. They named it after the goddamn uh, the, the newspaper, the house organ of the Communist Party, Prada. No, no, that's Pravda, not Prada. All right. Well, he plugged his Nui Vuitton bag in his Pravda shoes. And then he said anybody else would have done the same thing he did when by any means necessary. And he started talking about how sexy he was and the fans are still cheering it, but he's, he's got some oomph as a heel and you can see they're going to go with this a little bit. And he doesn't want to be a pillar and blah, blah, blah. And as he was talking, here came punk with no music and his name had just not been mentioned five seconds beforehand. He's just tired of this goddamn prick that, cheated to beat him last week running his dick liquor and he's coming out to goddamn complain about it they got Imagine along that they got along remember the first main event of collision was that eight-man tag match with ftr punk and ricky starks yes and then suddenly he gets shanked in the ribs and again punk comes out and it's newark so you got the pros and the cons a lot of cons in newark and the, he gets a reaction. It's the biggest positive and biggest negative reaction at the same time. And they're trying to outdo themselves. And Punk's playing with it. He said, I'm not mad except at myself. I'm, you know, I'm proud of you. I've cheated too. So have the people of New Jersey and they boo him. And then he knocked the New Jersey devils not getting out of the first round. And he, but he finally says, because he's just being him, he's not necessarily being a baby face or a heel. He's CM Punk truth teller. I can live with the loss. Can you live with the win knowing that you can't beat me without cheating? And then Punk turns around to leave and he's walking out. And Stark says, my bag is as empty as yours. And that gets him to turn back around. He comes back and gets back in the ring. And now they're chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. Because he's been, and see, we're going somewhere, obviously with the bag that Punk was carrying that allegedly contained the belt. And now they're talking about he's the champ. He never lost the title. So Punk turns back and gets in Starks' face and say, you want a, a shot at what's in, what's in the bag, Ricky? Or are you like Max and you just don't want me to have it? I'm the real world champion. And he's starting to get into that. Should he have had the bag with him if they're going to reference it? He's brought it to the ring before. He's had well, it with, but, with him but, in promos before. Well, and I think he should when he comes on purpose on his time and it's scheduled. But when he just had all he could stand and he doesn't, you know, he just came out to tell somebody off. I don't think he needs it because that's. That's when it starts getting hokey that people who, you know, well, I know so-and-so's back there eating his third piece of cake at catering, and he comes out five seconds later carrying the belt. Is it glued to his hand? You know, anyway. Um, Depends on what's in catering. True. But now they, they got good catering now these days over in the WWF. We know that much. We're not talking WWF. Well, I know, but I'm just saying it, de- it just depends. Cage and Dino come out, and they interrupt and say, this is taking too long. We're required to be here, but we don't want to have to sit through all this. And then Cage, who is holding the TNT belt that Dino Douche won, asks, what kind of guy carries a title that he didn't win? And then as that's happening, and Cage is being a good heel, here comes Darby. And he snatches Christian's microphone on the way to the ring and gets in the ring and talks to Starks, too. And calls Punk his good friend and puts his arm around him. So <laughs> this is it watching watching the the talent that knows what the fuck is going on and are kind of with it, playing with the crowd reactions that the buckaroos and their fans have have foisted off on them, does my heart good. You know, beyond the split reaction to Punk, 
show wide so far on collision it's pretty defined who the baby faces and who the heels are yes which makes punk the special one and puts more attention on the reaction that he gets so they've they've helped they've handed him something to help him out they didn't mean to but nevertheless darby it says he's going to become the new tnt champion at all out and he starts he cut a good promo darby is coming out of his little his shell his cocoon his coffin whatever he was fucking wrapped up in for all that time when he's in front of people and he's got something to work with and he suggested a tag team match and got the fans to want the match and everything that has been said here amongst all these people fit and made sense and it wasn't just like we've we've got a match let's send some guys to talk until we make it 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 made sense for it to be that way right so then tony khan of course had made it official by the time they stopped speaking but uh through tony shivani he had sent word but the the basically the main event doesn't have to be advertised every week if it's good and if it's set up logically it's also less expected that way and you never it's less expected than the way wwe usually does it and you can you know you can tell you gotta watch the show to see everything that's going to happen you don't know everything ahead of time and they're trying to put enough interest in the actual matches where you want to see the fucking thing rather than Okay, when's it going to end so another promo can start? I don't know what you think of this whole deal. I thought it was an okay open. Again, they didn't bill CM Punk as wrestling. Uh, you know, even like FTR, they were, you know, I think in the announcements beforehand, it was just, we'll hear from FTR. And from AEW history, you're taught that that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be there. It could just be a video. Remember, we'll hear from CM Punk on Rampage. And it would just be like a 30-second <laughs> video of him talking about a match on there i think they can cure that if they would put the word live in we'll hear live from ftr yeah i think so but you know on the other hand we thought punk would be there it's collision they're back in the states there was no punk match build so yeah the people booed punk some of them did some a lot of them cheered him too but in, at the end of the day everyone was happy you're actually gonna get a match with him and to the point earlier they didn't build this big match but if you were watching or you were there live, you reacted to the idea that all of a sudden you got it. And that's there needs to be a mixture on wrestling television. It's not like a pay-per-view or a big event where you're trying to sell tickets to a house show or even a big premium live event where you just want people to watch it because it's for this is this is an infomercial that you make interesting. And now Obviously, in the modern day, you're getting paid for television, but you still can't make every week the great, you know, Nick Goulas's greatest, greatest card I've ever signed. He said that every week for 40 years. So anyway, now it's time for our main event of the evening. Ricky Starks and Christian Cage with Dino Douche in the corner against Darby Allen and CM Punk. And... If there was any doubt about who the big star is, the first three of them, talented though they are, they enter, and then suddenly, like Mussolini, who's going to help Darby? <laughs> He's coming down to help his pal Darby Allen. You know, you know Darby Allen's music ought to be that old folk song, Barbara Allen, but changed to Darby Allen. And Punk helped his pal Darby Allen. Not too, many so wrestlers, punk, not too many wrestlers have come to the ring to folk music. We'll see. It's, it's a trend that could be growing. With Darby Allen? Of all the people to be the spokesman for the folk movement in wrestling, it's Darby Allen? Well, with all of his goth and friends and all the other friends, they sit around and drink coffee and fucking bemoan their misery, don't they? Like Daniel Bryan, or Bryan Danielson, excuse me, seems more like the, you know, coming to the ring to Tom Dooley or something than Darby Allen. The Kingston Trio? That's right. Very good. There you go. Well, Punk was having extra fun with its clobbering time because he got the fucking, again, the big reaction. And there's a CM Punk chant, and there's trying to people trying to boo over it. 
They rang the bell with 27 minutes left in the show, so they were settling in for to build a again another great main event with four top names in the company. And everybody is clearly defined here. Everybody is being true to their own selves. I'm not going to say their characters. I'm going to say themselves. Christian Cage and Starks argue about who's going to start. Neither one of them wants to. Wants the other one to. Against Punk. And finally Starks gets in and takes one bump and runs over and takes Christian. And then Punk jerks Christian in over the top rope. This is wrestling. We're having a fucking wrestling match. Imagine that. And Punk worked Christian over a little bit and tagged Darby. And then the baby faces, Punk and Darby, started tagging in and out. They've, and Christian is, what well, he's got to be, he's Edge's age. He's close to 50. He's been injured. He's not going to be out there doing all this bullshit. But he's one of the best workers on a fucking card. And he cuts a hell of a promo and he's a heel and he knows what to do. So the baby faces are getting a, hell of a reaction from these people while they're, they've got Christian in an arm ringer and punk will tag Darby and the people will cheer and Darby will crank the arm and then tag punk and the people boo because they, they're booing that he tagged punk, but then punk will grab the arm and wind it up and then tag Darby and they'll cheer. And meanwhile, there Christian is standing there getting his arm twisted. This is wrestling folks. And then Christian and Darby do some fucking wrestling. And then Christian goes to tag and Starks doesn't want to. But then when Christian takes over, Starks tags in right away. I, I wrote professionals are calling this. And then Punk does a dive. Because the only dives we've had in this two hours was the goddamn fiery young baby faces that are full of piss and vinegar and do that kind of thing. Punk dives on both of them and then holds them for Darby to climb up and do a coffin drop. And there's their break spot. And the crowd's up. And then they come back and Punk is selling. And Christian's got heat going on him. And then Starks gets in. And they do the dueling chants. Let's go Ricky, CM Punk. Let's go Ricky, CM Punk. And Punk's selling and then hits a neck breaker. And he gets the hot, well, he gets a tag to Darby. Nobody tried to stop him. So it wasn't really a hot tag, but the people still popped. Darby makes comeback, dives on Starks, dives on Dino and bounces off. The dinosaur never moves. That's the way to use the fucking lizard. The big, impressive looking mute force standing outside on the floor that can occasionally make an entrance or uh, make a difference, rather. And then they get some heat on Darby. They go through another break. And they come back, and that's Darby's spot. He's selling and fighting from the bottom. And that's where he excels. And then Christian misses a splash off the top so that Darby's going to try to tag Punk, but Starks pulls Punk to the floor, and Punk chases him, so he's not in the corner when Darby gets there to make the tag. But finally, Darby fights out against both of them and hits an actual hot tag. And big pop and big comeback. And after Punk gives him a couple of bumps, he does a Bam Bam Bigelow cartwheel and a salute to the camera. And ag again, they're pro and con. They're fucking, they're screaming. Back and forth, Punk elbow off top rope. Crowd is ballistic. Starks gets back in, goes back and forth with Punk. Darby gets back in, and somehow Starks hits his finish, gets a two count. Then Darby somehow, while they were up on the top rope, hit a reverse DDT off the top rope. That was a little bit of tight rope act for me, but I know the kids like it. And then Punk goes for a, uh, the GTS on Christian. Christian shit cans him to the floor, but goes out after him and Punk hits it on the floor and in the ring, Darby's going to the top, but Dino crotches him behind the referee's back. Starks goes for his finish. Darby jackknifes him, but Starks rolls through and grabs the ropes again. One, two, three. Two weeks in a row, Starks wins by cheating. Perfect finish. Loved the tag match. Wasn't as good as last week, but certainly not as bad as 
pretty much every match on Wednesday night. Your thoughts, Brian? Yeah, good match. Really good main event match for the show. Fans were into it. And most importantly, it sets up more stuff with Ricky Starks and Punk. And also it aligns Starks for this match with the clear heels. Everything makes sense. And that's, again, that's the thing about this show on Saturday night. You don't have to dread, oh God, what am I going to have to skip through? What am I going to have to put up with? How am I going to figure out what's going on? It's a wrestling show. It makes sense from start to finish. Nobody's doing stupid, silly, obviously fake shit, forced comedy. Not everybody is allowed to be on the floor. Not everybody's allowed to fucking dive off the roof. Nobody is burying the referees needlessly. And they're they're trying to impart a, a significant amount of time to main event matches that the people are going to want to watch for ratings, but still give some of the program over to matches that nobody's going to watch just because they're a dream match, but because the talent that they want to feature in the future needs matches to get over people first. Because that's the key to fucking wrestling that Tony Khan's been watching it for 30 years and has never figured out yet. You can't make dream matches until the talent is over and you don't get your talent over until they beat a bunch of people that the fans see them doing. If you... Like Tony signs these names that he knows and thinks are great and they're just swell and assumes that the rest of the goddamn entire audience across the length and breadth of this great United States of America knows every time that fucking Hanumashimu Wadamadfafi has goddamn won the Grand Prix title. And so... <laughs> People come into the company, and they've been doing this since the start, and we've been talking about it since the start. People come into company, and immediately they're put in main events when nobody knows who the fuck they are except the most hardcore faithful. And usually they get beat their first several times you see them. So the people that had never seen them before don't give a shit about them, don't take them seriously. And then after they've been around for a couple of years, they start getting matches against jobbers to win. They're not making that mistake on the program on Saturday night. So they're allowing some matches to go on just to get guys good, solid wins, others to attract the viewers, and keeping a standard of logic of, we're not going to all use furniture, we're not going to all fucking fight on the floor, we're not going to all bury the referee, and we're not going to all be a bunch of fucking gymnasts. So you can watch this program, and it doesn't get old nearly as quickly as every one of the others. That's my opinion. And that was AEW Collision, and we'll see what happens next week. Big tanky match. A lot to look forward to. And then finally, 50 minutes into the show, Tony Schiavone was in the ring like Mussolini! About goddamn time! Here came Punk to the ring, carrying his bag in his hand. And he got the Punk chance. Connecticut likes stars. California likes kids. But there were booers also. He played with some of them. Uh, he stopped Tony from uh, asking his questions so that they could hear the, the boos settle in. And, uh, it, you know, he made a remark, and I realized he was the first goddamn human being on their television to mention Wembley Stadium, wasn't he? We've been following this on the Internet. I hadn't realized that, and until he said it, I'd never realized that no one had brought it up because we've been talking about it, but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? And it's been on the internet, and it's been reported on Twitter and on all the wrestling sites, and we've talked about it because they've talked about it, but they've never actually, have they even had the announcers on the show say, hey, by the way, we're running a show and we've sold 70,000 tickets. Isn't this Vince's biggest dream to sell all these tickets without announcing any matches? Yes. And it, it'll never happen again, probably, in, in history ever going forward for any wrestling promotion. That, that you would sell this many tickets for a show this far out 
they don't even know what they're going to fucking see yet. Yeah, no, mean, no wrestler could say they're a drawing card here. Unless they do WrestleMania uh, and do it in, in such a building where they can sell more tickets. I don't, you know, I don't see that's ever going to fucking happen again, but nevertheless. Wembley Stadium, two nights. That's how it'll happen. Oh, uh, there you go. And then, ah, Jesus Christ. And then it'll be five hours a night. All right. Well, speaking of which, let's get back over here to Mussolini. In the afternoon, but yeah, go ahead. Well, that's better, at least. Um, so he mentioned Wembley and then started talking about Ricky Starks and how he's cheating. Cheating. He's how he's cheated or beaten one or the other. Beaten Punk twice by cheating. Cheating. And... Punk said, sometimes you got to wake up and do what you don't want to do because you're the responsible adult in the room. And so he's brought the bag out. And what's in the bag? I'm not no more Mr. Nice Guy. Pulls out the AEW belt and declares himself, and we knew this was coming, and it's obviously the natural thing to do. He declares himself the real AEW world champion. I beat John Moxley for this, and nobody has pinned me or submitted me since then. I'm, I'm the real champion. This is mine. And he sprayed the black X on the belt as the symbol that he's straight edge, and that means he's better than you. I wonder who else says stuff like that. So that's minor you know, threat. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm just saying that's obviously what they're leading to because that's what everybody wants to see eventually, but it's subtle and it'll take a while. But he's the real world champion. What were you going to say? Uh, nothing. Did you notice that he put the X over the E, <laughs> which is elite, so it's now all X wrestling. <laughs> anyway, here comes Ricky Starks, who, and it was cute. He came out. On his own, but then he stopped and called for his entrance music so he'd get his full entrance, like a heel would do. Or maybe even a coggy baby face. And then Starks comes to the ring and says that Punk would have done the same thing that he did. He would have cheated. He would have won the thing by any means necessary, whatever. And he thinks, Starks does, that the belt ought to be his because he beat Punk twice, so he's the real world champion. And they argued back and forth and agreed finally they're going to settle this thing. And Punk said, "I we, we got to have a special referee to make sure I don't get jobbed again, you know, by the referee missing some shit if I'm going to defend the title against you. And Stark says, okay. And then they shake hands on it. And next week in Greenville, South Carolina, the special guest referee is going to be Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. I'm waiting for you to cheer. Yay. I'm supposed to Clap. cheer? All right, dragon. No Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> My Bonnie lies over the ocean. Um, <laughs> My Bonnie also, lies over the sea. I can keep going. <laughs> my my body lies over the lawyer. Bring back half my money to me. So it's Greenville, South Carolina. Steamboat's going to be over like crazy, and he's in shape, and he'll do, move around and do a good job, and I'm pretty sure Punk is going to retain this thing. And uh, so at least we got, a, we got a little special attraction there next week, and that was the promo segment that you mentioned or that you asked me if I liked, and I said, yeah, there was one, and that was it. I thought it was great. You wait for stuff like this. You wait for that kind of energy. Punk gets this weird energy now in every room he's in. Sometimes there are more punk fans. Sometimes there are more punk booers. It's always energetic. He excels in this kind of environment for a promo better than most people, and it feels more real, more like genuine anger or <laughs> frustration coming from someone. Uh, the belt thing, we'll see how it plays out. If it leads to an eventual merger of the world championship, which you think you would think that's where they were going. It makes sense. If not, it's the new FTW championship. So we have to be careful there. I don't think he's going to bring out the new FD, FTW or FDW, FDW or FDR. Yes. Uh, I don't think he's going to bring that one out. He wouldn't bring it out unless it was going to be central to the ongoing situation. 
beyond all that, I thought the story was Ricky Starks did great as a heel, even though, you know, it's a mixed audience. I thought he was more heel than anything else. Going back and forth with Punk, it worked. And he worked standing there with him. And that's one of those things you look for. How do they, how do they, how does it look and how does it feel when they're standing there doing a promo back and forth? And I thought it was great. Yeah. So we got that. But it's time for our main event because that's the thing. They'll get collision. It's a wrestling flavored program. They'll get you at the start with something pretty good. They will sprinkle a few things in in the middle, and you know they're going to produce by the time the show is over with with the main event. And it was nice to see Jim Ross back on television. He's had problems. Apparently, now we find out the fall where he bashed his face in was due to severe sciatica where his legs gave way because I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what was going on you remember two years ago, Brian, when I couldn't walk for two weeks from bending over? Yeah. That was an, a flare-up of an injury that I had from my sciatic nerve. And I don't know if I would have even, even though it was very painful and awkward, I don't know if that would even be severe sciatica if a doctor diagnosed it. So severe, he's been miserable, I guarantee you. So he's had a bad back, in, a possible infection on his radiation wound from his skin cancer and fell and gave himself a concussion. So he's been off for a few weeks, but that's what he, they should do. Bring him back and put him with a professional announced team that doesn't involve sock face, sucking all the oxygen out of the room and let him do the main event. And that I thought was very well done. And Riggy Steamboat, the special referee, on the floor, as we found out. Uh, his hair is gray, but he still looks great for his... What, Ricky is 70 now, or gotta be, right? Has to be. So, he looks good. But as we mentioned, or as I just mentioned, he's the referee on the floor, and they had a regular referee in the ring. And I don't know that the regular referee in the ring did anything that Ricky couldn't have done, to be honest with you. But uh, but it was a long match. So, but I'd probably find out Steamboat's got better cardio than everybody involved. Anyway, here comes Starks and gets lots of cheers and, you know, accolades. And then, like a Mussolini in South Carolina, here comes Punk. And he, again, has a ball milking the various reactions. And he he actually he can he can play with them because at one point in this match a couple of subtle things he was doing was making Starks the baby face and getting the people to boo him even more than the ones that were. But by the end of the thing, Starks ends up being the heel and they're cheering punk for helping Steamboat. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. JR made the point that I think they, they need to start making on all the programs, not just Saturday night, that Punk is the real world champion because nobody has beaten him. And on Wednesday night, since MJF is so popular now and the Buckaroo fans are more inclined to watch that program, that'll just get him more heat with those people. Yeah, they did the big dueling chance, and that's this match. Their main events on Collision have an atmosphere. People want to see it. They want, they're not just wanting to see, we want tables, you know, we want filing cabinets, we want a credenza. They want someone in the match to do something positive, right? There's a difference in just watching a fucking display and being in support of somebody. So I don't think we need to go uh, play by play through the match because it was a long one, too. They put in time on these main events, which helps that the other matches on the program are not inordinately burdensomely long. But it made sense. They wrestled. And the way that the match was constructed, uh, they wrestled at first, then the tempers flared, and they traded slaps with each other. 
And but even like when when Starks would do the steamboat arm drags and Punk would take them and then he slid out afterwards. That was a subtlety to get the people behind Starks. Punk slid out. It's just little things. And you know they went back and forth through a couple of different breaks, and they had a heck of a match. Except at one point, it was it. It Starks usually gets a little excited in some of these big match situations, isn't it? Has he done this before? The, has he done what before? Well, I mean, get a little excited and and blank out, lose track. I don't remember get that happening. Too quick or whatever. There's, I think there's been a time or two, but nevertheless, boom, boom, boom. Punk goes up to the top rope and is there for a second. And is there, and there, Starks is down, right, selling. But he's up there, and then you see his lips move. He's telling Starks something, right? And then he says it again. And at that point, Starks gets up and starts coming in for a cross body off the top rope. Apparently, it was supposed to be Starks was going to stagger up, Punk was going to cross body him, Starks was going to roll through and hook the leg, one, two, whatever, false finish, right? But Punk's up there, and he said something. He said it again, and Sully Starks bolts to his feet, and Punk comes off with the cross body. And Starks was already close, and Punk didn't look like he was trying to get any height. He looked like he was just trying to come off and come down on him. But Starks took another little stutter step in and then raised his arms when he realized that Punk was going to go over the top of his head. So Punk went over the top of Starks' head, but Starks caught him with his right arm, and it took them fucking both down. And so Stark still rolled through, but when he rolled over, he came up knees first on Punk's fucking face, apparently, it looked like. Two count. So besides that, which was unfortunate, they really had all this shit going. And boom, boom, boom. I think at, at one point, did you see where... Ricky was doing the rope walk and Punk jerked him off the top rope across his shoulders into the GTS position, but Starks dropped behind. He should have put more, and I'm being this minute now because these guys are worth critiquing. It's not like it's just a complete fucking mess and there's no hope. He should have put more oomph in shoving Punk off into the post because Punk went and took a great post, but Starks just gave him a little shove and then ran to the opposite corner so he could get in position for the next charge, but Punk was selling the post, and he didn't need to be there that quick. So he should really put his follow-through a little bit better. Anyway, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it, it, they went back and forth. Everything worked. Everything looked good. And then finally, Starks hits an Alabama slam, gets a two-count. And as they're coming up, they bump the in-ring referee. And Starks top spreads Punk and puts his feet on the ropes, but Steamboat on the floor knocks the feet off the ropes. So Starks turns around like, what the fuck are you doing? And at that point, Punk schoolboys him, and Steamboat rolls in and counts one, two, three. And that was a great, that, the finish was fine because that's a special referee and you're making use of him. I still can't figure out why Ricky couldn't have been in the ring up until then. I think it would have flowed a little better. But maybe he's got some kind of insurance requirements or whatever for his his hospitalization or whatever he had. Maybe he's got a policy with fucking um, uh, yeah, Lloyds of London. What would you think of this match? I thought it was all right. Yeah, I really can't add too much to what you say. It got sloppy at a couple different points, but... I thought it was all right. As far as Steamboat, obviously they did the referee bump that got him involved in the ring. It was either they wanted to do that spot really, really badly, or there's a reason Steamboat wasn't going to work the whole match. I mean, he looks like he's in great shape. I think he may have had some, if not heart issues, he's had issues in the past with something. No, he, he was doing something with the WWE and had a some kind of either concussion or brain thing or whatever and that's why they you know he hasn't worked but 
What I'm saying is, I think he should have been under, even when they bumped the referee, if Ricky could have rolled in then to take over and Starks does the top spread with the feet, he could have done it from inside the ring. It, it took a second. It, I think the pop would have come a little louder and a little quicker if as soon as the schoolboy happened, if, if Ricky had been there instead of having to roll in. But anyway, the point is now we got to do some business. So as Steamboat hands Punk the belt and Punk holds his arm up and hugs him, Starks comes from behind and blisters Steamboat and Steamboat knocks Punk off the ring. That was a nice little bing bing. So that, and, and at the same time, Ricky didn't have to take a bump. He just went into Punk. Punk took the bump and Ricky crumpled. And then Starks got on Steamboat and the punches were weak, but I understand. I'm not taking off any points for that. But he got uh, Ricky's belt off and started whipping him with it. And that's what they wanted because Steamboat got to do the Ricky Steamboat selling with the body language cringing and the facials. He's not taking a bump, but he's doing the selling of the pain, which he was noted for. And that was brilliant. You see, it, it was like when Buster Keaton would be in a 1950s TV show and you'd get a chance to see a master at work from 30 years previously. And then Punk comes in with a chair and runs Starks off. And great deal because nothing settled. You know, Starks cheated, but Punk took advantage of a situation. Nobody's been beat flat. Uh, Starks was the heel when he left because he was beating up Ricky Steamboat in South Carolina. And then the people were chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. So that they can they can change course in mid in midstream. The punches looked like shit. Yes, but it's Steamboat and he had a brain hemorrhage or whatever. Hey, listen, he's so good at selling Starks had heat with me by the end of it. Yeah, but I, th I think actually he probably should have just not done punches. And so a couple of stomps would have been sufficient. The fact that they did this to Steamboat. I mean, Steamboat has to appear on TV again. This isn't a one off thing, you would think, right? Well, I don't know, to be honest, because. I mean, it it, it, it served a purpose in that. Punk gets a win back over Starks, but settles nothing, and it didn't diminish Starks. They were in the Carolinas. Steamboat works there for the live audience. I don't know if you want to bring him back and program him. You know, unless there's, a, I mean, another interview appearance or something else where, you know, Starks might get involved with him or whatever, but I don't think it's going to be an ongoing situation. I don't think it's called for again, but if they have an idea in mind, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I don't think it's going to go on long term. All right. Well, that was collision. Mm. Are you ready for the main event? Yeah. Well, Jim Ross joined again. So apparently that's going to be the, the recurring thing every week. And that's the perfect way to do it. Bring JR out and let him do the main event with the stars. You want people to pay attention to and notice, and you get his, his credibility and his name value there without sticking him out there for two hours where he's wore out and or bored to tears by the time the thing's over with. And then we did the house of black entrance and the FTR entrance. And then like Mussolini with barbecue. Because you know they're in North Carolina, right? That honey gold barbecue in North Carolina. And Punk is able to come out. That's trailed off. Well, I'm saying it's good. It's good stuff. Have you ever had the Carolina honey gold? You were doing it in tune. You were trying to carry a tune, and all of a sudden you just left it. Well, I was tired of carrying it. All right. Fuck, it, it needs to do its own work. I can't carry everybody. I'm already lugging you around. Hey. Punk is able to milk the cheers and the booze at the same time by doing the same thing, and it gets a completely opposite response from whoever the intended target is. I'm loving that. But for the six-man tag team title, otherwise known to the children as the Trios Championship, it was CMFTR against the, the former House of Black. Because now that they're not teleporting... 
and uh, committing all of the spookiness of the mind games where they used to stop the match down to sit down and talk to everybody or whatever. They're wrestling. They look like three big, hairy, greasy, tattooed up fucking guys that's in a wrestling team. I can buy that. I think calling them CMFTR is so stupid. I hate that they do that. Well, they got to do all of the combined. Why? Remember CM Punk and jungle? FTR is too long? Jungle Hook, you remember that? Yeah, every team yeah. does a stupid combination. In this sense, it makes no sense because it's just initials. CMFTR. It's so dumb. It's See so you dumb. next Tuesday. Yeah. We talked about him earlier in the podcast one segment. Yes, we did. Uh, I will say, though, that Brody King still looks like Kamala if his gimmick had been an African panda bear instead of an African savage. What the... Why? I don't... <laughs> he looks big and broad and tattooed up and everything, but then he's, he's the, the panda face. I'm not sure. <laughs> Odd choice of the decoration. But he, he's working like a big man now, and Dax and the other guys, they would have to outmaneuver him and double-team him to take over. And they the announcers were putting over his size and power. At least they're making something legitimate out of some of these guys. Instead of sock face screaming about how many times they've been to the Tokyo airport. Um, 17 times? 17! But anyway, they went the first segment. They did some nice wrestling, some spots. They put the big guy over. Then finally they milked Malachi Black and Punk having a face-off and doing a back and forth and going to a stalemate. And then both of them sat down in the middle of the ring and stared at each other for a second. But that Punk is known for this cross-legged pipe bomb, and I guess Malachi Black sits a lot. So that got a pop, and then all six squared off and got the big six way to go to the break. And when they came back now, that they had a half an hour when this match started, when the entrances commenced. And in the WWE, you're attuned to realize that that means, especially on Raw, if the main event entrances start a half an hour before the end of the program, chances are the main event will be 10 minutes. But in this case, they're starting to establish with Collision, and it's been working they either keep their audience or increase their audience, that the main event's going to be the long match that's good with the top guys in it that doesn't insult your intelligence. And, you know, everybody's trying to be serious. And that's what they did again here. They broke it up into like the final three segments. And they would get, like when they came back from the first break, they got heat on Dax. And then Dax gave the hot tag to Punk and he made a big comeback. And he had leveled Buddy. But when he went to the top rope, Julia came up on the apron almost too quickly. You don't need to be that fucking fast, Julia. You can wait because you're only going to hop up on the apron. He's got to climb to the top rope. So wait till his fucking right foot's on the second buckle before you feel like you need to hop up. And when she did that and drew the referee, Malachi crotched Punk on the top rope. And they started heat on him. We went to the break again with Punk in jeopardy. And when we came back then, that's when Punk is selling big for the House of Black. And again, a main event wrestling match with stars, with time on the air, serious, no furniture, no flips, no gymnastics, I'm trying to do business here. And out of nowhere, Punk hits the, the go to sleep on Buddy, but Buddy rolls to the floor so Punk can't capitalize. But he does hit the tag to cash, and that's where the heels really let him down. Because if Buddy rolled out to the floor, the other he, one of the other heels went down to help Buddy, and Malachi, I believe, was just standing there in the corner, and they watched Punk tag Cash. No heel ever tried to stop him. Without you trying to impede the babyface's forward progress in any visual way, the pop that babyface is going to get from the tag is only going to be so far, depending on how big the star is that gets tagged anyway. Cash made a big comeback and hit the Buzz Sawyer power slam again. And then, I swear, the only one dive, but Ca Cash hit a dive. I think there's another one coming up later, but Cash hit a dive. I think it's the first one we've seen in the program. But then he hit that bulldog off the top on Brody King for a two count, and that wasn't bad because it wasn't the Steiner shoulder bulldog thing. 
And then, boom, um, they did the superplex, double superplex on Brody King, and Punk came off the top with an elbow for a two count. That got a big pop. Then all three of them hit the shatter machine on the big guy, and then everybody in turn hit a big move on everybody else, and they all sold. And then this was perfect, because now they've done everything they can do. They've got them up as far as they can. Punk did the dive then on Malachi Black and bounced off of him, and he's come to rest at the barricade in front of the fans. Dax hit a dive in the headbutt on Brody King, got a two count. But right then, and the camera missed it the first time, or not the first time, the camera missed it at first when it happened live, but that may have been the plan because it was better because as Punk was leaning against the rail, Samoa Joe came from behind suddenly and grabbed him from the back in a rear naked choke and drew him over the barricade rail and choked him out. And they went to that shot as Joe was already on him, but then they went back to the ring because at that point Brody had lariated or hit with a lariat, Cash, and got the one, two, three, and then they go back to the shot of Joe leaving Punk laying there. And you got the point. The House of Black retained the, the belts. Joe screwed Punk over and his team over by doing that and is trying to force him to fight. And Cash got beat because the odds were suddenly against them with the removal of a member of their team so nobody looked bad and everything made sense so uh, again we had a nice it wasn't as great as gin and juice for an hour but we had a nice wrestling match with top talent for the main event of the program instead of hikaru shida against julia or whoever anna j don't put down anna j anna julia anna j genitalia they wish they had julia julia is actually good i thought um, you were gonna say they wish they had genitalia i will say that i thought this was another great main event i mean look no surprise ftr right now we're having a year i would actually argue look the briscoe matches were great but they were different i think they're actually having a better year this year in a lot of ways than they did last year they just look so good in the ring right yeah. now well and also because they're getting a chance to do it uh, this year on a program that has some level of production, whereas they were exiled last year to the Briscoes, with, to the Ring of Honor shows, and uh, a small building, small crowd, and blah production, whereas with Gin and Juice, you could see that looked every bit as good as anything the WWE does from a production standpoint, but the wrestling was better. And them and CM Punk together, you know, I'm kind of sick of these six-man matches, but with them at least, they give them enough time, and there's enough weird energy in the room, and they've had good opponents for these matches, that they work out well. This is the best House of Black trios match I've seen yet. I thought Buddy looked really good. Malachi Black looks really skinny to me. Tell me what you think. He's, next he's time lost some him. weight from the time he first came in, hasn't he? It stood out to me, and it's the first time I thought it, so I'm saying it to you after the first time I thought it after seeing it, but he seemed rather skinny to me. But it was the best match I've seen them in. Go somewhere with the Joe Punk thing. Joe's gotten a few squash match wins. Well, we're headed, we're headed to Wembley. You can see that coming a mile away. You can see Wembley coming a mile away or that match coming a mile away? <laughs> well, I've, if Wembley's coming at you from a mile away, then you better watch out because there was a big explosion. But you can see that match for Wembley. That's, you know, I think that's going to be done. A lot of the story for Collision came from what happened after Collision, and then I guess in the last couple of days, stories have come out about other things related to it. But as you said recently on the show, it's typical in AEW and WWE at the end of the show, the biggest stars in the room or the biggest people in the last match get on the mic and talk to the room a little bit. And thank everybody and tell them how much they mean to them and all that stuff and everything. This is a new phenomenon recent with modern wrestling. They used to do it in Ring of Honor. They want to be fan friendly, right? <laughs> in this case, Punk and FTR did an after match promo and... I would say FTR was friendly to everybody in North Carolina because they're from North Carolina. At least Dax is. I don't know about Cash originally. But Punk wasn't friendly to everybody because apparently somebody had a 
a hangman page sign and or was you know, uh, shouting out the praises of Hangman Page, and it caught Punk's eye and ear, and he responded. I don't know. Do we have audio, or do we have quotes? Uh, I could find some audio. Various people filmed that the uh, quality is uh, different everywhere. Let me get this pulled but, up. But, but basically, the while you're doing that, but the the gist of the thing was that he he understood now, the guy had the page sign or whatever, Hangman sign. He said, I understand now why... Hangman is called Hangman because that's what his action figures do in the toy store is hang on that peg unpurchased, which I thought was kind of hilarious because then somebody on Twitter this morning sent out a picture of a toy selection in one of the major retail stores. I think everybody can figure who I'm talking about. And... All the figures that are hanging there are all Hangman Adam Page. Everything else is gone. It's all Page. <laughs> what the fuck? Do you have uh, any exact verbiage there now? Well, Jim, every example of the audio here kind of sucks. I would need more time, but I have the quote here. I have the actual direct quote according to the What was said? What was said? Carolina is Hangman country, referencing a sign in the crowd. Earlier today, I went to a local supermarket and I figured out why they call him Hangman. It's because the pegs in the toy aisle are full of Hangman action figures because nobody wants to buy them. He's a peg warmer, unlike me, who moves merchandise, pops ratings, and sells toys. (laughs) A peg warmer. And again, all the people who like him go, yeah, you do, and all the people who don't like him go, boo, fuck you, and he likes both. But like you said, that we saw that picture this morning of some Target or Walmart or whatever it was, and just nonstop Adam Page figures. Everything not else is everywhere. Gone. Yeah, there's crumbs everywhere else, and his his aisle is completely stocked. Well, Jim, coming out of this story, it came out. It was reported by Dave Meltzer and others that Adam Page was turned away from the building. <laughs> that he showed up to shoot promos backstage and was told that he would have to do it elsewhere. And then came out that other names that have been either this past week or previously asked to leave Collision or not invited to Collision include Christopher Daniels, who I think is head of talent relations, Matt Hardy, and Ryan Nemeth, a name that surprised some people. All, of course, have whatever you want to say, friendships with the Young Bucks and may be considered by some people who were not friends with the Young Bucks to be stooges for the Young Bucks. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Super Kick Party? And I is I won't say we, names. We don't know about Ryan Nimeth. He, he never well, no, gets on television. Apparently what? he's been a regular in the Being the Elite videos. I okay, well, I was going to say we wouldn't know what the beef was with Ryan Nimeth because he's never on television. He's Dolph's younger brother. Oh, wait, actually, I have something um, right here. Uh, the issues may stem from when Punk did his return promo, Ryan Nemeth tweeted out, literally the softest man alive. Ah! Well, apparently now he's literally the most unemployed man alive, at least on Saturday nights, is Ryan oh, Nemeth. And here's more from Dave Meltzer. Punk confronted Nick Nemeth, or Nick Nemeth, Ryan Nemeth on June 17th in Chicago, his first night back. Something happened. I was told it was all settled. It wasn't a big deal. Obviously, it wasn't all settled. <laughs> th- what is, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You got tit for tat. Matt Hardy you was got- booked Saturday, told not to come. Uh, and Christopher Daniels is not supposed to go on Saturdays anymore. <laughs> Yeah, the head of talent relations is told to stay away on Saturdays. Well, it's because of the relations he has with some of the talent. That's why he has I his like job. Christopher Daniels. He was a great worker and a nice guy, but he busted in the locker room with the rest of them. And luckily, nobody fucking punched him in the face, but I can see where that uh, one would think, well, this guy's obviously not on my side since he came in with the group that started this whole mess. So here's the thing. What have we been hearing for months since last September? It's been almost a year now. Punk is not allowed to be around the buckaroos and their friends. Punk has been told by attorneys, don't try to contact Kenny anymore and settle these things. Punk has been told that he's persona non grata. 
in these various situations. So in return, he said, okay, well, I'm the guy over here on Saturday nights and you can't come and play in my sandbox if I can't come over and hang out in your backyard. So fuck you. You know, just put yourself in the position of CM Punk here. You have a bunch of people that have constantly fucked with you, either overtly or in a passive aggressive manner. They continue to fuck with you, continue to put you down. The company's not doing the biggest money thing they have on the table because of all this. Hangman Page can come to the building and be in the back. Matt Hardy? Can come, why? Because he's in the Carolinas? He can come to the building and be in the back? If you think someone's going to be a problem and you're trying to create a good atmosphere there where none of these drama hounds are around, why would you want any of these people in your building? Exactly. And why, if you've been told, well, you can't come over here and play with our friends, then why are you going to let their friends come over and play with you? The answer is because on Saturday night, they're not playing. They're trying to do a television wrestling broadcast instead of a friend's social club. The yeah. problem is, is that Saturday has gotten short shrift on the talent because the only, there are more aggressive parkour artists and cosplaying gymnastics experts on the roster than there are actually serious, accomplished, competent, professional wrestlers. So there's more names on Wednesday night, but the Saturday night television program is better because it's all people who actually understand what kind of fucking business they're in. Well, there's some reporting here before we wrap things up. Nick Houseman, who previously has been all over this punk stuff, previously was pointed out by Punk in that press conference famously, he's saying that Nemeth and Daniels being sent home was a direct result of conflicts with Punk. Notably, Christopher Daniels' involvement in the post-AEW all-out altercation was specifically portrayed to us as the reason the Fallen Angel is not at collision, since Ace Steel, Punk's good friend, was also involved in the altercation, but not allowed to return backstage for collision. Yeah, even though he was told ahead of time that when he got his job back, he was going to be involved with the show and that he was going to be Punk's agent on the scene, he's being paid and working remotely at last report that we heard because they're still all upset at him because he beat up two of them by himself. But if none of them are in the building, what's the problem? And again, to finish this sentence out There here, is no problem. Ace Steel has never been dangerous in any way to anybody in 30 years in wrestling until somebody was trying to beat up a friend of his, and then he fucking kicked some ass. Well, don't forget his wife was and, in the room, too. Well, yeah, and his, and his wife was sitting there with a fucking cast on her leg, and he beats up some people who can't fight to begin with, and they get mad, and because the various legal staff at that company are all under the sway or under something of the <laughs> talent, uh, they make up reasons why Ace is not able to be there because everybody's scared of him. Punk is said to feel the same about Daniels and does not want him backstage either. <laughs> well, there you go. Seriously, if you're trying to create a drama-free locker room, and so far, Collision has been. I mean, very few people have crossed over. MJF, obviously, is the world champion and that Adam Page thing or Adam Cole thing with him and uh, FTR was a big thing on the show. But you're not hearing too much drama. You're still hearing plenty come out of that other locker room. You're not hearing much come out of here. Why would you want to introduce these, dare I say, cancers into your locker room? You want Matt Hardy back there? This guy, he almost brags about being a stooge for the Young Bucks. Well, and all he was doing was delivering a truckload of flowers for the buckaroos from Big Mama's Flower Shop. Right down the road in Charlotte. And with this Ryan Nemeth thing, you know, at a certain point, there have to be repercussions. If you, you can't just go out there and run your mouth and talk shit because you're trying to buddy up to one side and then the other side comes in, you're like, ah, I don't mean it. I want to be in the back. No, go to the back on Wednesday. <laughs> and I, I would have to suggest to Ryan, you need to have a little more weight in your fucking ass before you can start knocking the biggest star in the company on Twitter just because of who you're friends with. Yeah, the softest man alive may not be CM Punk. It may be one of the two bucks who went in there thinking they were going to do something and got their shit kicked out of them. Those two may be the candidates for the softest men alive and their hangman fake cowboy friend. <clears throat> but what do you think in general? If you are a promoter, you are a booker. I mean, Tony Khan is out to lunch on all this because he's afraid to do anything to actually put his foot down about anything. Yeah. And that's what causes every single one of these situations. 
The key to all the drama is Tony Khan, because Tony either likes it or is just too scared to do anything about any of it. But if you are... I'm, I'm betting on B there. But what do you do? If you're in the back and you are trying to have a good locker room and forget about like AEW split in half. If you're just a promoter running a show and people just think they should be in the back, whether they're local wrestlers in the area <laughs> or people that cause trouble or someone who used to work for you, whatever it is, should you just let anyone in the back or should you have no. a tight group of people back there? No, hold on. Well, Fred, you're asking a million questions in a million different directions. No, for people coming to look to get booked or just to hang out with their friends, there's always been special cases. You know, if, if a huge star came to the building just because they happened to be in his hometown to see an old friend of his, and the guy's a legend in the business and blah, 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 nobody's going to kick him out. But if you've got a bunch of people just trying to hang around to get booked or talk to their friends or potentially get their face seen, you're doing business. You're doing a national TV show. That needs to be kept to a minimum. All these people, in one respect or another, work for that company. So in dealing but were they with booked? that... But was Matt Hardy were, booked? Well, it, maybe he was and maybe he wasn't, but it's right down the road from Cameron, North Carolina, so maybe he just thought he'd show up, but that's the problem. The problem is, is that if they can do it, if the Wednesday night crew can do it, say, well, we're going to put those people over on Saturday, and the, uh, we know that CM Punk's the biggest star in the company. He's making, hopefully, more money than everybody else, if Tony's got any sense, but we don't want him on our show. We don't want him around in our locker room because he might beat us up again. So it's entirely forgivable or expected for that guy to say the same thing. Well, I don't want your fucking stooges over here fucking my show up, bringing this drama, putting the fucking mouth on me, as Dennis Corluzo would say, running their dick lickers about whatever they want to take up for their friends. We don't have time for that shit because we're running a business over here on Saturday night. And if I was Tony Khan, and I've said this before, and I will say it again. I would get everybody together and I'd go, yep, I think the biggest money match that we can put on is CM Punk and FTR against Hangnail and the Buckaroos or Kenny and the Buckaroos or whoever in the Buckaroos. And that's what we're going to be doing at the pay-per-view at the end of the year or whatever. And here's how we're going to get there. And is everybody on board with that? Tell me now so that we can help you carry your shit to the car and you can figure out somebody to call to get booked in the future because you're fucking fired. I'm paying all of you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and you're going to do the shit you're supposed to do. And I don't care if you have another real fight. Have a goddamn real one, get it out of your system, because the fake one is going to be on my TV or on my pay-per-view and drawing me money. Otherwise, I don't care what you do. Kill each other. Doesn't matter as long as you show up for the match and you do the finish that I tell you to do. Then go out in the parking lot and take baseball bats to each other. I don't give a fuck there either, as long as you can show up next week for TV. It doesn't matter to me. You work for me, and you are going to draw me money, or you are going to leave. It's not hard. If, they, if he was anally fucking penetrating people, say they're flying them all over the country for $100 a night, maybe they should say, well, fuck you. But for that much money, for the talent that some of them possess and the fact that they never would have got anywhere if Tony wasn't green, inexperienced, and halfway clueless? No, for that much money, I'd be going out committing fucking contract hits for the mafia. So that's what I'd do. All right, well, that was AEW Collision. Well, Jim, we've had a long show, but before we get out of here, speaking of everything in AEW being a mess, let's go back to Collision. Stories have now emerged. Another situation. Apparently, Jack Perry and CM Punk <laughs> had some sort of disagreement over glass. Have you been keeping up with this story? I've seen I've seen a number of things reported on the internet and on Twitter, and I believe every bit of it because it sounds exactly like both individuals. Well, I guess the story is that Jack Perry in a backstage segment either a promo or just some sort of attack wanted to use real glass in a segment 
Well, I don't think he's Moondog Maine. He wasn't going to eat a light bulb in a promo. It had to be some <laughs> kind of... Sorry to be a cavalier with you there, my fine feathered friend. Uh, but it had to be some kind of attack or angle or something. And he and there was obviously a dis disagreement. Jungle Jack wanted to somehow use broken glass, real broken glass. And apparently, from the way I heard it, the agent of the match and or the medical staff and or other people said, we, we don't think you ought to do that. So it was brought to Punk to get his viewpoint, and he told the child, as you should do when you're trying to instruct and or discipline petulant children, he said to Jack Perry, we don't do that on Saturday nights, which indicates to me that at least one person in this company is trying to do what they're supposed to be doing, which is do a professional television program in the manner and kind and genre that it is supposed to be, professional wrestling, and do it well and do it professionally and do it somewhat safely and not have all this childish outlaw garbage involved. And apparently the petulant child that was being disciplined or in this case not disciplined but being instructed that this is not the kind of thing that we do on the real wrestling program that this company produces he got pissed off and was arguing about it i think at that point they should have said tell you what you can use all the broken glass you want you go out in the parking lot break you a bunch of bottles roll around in it we don't care but you're not doing it on the television program because you're not important. And we don't want this bullshit that you people do on Wednesday night fucking up our show. That's what I heard. Did, did I fill everybody in appropriately? Approximately, I believe. What does this say about just the overall problems? And we've always said they were going to be problems, but they usually were enough things on the other side of the pendulum to swing things a little bit the other way. There was a Cody Rhodes in the back, at least sometimes. But in terms of talent being given the ability to just do what they want in AEW. Well, it's going to continue probably on Wednesdays because that's where Tony Khan is fully in charge and he has no balls. And the rest of them have an indie mindset that they're never going to get out of. And that's, you know, why they're the state that they are. On Saturday, it appears that there are rules in place for what is and is not going to be done on a wrestling show. And that's refreshing and sorely needed. And again, you know, these, these fucking jack-offs these days, they think they're goddamn TV stars or they're entertainers or whatever. Okay, if you were a fucking Hollywood actor, Jack Perry, since your father was a Hollywood actor, when Luke Perry went and auditioned for a comedy. As part of the, the role, did he just go against the script and break into song, even if the comedy wasn't a musical? Or if he's auditioning for a part in a drama, does he start cracking jokes in the middle of the goddamn main dramatic scenes because he knows some funny jokes? Now answer. Well, again, I don't think that uh, you should use glass. I was going to ask you about instances with glass in wrestling. How careful do you have to be? Well, for one thing, most of these morons don't even know. They're trying to fucking slam each other through the windshields of cars and, and shit like that. And that, as Goldberg will tell you, that's a crapshoot every time. And you'll remember when Lawler got run over in the fucking parking lot by Eddie Gilbert. He had on long sleeves and he had on long pants. And he was able with his, even though it was a warm day outside, as some people remarked on, that's how he could cover up having some elbow pads on because you're not only taking a bump on concrete, but you're, you're risking, you know, some glass along the way. Goldberg trying to punch, uh, did punch through that fucking car window and, and severed an artery and almost bled to death. I mean, it, broken glass, the only time glass was ever used in wrestling was the old bottle deal. Break a bottle over a guy's head. Some guys 
wanted the real bottle broken over their fucking head. Do you remember Cactus Jack in... Were you at that thing with Eddie Gilbert, the two out of three matches, Joel Goodhart show in no. Philly, or was that before your time? That was before I was going to live events, uh, or at least independent events, but it was two out of three falls, but it was two out of three matches. It was three yeah. different stipulations. And they spread it out through the night, but at one point he had Eddie trying to break a real bottle over his head, and Eddie had to hit him three or four times. And I mean, everything else is exposed. I believe we've talked about it before, but it's not like they're smart enough to even know how to work with shit like this, but what you do is you bake the bottle a certain at a certain temperature for a certain time, depends on the bottle, you got to play with them, and then you take it out with the tongs and you dip it in some cold water and it's going to, it's going to crack, but it's not going to fucking shatter, it's going to stay in, and then you put it carefully in the goddamn holder, and then it requires a little sleight of hand and make sure it doesn't fall apart during the swing before the impact and you break the bottle over the guy's head and it's still going to cut him because it's still real fucking broken glass. But that real broken glass can be found by the fans and they can say, God damn, that's glass. Whereas the fucking sugar bottles they use in the movies won't stand up scrutiny. And if the fans don't see the bottle close before it's broken, then they don't know that it was cracked to begin with. And you close your eyes and hope for the best that a piece of glass doesn't get stuck in your fucking skull, but it's probably not going to sever a fucking artery like punching through a car window. And for people rolling around on real broken glass or taking bumps through window panes and all this bullshit, well, you're the same to me as the fucking bank-addicted drug robber or the plumber or any other of these garbage fucking geeks that bite the heads off live chickens and take bumps through broken glass. You're a fucking moron, and you deserve what you get. Like old Grover. And if you're using fake glass and you're rolling around in it and you're not ripped open from asshole to appetite, then you're telling the people... That's fake glass. So just don't use the fucking broken glass, you fucking morons. Anyway. All right. Well, that was the uh, CM Punk Jack Perry glass issue. And, that's, and again, that's exactly... They, there needs to be a man with balls and commitment and authority to explain to these fucking children what kind of show they're going to do and what they're not going to do and what's tolerated on this program and what's not and what the rules and the guidelines are. And this is the first time that that's been done in AEW and that's what's leading to Saturday night being a watchable television program that a wrestling fan might enjoy instead of a fucking LSD-inspired mess that only the fans that want to laugh at wrestling and think it's all a big fucking joke can sit through. And they're not happy about it. They can get mad or get glad as far as I'm concerned. They need to do it on everything they fucking do. And maybe then something would be accomplished. And that's my thought. Anyway... And they start the program off with a bang. Here comes Samoa Joe. He's entering the ring. He's the Ring of Honor World TV Champion. He's the king of television. He's facing the already-in-the-ring golden vampire in a gold lame mask and bodysuit covered head to toe. And as soon as Joe gets to the ring, the golden vampire dives out of the ring and jumps on him and beats him up and shoves the referee down and throws Joe in, hits him with a knee, picks him up, gives him the GTS, boom, pops the mask, and it's Mussolini in gold lame. It was CM Punk all along. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Samoa Joe. Because who would hunt after the golden elite, the golden vampire? That's right. And after he knocked him out and stood over him, he took the microphone. And as you'll recall, last week, Samoa Joe choked Punk out and said, fight me, bitch. Well, Punk said, I accept, bitch. And he left. Now that woke the people up watching television. 
It was a great deal with a big reaction. Didn't take long. A hot way to start. We've seen the fucking unexpected surprise with star of the program. What else can happen tonight? It's also good that they've established in the last few weeks that Samoa Joe's been wrestling squash matches. Yes, because now it made sense and, and other guys are doing it too. And the golden vampire didn't look any more ridiculous than some of these other job guys they found. So it didn't stand out like you knew that was coming. And though, of course, they got a pretty good idea after he picked him up for the GTS before he popped the mask, but nevertheless. But that starts out, okay, I'm good with it. It's an old wrestling angle, as old as the hills. A good way to start. Unexpected. Boy, we're off on the right track. All right, is it time for our main event? Now it's time for Collision. And Collision started... With Samoa Joe doing an in-ring promo, he's the king of television. I remind you, as he reminds us every week, as he should, to get something over. And the deal was that he can't interfere in the main event tonight or he's going to lose his match at All In with Punk at Wembley. So he's going to do color at ringside and not interfere in the match. And it's, again, he's got great delivery. And he gets it, how to present a fucking image and how to get shit over and verbally and make shit seem important. Imagine that. So he goes down and sits at ringside to do color with... I wasn't sure who was goddamn wrestling in this match for a minute because it's Sting and Darby and Hook and Punk but the entire heel roster came out for the match on the entrances. Their opponents ended up being Swerve and Brian Cage and Dino Douche and Jay White, but they had both Gun Boys and Christian and Juice out there at ringside. So it was a little confusing at first. But anyway, at that point, we had a goddamn a real wrestling match involving some level of talent and they tried to be serious about it for the last 20 or 25 minutes of the show like you said collision suddenly broke out after dynamite part b and it was nice to see terry funk forever on punk's wrist tape but um but anyway you know again it, it was a good match it wasn't to the level of the recent collision main events but on this program you couldn't argue but they got some heat on Punk. Punk got the tag to Hook. He made a comeback. They stopped him. They got some heat on Hook. Hook cold tagged Punk. Punk got a comeback, did the Hogan ear cup, and the fans were booing him there because they're on a Wednesday night crowd. So the little buckaroo bonsais had, had bought the tickets. So he had fun with that and milked the boos. And then everybody hit something over and over, and then finally Punk got the go-to-sleep on Brian Cage, but got the Kakina clutch that Joe uses for the tap-out. And as soon as that happened, Joe said, Gentlemen, correct me, is the match over? Yes, boom, and he's off, and he's in the ring. And it's, a, it's supposed to be a big fight between Punk and Samoa Joe, and Perry came out and jumped hook at ringside. Everybody got in a fight. But the camera, to be honest, was on almost everything but Punk and Samoa Joe. And they're the only money issue in the whole thing. So we saw a little bit of their fight and a lot of everybody else blathering around the ring. And that's pretty much what we got out of, out of colliding. with, with co When Collision collides with Dynamite, it's a popcorn fart. Somebody whose stomach is upset after the weekend's happenings at Wembley Stadium. Do you think old do you think old Jungle Jack Perry? What is it? F A F fuck around, find out? Is that what the kids are saying these days? I didn't know the kids were saying that, but I believe that is what that is. Well, he fucked around. I don't know if he's found out yet. It seems like it's hard to teach these kids a lesson. Yeah, he fucked around, but then Tony rewarded him by giving him a Saturday morning show. Well, that's true. And, and also, uh, he was able to leave the show early, 
because that, <laughs> he didn't have to wait for five more hours till the main event was over to get out of there. Uh, no, old Jack Perry was asked to leave the premises after getting uh, reprimanded, I guess, again, for his behavior by CM Punk. This was reported pretty much as the first match was going on. As Punk was in the ring, he was already 1-0 and in backstage skirmishes for the for the afternoon or the evening, whatever time it was over there. You know, when I saw the first report of this, I thought it was a joke. I didn't yes, think it was he, real because of the timing. What one would think, but again, it it is a joke. It's a joke that this cannot be controlled. It's a joke that Tony has lost the plot on getting his EVPs and their little fucking play friends in their clubhouse to just stop, to just quit. And uh, for those of you who have not been on the internet, we reported here a week or two ago, and it was all over the place, that old Jungle Jack Perry wanted to tape a, a brawl with Hook here not long ago at one of the tapings that would involve getting thrown through or slammed through a car window with real glass in it. And apparently now that the, the story has come out more fully and we understand what was happening, there was several people before Punk got to the building that day that had already told old Jack, no, we don't want to do that. We don't have any gimmick glass. No, no reason to take that risk. I've I've heard of Tony Schiavone was one of the people that told him that. I've heard that the the new director, producer, head of television production, can't recall his name, but he told Jack Perry, no, we can't do that. Somebody else involved in talent relations may have been, you know, one of the uh, uh, office people, whoever, several people had told old Jack, no, we're not going to do this. And he's like, fuck you to all of them. I'm going to do it. And that's why they all came to Punk when Punk got to the building and said, would you tell this guy we don't want him to do this shit? So apparently Punk had to be the one to tell him not ask him, we wish you wouldn't do this or please don't do this, but say, no, we're not going to fucking do it. You've been told you're not going to do it. Are you going to do it now? Apparently not. And so Little Jack got his panties in a bunch over that. And on the pre-show of All In Wembley, which added another, I guess, two hours to the four-hour pay-per-view, so it was a six-hour presentation altogether there, Old Jack is working with Hook, and they're having some type of garbage match. What was the rules of this thing, Brian? Because I, I saw the clip of the incident in question. I didn't watch this whole match, because why? But what was the rules? They were they were in the entrance way fighting next to a car. I watched this and I don't remember because I didn't have the commentary on what the rules were. I think it may have been like a street fight, maybe. <laughs> I don't Anything know. Anything goes? Something goes or nothing goes. A Wembley street fight. So they're they're fighting in the entrance way next to a car. And then old Jungle Jack looks at the camera and pats the windshield and says, see this? It's real glass. Cry me a river into the camera and then goes to suplex fucking Hook on it. But Hook turns it around and suplexes old Jack through the windshield. It didn't bust all the way out. It's, it's the, you know, windshield glass. So it broke everywhere. And you could see that it cut the guy, cut Jack on his arm. You could see him bleeding when, he, when they staggered back to the ring. Uh, but he just wanted to prove that even though that he was told by people representing his employers, various people in charge of various things, that he shouldn't do it, and then he was told by one of the big stars in the company, of which he is not one of those, that he shouldn't do it, but then he gets over there and he said, well, I'm going to do it anyway and I'm going to make sure that this fucking guy that told me no is suitably chastened for restricting my artistic creativity. Hey, the bigger issue is since the story got out, did Tony tell him no? Well, nobody even said Tony was there at the time. 
I'm saying the for, the, for the second time for doing it at the stadium. I thought that's what you were talking about. Oh, no, I'm, I'm saying that all these people told him not to do it the first time. It has not come out whether he bothered to tell anybody that they were going to go through the windshield this time around or whether this was just something he was going to do and he was going to tell the camera because he knew that Punk was on first on the pay-per-view. It was the next match, and he'd be back there within reach of the monitor standing by like a good professional waiting to go out so they didn't have to run and look for him. And you didn't do justice to his voice because you made it sound like because again, like his I voice, made it sound like he was a grown adult man, didn't I? Yeah, his voice is part of the issue with his promos, but it was like real glass, cry me a river. Yeah, and cry he's a me heel. a river. And he's also 137 pounds. But I have to think they have a car out there. There's no way he's doing that spot without someone giving pre approval. And there's a car out there, you have to expect it's gonna happen too. Well, but the, the question is, is anybody supposed to go through the windshield or are they just supposed to slam their head in the fucking door? Or were they going to start it and run over somebody? We don't fucking know. But point being, childish bullshit, right? From the children. The same group that we always hear from. Same the locker children. room. Same, same locker, locker room. room. So, and now that the Cucamonga contention had been heard from, they go ahead and finish their match, does Jack and Hook, and then, apparently, from what we are, were told, from what we are hearing that has been reported, Jack Perry, and I can see, you know, if one guy's coming through Gorilla, the other guy's standing there, you're going to pass, right? So Jack, apparently, comes through and either, the story was confronted punk, but either said something smartass and or bumped him as he went by him saying something. And then at one time, the story was that Punk then punched Perry, but that was quickly modified to, no, 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 a lot of people are saying he choked him. Now, this has brought images to mind to people on, the, on Twitter, apparently, of that Punk reached up and grabbed the guy in a rear naked choke or a front head chancery or something and choked him out on the floor. I don't believe this to be the case. I have not heard. We don't know yet. But the first thing when I thought, and I'm envisioning this kind of confrontation where this little fucking cocky ass wipe, after he said that right in the fucking camera where he knows the guy's going to be watching the monitor, and then he comes through gorilla whether he said something or whether he just shoulder bumped him on the way by or whatever, I think Punk goozled him. And that would be the, the normal reaction to me would be to goozle the fucking guy and tell him what the fuck you have a problem with. I don't think... People, huh? people may not know what the term goozle means. Oh, good Lord. He grabbed him by the goozle pipe. Um... <laughs> He, imagine you're going to choke slam somebody, ladies and gentlemen, and the first move is to reach out and grab them around the neck. But normally you wouldn't do it if you're right-handed. You wouldn't do it with your right hand. If you're going to, and that used to be what the boys would say, well, I had to goozle that guy. You grab him around the goozle pipe. If the guy is up in your face, he's close enough, you got a problem with him, you're mad, but at the same time, you either don't want to hit him you don't have room to fight. You don't necessarily think it needs to come to that right now, but a point needs to be delivered. If you're standing in front of the guy, you reach out with your left hand fairly quickly and snatch that motherfucker around the neck with your thumb on one side of his neck and your fucking fingers on the other side of his neck. That means his goozle pipe, his windpipe is in the middle and you squeeze. And while you're squeezing, and if there's a wind, a, a, a wall behind him, even better yet, because then you're squeezing and pushing, and you got him pinned up against the fucking wall, and that's where you can get in close, and you can relate the message to him that you want him to hear while you're looking in his fucking eyes and telling him what's going to happen if he doesn't have the proper goddamn attitude when you let go of his fucking neck. That's when you goozle somebody. That's what Ron Harris did to Shawn Michaels in Madison Square Garden. That's what the Sheik did to that fucking 
collegiate wrestler that wanted to try him that time in the back of the Kobo. That's what I can't imagine anybody in the wrestling business at one time or another hasn't goozled somebody, whether it be fellow co-worker, fan, or fucking potential employer or representative of same, or just if you're out somewhere, I mean, you've goozled people in your goddamn daily life, haven't you, Brian? What do you mean in your daily life? Like, if you get into you've, a fight, you get into a fight, you do all sorts of things, but in your daily life? No. No, you, you've never... Go- <laughs> Have I ever put the banker against the wall by the throat? No, I haven't had to do that. Well, that's... Well, My lawyer would, does that. You would be a, a, an odd standout in the wrestling business, at least up until the last 20 years or so, because I can think of about... 12 to 15 people at various instances over time that I have had to goozle to make a point to. But anyway, um, that's what you, and I, I bet that's what punk did. He fucking goozled him and he put him up against a convenient wall. And he said, you little motherfucker, I got to go out and work now, or I would have more time to fucking go into this with you, but you probably shouldn't be here when I'm fucking come back. Something like that. I mean, you know, whatever. I have not seen any detail about him goozling him. Where are you getting this? Somebody said he choked him. I th- I saw a front face lock. Do you uh, I, do you think he got him in a front face lock? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I just heard choked him, and I'm thinking, well, that would be an odd place to just go for the UFC stuff right there. I would think you would just with that little prick. Because what's Jack Perry gonna fucking do? What's he gonna fucking do? He should have thought about that before he started running his dick liquor. But if I was punk, I would say, I got to go out for this match. I'm going to fucking goozle him. I'm going to tell him what I think of him. And I'm going to fucking leave the door open to rehash this later on and go out and have my match. So that's what I thought. That's what I could envision happening. And again, we don't know the whole story because Sean Ross Sapp was the first one with a kind of a detailed story. And then Miro said it wasn't true that he was there, but Miro didn't say what he saw. And there's, you know, the punk side, and then there's the other side. Everyone can agree there was a confrontation and some bumping. Jack Perry was asked to leave the building. If you're Tony Khan, and you are about to begin the greatest day of your life as a wrestling promoter, do you appreciate the fact that Jack Perry started this shit? No. No, I don't. But at the same time, I don't know if Tony will will realize that he's continuing to let these jackoffs do this or whether he just thinks this is stuff that happens and there's nothing he can do about it. I I don't know yet whether, you know, fire the fucking little goof. Send a message. Look, I don't care if y'all have a problem and you want to talk about it in the back, then that's fine. We'll all sit down. But at next person that does shit on the air, I'm firing them just like I fired Jungle Stooge. Get it? That would that would send a message. Either fire them or make them work together. That's the other thing, because now everyone knows this happened. Everyone knows. See, I think that's what hurts the Bucks. When people see the Bucks now, people know that CM Punk kicked their ass. They know that happened. And they know that there's never going to be any working retribution. Now, here's another guy. No one is saying Jack Perry came out of this for the better. Everyone's saying it's a confrontation, and one way or another, Punk schooled him. Whether it was goozled him, or whether it was say fuck you to him, whatever it was, something happened. People are going to know about it. You either have to do something with it, or what's the point of the whole thing? Then you have more people on the roster who can't work with the biggest single star on the roster. Well, but the thing... (sighs) Is anybody clamoring to see CM Punk versus Jungle Jack Perry anyway? They could make it mean something. I'm not saying saying on the face of it anyone's demanding that match. Certainly not. I think we're stretching it to say that you could even make that match a try. Would that be the best use of Punk's time and effort to try to drag a match and money out of Jack Perry? The argument wasn't whether it was the best use of CM Punk. It certainly wouldn't be. So I, I would make guys work together when, you know, with the, with the group of the effete, I'm sorry, the elite versus punk at FTR, the, you could get money out of a shoot incident that happened out of that. But just but he, but even punk Jack, versus Perry. I'm not saying punk versus Jack Perry to main event all out. Although I don't know who punk's working with it all out. We'll see what happens. 
Do we know who's working it all out? It's it's only fucking five days away. There's Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs. There's uh, Ruby Soho versus Statlander. There was another Darby versus Luchasaurus, I think, or Darby versus Christian. One of the two. But I was saying something, God damn it! You were saying that we ought to make these guys no, work together. I was saying it doesn't have to be the main event of a pay-per-view. It could be a three-week program on Collision, because Collision needs shit like that. I don't know if Collision needs Jack Perry. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. You hate I, Jack I, Perry. I, you hate Jack Perry. I mean, it just, it's ridiculous at this point. This guy's had every chance in the world, and he underperforms every time. He's the anchor around everything's neck. You know, in the, the four pillars deal, he's a good underneath mid card baby face. He gets sympathy selling against a veteran. It'll keep him in line. Otherwise he can't talk. He's obviously got an attitude problem. And the thing that maybe this is the problem. Maybe you're like the, you know, average person in the locker room these days. That's never been goozled. Or never goozled anybody. There's not enough goozling going on. These kids are are in a fantasy world that where they're all actors performing, you know, with friends instead of in a goddamn business where it's predicated on fucking heat and violence and people that get out of control. And if you fuck with somebody, they're going to goozle you. They don't expect to get goozled. Uh, the solution is not goozling anyone. Let's be very honest about it. And that wouldn't work. And that would cause a lot of problems for the company. So there has it, to be well, something else. But here's the thing. The solution is not to goozle people. But also, part of the problem is, is that there is not the belief. There's not the threat. There's not the trepidation that if they keep assing off, that they will get goozled. And again, that's a systematic problem with AEW. Well, the the thing is, you need to know that there is potential goozling that's going to take place if you run your fucking pie hole about somebody enough. And then you either you either want to continue running the pie hole and risk the goozling that you believe you can handle, or you want to fucking shut the fuck up if you don't want to get goozled. But again, this goozling, whether it was a real goozling or a metaphorical one in terms of some sort of discipline, why would anyone there be afraid of that? What's been done to show anyone that there's any discipline for anything? Punks goozled a couple. Well, he See, didn't, no, he didn't goozle least. a couple. He punched one. Like you're, you're using goozle now as okay. an overall term for things. Well, uh, the, goo the goozle, the, 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 the overall catch-all phrase of goozling. He goozled the Bucks. He goozled old Jungle Jack. Kenny got goozled in the way of, of goozling by a steel. Why don't they just stop talking about him and just continue with their own other nattering about everybody else behind everybody else's back? That's the other thing we haven't even talked about. Just the stupidity of Jack Perry. Why are you doing that? Even if you were going to do the spot, say nothing. Why would you do that? Like you said, he has to know punks nearby. He knows what the schedule of matches are. I mean, that's why I think Jack Perry was the first one sent away. It wasn't just because punk was working that match. What the fuck is he thinking? He's not thinking. They think they won't get goozled. That's what he's thinking. That's what kept order in the wrestling locker room. Not only the camaraderie, not only the nature of being a family, a brotherhood, but also the fact that most of the guys in the locker room, if you dicked around with them long enough, would fucking goozle you. And you had to, in turn, be ready to do the same thing. And that kept everybody from goozling each other a lot of the goozling you've seen were because of things off camera when it's something like this in a high profile way and again enough people know the story that everyone immediately went to thinking he's talking about cm punk when he said it does that change yes. things no well, no because it was obvious that's that changes things for the worse that exacerbates him he's being obvious he can't even say it's it's the what do the kids call it? Passive aggressive, where you're too much of a fucking gutless pussy to just tell somebody fuck you, so you say nice shit to them that means the same thing? He's just fucking around. Fuck around? Find out. Tony Khan has announced an investigation into the matter <laughs> at the uh, media scrum after the event. He couldn't comment on it. He admitted that there was indeed an incident without naming anyone, but said that he can't comment any further 
Uh, it is under investigation. Luckily, Inspector Jacques Clissel <laughs> was able to immediately take care of the issue. Well, let's see how they took to what they did already at All In. I like that they opened the show with at least give me some reason to continue watching. If they'd opened it with some of the matches they had, I would have mentally shut down. But we got the real world championship on the line first out of the gate with Samoa Joe versus Lack Mussolini, Goozle Jack Perry. Oh. So the fans were singing. <laughs> And the big, it's clobbering time. He Punk got a big ovation. And again, you heard a lot of people singing the song because the UK wanted wants to see stars. They're deprived of the live events, as we've talked about. So they're there, the fucking atmosphere. People ready to fucking scream and yell. And they reacted to Punk. And then as soon as the match settled in, they got firmly behind Joe and started booing Punk. And it, you know, and he worked with it. I was glad to see Jim Ross on the show, and he sounded better and more energetic than we've heard him in a while. Yes, and he crapped on all the stuff I was mentally crapping on watching yes. it, and it made it made Jim Ross the highlight of the show in a lot of ways for me. Yes, because and when know, he left the show, I should have left the show. <laughs> that's that's the thing is he was you know when he'd say I never understood this when two guys are doing something completely stupid. Um. But he sounded better and more energetic. Of course, they switched out. If you're not paying attention and you miss the start of the match where they switch out the announcers, then you're disoriented because whose voice is... They had everybody on this show at one point in time. Taz was out there. JR. Sockface was all over it, and he was especially unbearable, as one would imagine, being as he was, I'm sure, creaming in his pants to actually be doing something that he's not very good at in front of that many people. But the, the, besides the, uh, Nigel's great. And plus this was his environment. Punk came out with a shaved head and the short tights. And at the bell, there was a big chant for Samoa Joe. Uh, I'm enjoying this because I didn't know at the time I was watching the match that he had just, Punk had just had a skirmish with somebody. But it just seemed like he was having more fun with being booed even than normal. And he, when he's doing the Hogan ear cupping, and he's just giving the people the look and and encouraging it, do you think now he was thinking, you know, I've just had another one. They'll probably start yelling at me when I go back there again, and I'll fucking go home again. So fuck it, I'm going to come out here and have fun with Samoa Joe. You think that's what was going through his mind? Again, the news was breaking as this match was happening, and I thought yeah. it was a joke at first, because I was like, no way, come on. <laughs> Can't be every year at the same weekend or the same time period every year. And I think he knew. And I also think he's working with a guy he wants to work with, a guy he's going to enjoy working with despite getting his ass kicked in the match. And how do you not enjoy that kind of crowd reaction? And, uh... There was a big, oh, I know you love the, uh, he did the Terry Funk tribute when he got hung up in the ropes and got bounced up and down, up uh, upside down. And then Joe did the thing where he walks off on a guy that's trying to do a dive on him and got a huge pop for it and then grabbed Punk and ran his head through the front of the desk. So Punk came out bleeding and had good juice. And again, benefit of being on first before all of the, indie rific outlaw fucks get a hold of the ring and bleed for no reason that won't make any money. And then they were still having the match where Joe gets heat on Punk and Punk sells big but fights from underneath, even though Joe was the baby face for the fans. This kind of match works because Joe can't and really shouldn't sell as a baby face. And it's still punk. It works for punk regardless of whether the people are behind him or not when he fights from underneath in this instance against a big guy like that. So blah, blah, blah. Finally, punk makes the comeback. He milks the ear. He hits the leg drop and gets a one count. And that was great. And then Joe starts hulking up and the people are coming up and they do the finger pointing and <laughs> 
Again, it's a little homage, a little tribute, but it wasn't over-the-top silly. I'm not sure everybody actually picked up on it. I'm sure a lot of people did. And then Joe does the jabs, boom, 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 and the power slam, and then they're back and forth. And again, Punk does another Terry tribute with a spinning toe hold. We brought that back. And then finally, as Samoa Joe is going for the muscle buster, he nails Punk, and Punk falls to the apron. Joe tries to pick him back up to give him a superplex, but Punk foils that and hits the Pepsi plunge off the top rope. Boom, one, two, three. And as soon as they hit the music, now there was a big reaction again when Punk gets his hand up. Okay, they're they're working, they're working with him through the match. We're gonna boo you, we're gonna cheer Joe, but we appreciated all of that, and we're glad to see everybody's here. And then they cheered and they booed and they sang and they did all the things they wanted to do. But at least we started the show with a fucking wrestling match that actually had a story and an angle behind it, and there was no superfluous gaga, and it got over. What'd you think? Really good match. Can't add too much more to what you said. Really good match. I like the look of everything. The ring ropes were lighter than they usually are. The ring aprons were lighter. I watched Collision after this, and everything was so dark. I mean, obviously, they have to darken a lot of the arena because of the amount of people there, but the brightness, the changing colors, and the tones. Now, were you using products from CB Distillery at this point in time, where the, the, the colors had such richer hues, and the sound, it was so quadraphonic and then you know maybe that's what it was it wasn't that and now we're fine friends at cb distillery don't give you anything that makes you see colors ladies and gentlemen that's not part no, of you, the deal you, you hear the colors All right well this is you, a- you ought to hear blue i'll tell you well what i was gonna say is i think it made a big difference especially for a show in that building with part of the show at least being open air or partially open air it looked more like a wrestlemania than a dynamite Yes, and uh, just because of the sea of people on the floor, if nothing else, because you never see that anymore, uh, was, you know, it, they were so deep, and, and they was deep and wide. But anyway, so it was a, a good way to open with Punk and Joe. We have some CM Punk news. Uh-oh. A few things. A report from Nick Houseman, House of Wrestling. The headline... No one from AEW met CM Punk at Heathrow Airport. Exclusive. Before things backstage became chaotic for Punk, it sounds as if his travel also had some hiccups. Uh Uh-oh. House of Wrestling has learned that when Punk landed at Heathrow Airport for AEW All in London on Saturday morning, no one from AEW was there to greet him. There was also no car service to take him to his hotel. (laughs) And when he texted a number he was given by AEW for the driver, it bounced back as being an invalid number. (laughs) After waiting for a while, Punk showed... They they fly the biggest star in the company across the fucking ocean (laughs) and leave him standing at fucking Heathrow Airport with no idea where he's supposed to go or how he's supposed to fucking get there. And the contact that he's given for his alleged transportation is no good. After waiting for a while, Punk chose to buy a train ticket and find his own way to the hotel. We are told that the tube, that's the subway in England, was fairly busy at the time. (laughs) Punk got lost, and a few fans who noticed the Second City Saint helped him figure out where he was going. Oh my god. It appears that Punk got into London so close to the actual event because he had taping commitments in Atlanta on Wednesday and wanted to spend Thursday with his wife and dog Larry. (laughs) His wife's not named, but his dog Larry is. His wife (laughs) and his dog Larry before heading out on Friday and landing on Saturday morning. So that's the first Punk report. the show. Right? Was the show Saturday? Was the show Saturday? Oh, show was Saturday. Saturday. The show was Saturday oh. uh, evening in London, afternoon here in the All East. Right. Or the West, I guess, technically. In the East! Well, that's the first report. The second report, Brian Alvarez of F4W Online and the Wrestling Observer is reporting, The belief within AEW is that Punk and Jack were both suspended 
pending the results of an investigation, <laughs> which would mean neither will work all out. What? If they don't have punk it all out, can you imagine? In Chicago, they'll boo him out of the fucking building. What the fuck? Why would you suspend the fucking guy that's the star of the goddamn show because this small fucking insignificant numbnut brained idiot, Jack Perry, decides that he's again going to do childish shit. And when he finds out that at least some people in this business still stand up for themselves and he gets snatched and then he goes crying to somebody about it. Can nobody take their goddamn earned ass kicking anymore? Uh, what the fuck? Tell the child he shouldn't have done what he did and he's lucky punk didn't do worse. And if he don't like it, then here's your contract, Jack. Rip, rip, rip. Good luck in your future endeavors. What the fuck is difficult about that? <laughs> I have a little bit more here from Nick Houseman about the actual incident. Okay. Reports regarding the actual altercation between Punk and Perry backstage at AEW All In and the subsequent aftermath have differed, with some saying Punk initiated the confrontation and others claiming it was Perry who acted first. After asking around, here is what House of Wrestling can report. Well, and, and we know that their word is like gold. Well, we can say that Nick Houseman has been all over all this punk stuff. He's a Chicago guy, and he's been involved in all this punk stuff. So let's see what this says. From what we are told, Punk was waiting in the gorilla position before the show went live for his match against Samoa Joe when Perry entered the area and walked up to him. Punk initiated the verbal exchange between the two, asking Perry if he had something to say. And the conversation quickly escalated, leading to Perry asking Punk to do something about it. Oh my God. <laughs> this is when Punk shoved Perry. Perry responded by shoving Punk back. Oh my God. And then Punk put him in what is being described as a chokehold. We're told Punk viewed putting Perry in a chokehold as a way to neutralize the situation as he's a trained fighter and does not want to have to fight Perry. No punches were thrown, as far as we know. Punk then walked to his dressing room. But again, who, is, who does this little needle-dicked simpleton think he is to tell CM Punk, boy, you going to do something about it? Yeah, apparently. Why would you think he wasn't? Who's going to be intimidated by Jack fucking Perry? Well, forget about even intimidation. What big star in wrestling history, Hogan, Austin, Flair, whoever you want to name, would let one of the mid-card or undercard guys in the pre-show match live on air say shit about them right into the camera? And then, and then announce to them afterwards, oh, are you going to do something about it? Yeah. What would Hogan have done? He would have had the guy fired. That's what he would have done. Uh, Unbelievable. Punk then walked to his dressing room, got cleaned up, and spoke with AEW security. Punk, knowing the situation was not good, asked them if it would be better for everyone if he left the building, and was told that nobody was asking him to leave. But it might make things easier if he did. <laughs> Punk agreed, left the building of his own accord, walked to his hotel, and ordered Nando's for some of the talent, whom he met up with after the show. Boom, and Nando's, by the way. What a fucking meal. From what we gather, it does not sound like there's been much, if any, communication between Punk and AEW since last night. So this is a developing story, just like everything seems to be every time we record. How is this a surprise, though? I mean, just... It, Which aspect of it? Well, that you're, you're going to say something smart-ass to Punk and, and something's going to happen. How is it a surprise? The, the thing that, again, that gobsmacks me is that it's a surprise to these guys that they are getting snatched or punched or whacked with a chair or whatever's happening to them in a wrestling locker room like that. How in the world can this happen? Do you think Jack Perry's been in a lot of fights in his life? Do you think Jack Perry has had issues where something he said could cause him to get punched in the mouth and he would have to defend himself? Probably not. I would bet that that probably didn't have growing up in Beverly Hills. And maybe he has a false sense of entitlement. Obviously, he has a false sense of entitlement if he thinks he could do that 
against one of the top stars in the company on live TV. But that, that's what I'm saying. They're all surprised. They're all shocked when they run their fucking mouse and they stir people up. It, even if they are not aware of it, they're in the wrestling business. And in the wrestling business, it's, you know, reasonable regularity. Somebody's going to get mad. Somebody's going to get punched. Somebody's going to get snatched. Somebody's going to... Things happen. And I don't know why they're all so surprised over it and wringing their hands and going to lawyers and legal and human relations or human resources or whatever the fuck. Again, all it boils down to is Tony doesn't have control of his shit and he never puts his foot down and tells his employees what they're going to do and what they're going to like and what they're not going to do. And if the boss does that, then the employee has the chance to say, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do that or fuck you, I'll go somewhere else. And it all gets settled. Nothing gets settled here because the boys have to do it themselves. And apparently the only one that's still in the wrestling business and wants to stand up for himself is fucking punk. So he's, he's got to be the Lone Ranger. Don't run your fucking yap and won't nobody get goozled. But they can't stop the yap running. And it sounds like he had a second chance. Do you have something you want to say? <laughs> and then it, they pushed him? Apparently he yeah. did. Jeez. And, he, and, and, and here's another thing. If you're going to say shit, you can't look like Jack fucking Perry. You can't be five foot nine and 142 pounds and look puzzled all the time. You have to be ready to, you know, if the guy's going to say, well, yes, I'm going to do this and this and the other thing about it. And then here, here we go. Well, here we go. Before this becomes a six hour episode, it may already have to be split into two parts. I have to see, but that's the latest news from AEW. CM Punk and AEW, more stories have emerged. You may have been following this closer than I at this point. Apparently... Brian Alvarez of F4W Online and the Wrestling Observer reported that there was a second incident backstage at All In in London. Yeah, and that's how people started picking up on it. Second incident at All In London. And the story that was reported, and I'm somewhat paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, was that after the Jack Perry incident, Miro <laughs> confronted CM Punk and they almost got into it. Well, here there, there was some verbiage exchanged. We understand that it was like Miro came in and, and Punk was like, do we have a problem? And Miro was like, I don't know. I do will we? come all over you. Yeah, well, no, he didn't. He only wanted to come all over me now. Come on, be serious. <laughs> and I don't know. Do we have a problem? Well, do we need to go outside? Punk said, do we need to go outside? Well, maybe we do. I don't know. Let's just go out here. And, and they stormed off. That's what, and Brian Alvarez also, he said that he talked to five different, and this is the greatest thing, that Brian Alvarez, who, bless him, because it, it sort of like the Vanity Press project that I talked about that used to exist in printing a long time ago, Brian Alvarez made himself a professional wrestler when it became a thing that you could do by just going and getting himself booked on independent events and with his size i would imagine that it was probably in exchange for favorable reporting on their uh yellow journalism site because for fuck's sake i i don't know another reason why brian alvarez who lives in washington would be wrestling in suburban uh northern indiana on a local event what does oh really? yeah, I didn't know about this. Yes, I I, I actually saw the in when, Indiana <laughs> when I went to Chicago a few years is before the pandemic, so four or five years ago, for something, I saw a flyer, some kind of black flag pro wrestling in Crown Point, Indiana, and Brian Alvarez's name was on it. I'm like, how oh. the fuck does that happen? Except that potentially they say, well, they'll talk about us. But nevertheless. Black flag pro wrestling. I understand Greg Ginn took all the money. You know, I know they were a punk band. <laughs> <laughs> you went too deep on it for me or I'd have popped for all you. All right, all right. But anyway, the point I was making is 
Brian Alvarez, who manufactured him a little wrestling career and, you know, buddied up with Dave on the newsletter business, said he talked to five different people who were there. And not only there, but he, I know there was a bunch of people in Wembley Stadium, but I don't think he needed to talk to the hot dog vendor about what happened in the locker room. So he's saying that he talked to five different people in the locker room. And three of them were, were Matt Hardy. Well, there you go. <laughs> Broken Matt, Woken Matt, and fucking Spoken Matt. But he talked to five different people that would have knowledge of this situation, and they all said it was serious. And that uh, indicates not only that Brian Alvarez, that there's a bunch of blabbermouth, whiny little fucking tattletale motherfuckers in that locker room, they would immediately be able to report to Brian Alvarez. But secondly, that they believed it or that they wanted other people to believe it, whichever it may be, because we now find out that Punk and Miro were fucking around and joking. Yeah, you got a problem with me? Oh, we need to take it outside? Let's take and it to the ring! Yeah, let's take it. And as and they either bought it or want other people to buy it. Like, oh, this guy's having a problem with everybody. They were apparently laughing about the problem that did exist from the little whiny, whiny jungle jack. Yes, Miro has a problem with God, not punk. I thought they were the same thing. Oh, come on. See, now your, your fandom of punk has gone too far. Well, no, I saw the sign, CM Punk is God. They're all over Chicago, along with those people with those tiki torches, waiting for the opportunity to set the seats on fire. If they bought tickets for three shows in one week in the same fucking town, and they don't get to see their favorite in any of them. From what I understand, AEW has banned tiki torches from the arena. Well, then they'll have a fucking acetylene torch, a blow <laughs> torch, a pro wrestling torch. What they? <laughs> a few of those pro wrestling torches have been set on fire. <laughs> And they're going to fucking be pissed. But yeah, the Miro and Punk thing, and, and then uh, that's why I, I saw people shooting at Alvarez, shooting down his explanation that, well, five people said that it was a two, what, dipshit. It doesn't matter because it still wasn't. Apparently it was a whole big fucking hoo-ha over nothing what in the past did those five sources tell you about things backstage whether it was the brawl yeah. out last year or brawl in yeah it was brawl out last year i'm so confused with all these pay-per-views what else have these sources told you that were reported in some cases as people see it as anti-punk stories but what else do these sources who were wrong about this tell you in the past <laughs> about what and, they perceived uh, in the back just standing yes, there and watching things what they perceived and assumed was taking place or wanted people to perceive or assume was taking place what well, cuz we know a lot of these kids in the locker room ain't exactly smart to the business if a couple of guys are yelling at each other and it sounds ominous apparently they're about to commit mayhem that's what they think. Or other ones who, hey, well, boy, we could see, you know, nobody likes this guy. That's the story we'll tell. And here's fucking, you know, lap dog and cauliflower head over there willingly because they get attention and petting and ranch dressing, I guess. I don't fucking know. Uh, they get all the attention from these guys. So they parrot it because why would they lie to me? We're friends friends cm punk was at the cauliflower alley club the last couple of days in las vegas getting an award and the wrestling news is lou kippelman was there and he approached him to ask him about this we may have made a mistake though the question was hey punk do you got a problem and then punk put lou in a front face lock and it was over well no come on now that did not happen at all because i've seen the size of kippelman's neck and there's no way that punk could reach all the way around that so I sent Lou. I said, if you run into Punk, here are some questions for you. Hey, Punk, does Colin Thompson owe you money? <laughs> uh, now that you've attended CAC, when do you expect to test positive for COVID? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I have any other ones here? Uh, hey, Punk, do you want to step outside? 
Well, and and meanwhile, Punk was getting an award for his outstanding contributions to professional wrestling in and outside the ring and the furtherance of same. While these dipshits are over there rolling around in barbed wire and broken glass. What do the issues with Jungle Boy say about the state of the rainforest? <laughs> <laughs> Lou was going to ask these questions, but an approaching punk, uh, A-Steel bit him. So Lou is now out of commission. He's Son of a bitch. He's getting a I tetanus thought, shot. Now, I thought they had, had required Ace to wear a muzzle within f- 50 feet of any public structure. I don't know. That, that may not have, that may, well, you know what happens? It's Vegas. Vegas stays yeah. in Vegas. Yeah, they, <laughs> you, can't, you can't enforce those That's rulings right. in Vegas. That's right. Well, CM Punk news. Are you kidding me? Well, I mean, it's minor news, but it's still interesting. Fightful has a story, apparently. Let me see what they say here, because a lot of people are sending this to us. Apparently, AEW is collecting statements and interviews about the nature of what happened with CM Punk and Jack Perry. <laughs> they're collecting them, then they're going to have the statements graded and slabbed for collectors. Also, and here's the hottest bootleg on the market, there's footage of the incident. No! There were cameras all over Wembley. <laughs> also, when, a- after the when incident... When does this get aired on their program instead of the shit they showed us last night? Punk and Tony had an altercation that was described as contentious, but that's all anyone knows. So let's just recap this real briefly. So they fly him over from Chicago to London. He ends up at Heathrow Airport on Saturday morning. The phone number they have given him for his car service is no good. He's got no car there to take him to his hotel or to the stadium. He can't call them. Apparently, from what we have been told by a variety of fans and people over there on the scene, the Uber situation was not tenable in London that day with 80,000 of these raven wrestling maniacs. So he, he has to ride, as they call it, the tube, the under, the subway, to his hotel. I guess he was going first and then to the stadium. And there are pictures on the internet. He got lost. Imagine that. You're in God. I assume he's probably never ridden the tube before because when he was in London for the WWE, they pretty much carry their guys back and forth, right? So he gets lost, and there's pictures on Twitter of fans helping him find his way and sitting next to him on the tube. Then he, he gets there to the building, and right before he goes out for the opening match on the pay per view, he has to watch this little childish indie nitwit this little fucking vienna sausage dicked moron that used to hang around with fucking chimpanzees swinging in the trees make mockery of him on camera and the the what he was asked to do by the company a few weeks ago remember it wasn't like he just of his own volition came up and said hey jungle jack off we ain't gonna do that ain't gonna be happening They came to him. We've heard Tony Schiavone. We've heard the producer of the television. We've heard people from the office. We've heard a variety of people came to him and said, hey, can you tell this guy not to do this? Because he won't listen to us. Now that same nitwits out there in front of 80,000 people and all the pay-per-view audience putting the mouth on Punk's efforts that he was asked to do to begin with by the company. Hey, I got a question I don't know the answer to, and I don't know if you would either, but... When Jack Perry did that, did he know Punk was there? How late was Punk getting there? Did he know Punk was there, or was Punk so late that he wasn't even... No, hold on, because it was the the last match on Zero Hour, and Punk was the first match on the pay-per-view, and it's odd that Punk was at Gorilla. He'd been there, and he knew that he was going to be the next match, and he was probably going to be in the vicinity of a fucking monitor. That's why he did it. And he figured his little fucking cucamonga friends in the treehouse, the boys club would take up for him and prevent any repercussions because there are none repercussions for anything there. Or did he think Punk wouldn't do anything because Tony Khan would be right there if he was a gorilla? Well, he probably thought that too. (laughs) But I don't know why he would think that because everybody does everything when Tony's around. Sometimes they're doing things with Tony from what we've heard from disgruntled employees. 
so then the fucking prick comes through the goddamn curtain. Hey, you got a problem with me? You got something to say to me? Yeah, I just said it out there. What are you going to do about it? Well, here. And now we find out he didn't ghoul. I thought he just snatched the idiot around the fucking neck. Apparently, he actually front face locked him. <laughs> F-A-F-O. But now we... Then the story has been uh, expanded to they knocked over some shit at the table because that's where Tony was sitting. So apparently Tony was there. I don't know why they're collecting statements. If Tony was there, what, what he saw is the only thing that matters and what he says, the only thing should be the only thing that goes. So yeah, what does Tony he, say? Really? If he's sitting there when this happens and they get him broke up, if it's me, I'm like, you, What's the fucking issue? And to hear his story, you, what's the fucking response? And whichever story that I think is fucking sounds more legitimate, I'm going to believe because I'm sitting right there and I'm going to boot the other one out of the fucking building and the company. Who are the investigators? Well, fucking Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe have opened up a, an investigative branch. Apparently, I don't, like I said, Clouseau could be on the case. There were no investigators last time in the investigation. There were no independent uh, fucking detectives on this case. It was, okay, we're going to talk to a few people, and then we're going to fucking goddamn just wait until everybody forgets about it, we hope. That was the, that was pretty much the goddamn deal. It was the Khan family attorneys in Illinois that were doing the investigation, wasn't it? But yes. We're going to talk to everybody, and then we're going to do nothing about it, and we're going to see if everybody will forget about it. That's what happened. Well, so I, I doubt very seriously if we're going to get any earth-shattering results from this investigation, but I think the footage... Yeah, what does that tell? What does that say that the investigation would have to expand upon? So the, the owner of the whole company was sitting in the proximity of the issue, and they have it on camera... We need, video, <laughs> we need more information. We, if we only knew what happened, it's like it's like putting together the goddamn Kennedy assassination. We've got so little to go on. We know what dipshit did on camera out there. We know what Punk did when he came through the curtain. Boss man was sitting right there, and they got it on video. We have a Jack Perry update. He's uh doing nothing and brushing his hair. Well, that does take a while. He's got lots One of time. One thing you can say about the kid is he's got he's got a lot of hair. Do they reinstate Punk before the pay per view? If they have half a fucking mind, and remember, I've, I put the qualifier "if" on there. He's got to be out of his mind. He's going to kill Chicago. He's going to kill Chicago. If these people, they might not have not have thought he was going to be on Wednesday night on Dynamite when they bought tickets, but for the people who bought tickets for Collision, Punk's show, and didn't they get screwed out of, they got screwed out of him one time before, didn't they, or did they, in in this whole situation? Oh, I'm not sure. I mean, the AEW fans, uh, they take a lot of screwing. In. Uh, but, but nevertheless, if he's not on Collision and definitely if he's not on the pay-per-view, and the, when the people bought the tickets, it was after Punk had returned, correct? where they had every reason to believe he would be on these programs. Right. And now if he ain't, they're going to set the seats on fire. I'm. They, I, I, what has happened? Jesus Christ. What has happened to people's minds? Uh, and I mean, and that's a joking line, obviously, but people have done that in the past. I, one time, they were bringing Jimmy Valiant back to Memphis. He hadn't been there in a year. Handsome Jimmy Valiant was one of the most over guys in the fucking territory. And they advertised it. He was in the main event. And goddamn, that's when he had a health issue and he passed out in the Charlotte airport before he was on the way to fly to Memphis and didn't make the show. And guess what they did, Brian? They set the fucking seats on fire. So I mean, Vader and Oki. 
Vader and Noki, they didn't set the seats on fire. They threw him into the fucking ring. Got banned from the building. <laughs> yes. Rest, not Vader and Noki, but all of wrestling got banned from the building. It, 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 you know, I, I'm just saying it's insane to me. So what if he front face locked a preliminary fucking boy? The preliminary boy also ran his fucking mouth and deserved it. But God damn it. The fucking main event guy in his hometown, you're running a pay-per-view and you're going to lead them to believe that he's going to be there up until five days before the show where they don't even know a card to begin with anyway. And then you pull him, they're going to kill Chicago. They won't be able to go back there on a fucking bet. Well, speaking of people <laughs> running around crazily, attacking people for no reason... Let's update ourselves on what CM Punk has been doing these days. Um, apparently now, and Brian, you're going to have to fill me in on it because so much has been happening over here at the castle this week that uh, I've, I've heard a little bit about this. I think you have some more detail, but now the story has become after we on, what's your show's name? The drive through. That's it. Listen to it, folks. He needs the positive reinforcement. But after the drive-thru where we reported that Brian Alvarez has been made a public laughing stock and tied to the proverbial whipping post because he actually reported that Punk and Miro almost got in a big fight when they were actually joking, like, hey, you got a problem with me? Oh, you want to take it outside? Bada bing, bada boom. And that became, oh my God, I talked to five people that said they were serious. Now, Punk, or Uncle Dave, Brian's, spiritual grandfather is now reporting that punk lunged at tony khan and was held back from apparently assaulting him and committing bodily mayhem and aggravated fucking treachery on tony khan's carcass after he dispatched jungle boy jack perry and what what's the story here now well, it's an ever-changing story. Uh, it depends on which reporter is reporting it, it seems like. But in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave compiled several versions of the story, including the one he was told. One person close to Punk who wasn't there, but <laughs> talked to him, said he tried to help a young guy and prevent him from doing something dangerous with Glo Oh, this is going back to the previous thing. Excuse me. Well, look, we, we've, we've already established what happened between Perry and Punk, and that's not in dispute by anybody except potentially the Cucamonga camp, is that they were trying to talk Perry out of doing what he was trying to do, and he wouldn't listen to anybody. And so finally, the, the people that were in charge, Tony Schiavone, the producer, etc., went to Punk and said, hey... You're supposed to be the star around here. Can you get this fucking guy to goddamn quit fucking whining at us and just do what we asked him not to do? And that's what happened. And that led to Jungle Boy believing that his panties were being put in a bunch along with his fucking artistry being suppressed. So that's that was that incident. Nick Houseman essentially presented the punk side. He said Punk was in Gorilla since his match with Joe was next. Perry walked past him. Punk asked Perry if he had something to say, and the conversation escalated. The version from either Punk or someone close to him, but Dave's just flat out trying to figure out who that source is. <laughs> the version from either Punk or someone close to him said that Perry asked Punk to do something about it. That version was that Punk shoved Perry, and Perry shoved back. Punk then grabbed Perry in a choke, this was reported by others as a guillotine choke. That's a front face lock for people who have been in the business longer than there's been a thing called MMA. With the idea of holding him there to defuse the situation and that he didn't want to fight Perry and no punches were thrown as far as he knew. That version was that Punk asked security if it would be better if he left the building and was told that nobody was going to ask him to leave, but it may be better if he did. And then you may remember Jimmy ordered Nando's for some of his friends who were the talent. Yes. The version that Perry told people... Cheeky Nandos! The version that Perry told people is that he was leaving after losing and got backstage. Punk came up to him with a lot of people around and said, Do we have a problem? Perry said no. 
Perry then said to Punk that he said stuff that got online about him, and that line, using that term, cry me a river, it was noted that Perry probably didn't need to say the line during the match, but wrestlers do that all the time, whether to get their frustrations out or to pop friends in some form. Is this Dave speaking now, extrapolating on this? This is Dave explaining the Perry side in his own words, yes. Okay, because okay, it's bogging down already. It would have been no big deal to anyone, except he should have known better because it was punk. The version Perry... He, he should have known better because it was Charles Manson. And he was going to take offense at, at, at fucking Terry Melcher not appreciating his music. The version Perry apparently said included that punk then said words to the effect of, You know I could fuck you up at any time, right? <laughs> That version was that he then pie-faced Perry and tried to put a guillotine on him and also threw some punches that were awkward from the position Punk was not doing any damage. Oh, 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 well, oh, 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 oh not only the story is that <laughs> Punk's just wailing on him, but that he's not doing any damage. While Perry grabbed Punk's arm to try to keep him from locking in the move. Samoa so some, somebody gave Dave uh, the imagined play-by-play play of this entire skirmish if, if, if most of the people who've been in these things can't remember exactly how they happened Samoa Joe came in and quickly broke it up Perry didn't have a bruise or scratch on him past those he got from the match Brody King who is tight with Punk ended up being mad and one version of the story told by many is that he punched a wall and may have broken his hand <laughs> Although he claims differently. King, King did end up with a broken hand. I didn't know anything about this. Kid did end up breaking his hand, but he said it was during the match. King, la King later claimed he never punched the wall, but he did kick a garbage can <laughs> <laughs> and broke his hand during the match on the guardrail. However, other reports by those there have claimed to witness his punching the wall. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and the word in the dressing room was that he may have broken his hand or wrist hours before his match started. I don't see why he would make up a story, yet others have outright said that when people reported his story, they were being worked. So who knows? <laughs> it is possible that he punched the wall. <laughs> and people thought he broke his hand and then actually broke it in the match which would be quite the coincidence. And it is possible, with all the goings-on, people thought it was a punch when it was a kick. Security took punch. Can we get back to punk? <laughs> Hold on, I want to talk about Wallgate. No, no, I want to talk what? about Wallgate. <laughs> his goddamn <laughs> medical file and his primary care physician is not as thick as Dave's fucking extrapolation on how his, his hand may have been damaged. I hope Brody King's career can overcome all this talk about whether or not he did indeed punch this wall or not. I don't know if he'll be allowed back in England. I wonder, did the wall sell? Security took Punk into his dressing room. Punk was then screaming at Khan and swearing at him. While this was going on, the announcers and production people were told to stall. Because at this point, no one knew if Punk vs. Joe was happening. Nobody except those who saw the situation knew why, only told a stall before the first match. Let me fast forward a little ahead. Okay, dude, do you... I watched the pay-per-view. I got the pay-per-view from the start, not the zero-hour countdown or whatever, but when the pay-per-view came on, they had the normal pyro, ballyhoo, wide shots, crowd, now whatever the fuck. Was there any goddamn... Was somebody out there twiddling their thumbs for five minutes waiting for the first match? According to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Jim Ross was going to have a planned major entrance, and it didn't happen. Because of all this. If they were stalling, why would they have taken something out? Hello? I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that. I, I was trying to think of any logical answer to that. I maybe, don't know. Maybe JR didn't want to walk all the way from the fucking locker room to goddamn ringside and be blowed up at 72 years old with fucking leg cancer before he started the goddamn show. But why would you take something out if you were being told to stall? That makes no sense. Back to the Observer here. The belief is that Joe convinced Punk to have their match 
and the show then went in the order it was originally scheduled to go. Another version, and this would be a neutral source who was not a wrestler, but was there and witnessed it. And his version was that right after Perry came to the back, Punk went nose to nose with him aggressively and asked if he had a problem. That person said Perry said he was just looking to get heat as a heel. <sighs> Punk shoved him hard. Perry got in his face, and in that version, Punk sucker punched him and went for a choke. People immediately broke it up, and Khan was yelling at Punk to let him go. That person said that once they were separated, Punk lunged in Khan's direction. <laughs> But a number of people got in his he way. Said, he said, Khan! And a number of people got in his way while Punk was yelling, I quit! Monitors were knocked down during all this. Joe was very upset and went to calm Punk down. Well, let's uh, stop there. What do you think about him lunging at Tony Khan? Yeah, I think a lot of this comes from almost nobody involved in this equation actually knowing what legitimate aggressive behavior is. They think that if you look at somebody with a stern face and say, fuck you, that's aggressive. I don't think they understand what the fuck they're looking at. And secondly, Tony Khan talking about an investigation. Apparently, he was standing right in front of it. Did he need a magnifying glass to investigate that? He, if he was involved in the room when it happened? He was standing or, in front of it, and there's a video of it, apparently. Apparently, as we've been told, there's video because there's security cameras all over Wembley. They're down Wembley Way. And also, yes, I can believe pieces of all of this. I can believe that the whiny little fucking bitch, Jack Perry thought that, as we've said, he was going to mouth off on TV and get his vent his spleen on what poor, you know, the, the, the poor beleaguering that he'd gotten from fucking punk for not doing his glass spot. And we can believe that when he came back through, punk said, do we have a problem? Where it gets sideways is, I would think, and I would believe more of the what are you going to do about it than either I was just saying something to get heat. Although, actually, I was just saying something to get heat is probably another goddamn passive-aggressive thing that they'd say, but it, well, that's because they... Heat from who? That doesn't get heat, heat from, from the who? fans. Nobody, un nobody would understand except the guy that you're trying to piss off. And it doesn't make any sense in storyline or context or anything else, so he was saying it directly to him, but then passive-aggressive, he'd say, I was just trying to get heat. Do I believe that Punk just started fucking punching him? No, because the testimony there from, you know, Pope Dave was that he didn't have a scratch on him. And I don't care, you know, Jesus Christ, whether Punk won or lost his fights in the UFC, would put Jack Perry in that fucking position and see what would have happened. The point is, if there was the shove-shove and whoever shoved who first, Punk front face locked him, which is what you do to neutralize the situation. And then I could also believe that Punk was saying, I quit. Like, what the fuck? How much more do I have to put up with from these fucking children and these fucking backstabbers and these fucking connivers and these fucking pussies that can't even fucking come out and get in my fucking face? They got to do it on camera on zero hour. Or they got to call Dave and his little lab dog, Brian. Hey, listen, a mid-card guy gets away with doing that on TV because they know the boss isn't going to do anything about it. Exactly, because everybody can get away with it because they know the boss isn't going to do anything about it. And I, again, I reflect back on CM Punk worked in the WWE for 10 fucking years. And at a, a fuller schedule than he is now. And I don't recall any lawsuits Locker room brawls, investigations, suspensions, whatever the fuck. But he's been in this fucking romper room for two years part-time. He's already been in a half dozen of them. What's the, the common factor is he ain't putting up with any shit. 
as it relates to shit coming his way and nobody at the top is doing anything about it. In his previous place of employment, if there was any shit coming up, it didn't bubble over till it came out like that, either in public until the end, in public or physically, because there was a fucking boss doing something about it. In this case, you have a boss doing nothing about it. You have a top talent who the network likes, who is paid a, like the top talent that he is. Who is being run off by the executive vice presidents of the company and their associated stooge minions that are swinging on their dicks and riding the flying squirrel of their nutsack. And I believe he's still their biggest merch mover, too. And then uh, uh, here's another thing. Who are the people giving Dave and Brian these play-by-plays, and how much more veracity is, the, is there in Dave's latest one than there was in Alvarez's Tween Punk and Miro? Well, here's the other thing. I'm not saying this is all a stooge test, but it may have become that. If you're Punk and Miro, Brody King seems to have been busy with the wall in the back, but if you're Punk and Miro, and this is happening, and now Dave's saying, one person who's not a wrestler who saw this, told me this. Alvarez is saying five people were witnesses who told me this. How many people were there? At a certain point, maybe you're figuring out who the problems are. Reporter, reporter, can you tell me a lie? You're going to find out, you're going to find out the source is Tony. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. And he's telling him different stories depending on who the last person is he talked to. He loves the drama. Because he believes everything. And he loves the drama. Even, again, recently he did an interview saying that he doesn't think it's necessarily a problem when your locker room doesn't get along. But he doesn't love the drama if he's in it because he won't be dramatic with anybody. He, if, he doesn't want anybody to be mad at him. We've heard over and over. He won't talk to anybody if he has bad news for him, either to fire him or a fucking... He's never told anybody they were suspended personally, as far as I am aware. Wasn't that all handled through legal? Does he ever tell anybody bad news? Does he ever say no? Tell him no, 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 no. Once again, the zombies, ladies and gentlemen. Colin Blumstone, Rod Argent, the other guy with the glasses. <laughs> Rod Argent. Whatever happened to him? He then did the band Argent. Well, I know that. Hold your head up. Well, the other song was God Gave Rock and Roll to You, which later Kiss covered for, I think, the uh, soundtrack of Bill and Ted 2. But that but band... But then Argent was gone. But then Argent went away. I actually saw the Zombies. They had a reu... Well, they are still reunited, but they had a their first reunion tour. They did some small venues, and uh, there was an industry function in New York City. I got to see them. Are they still losing body parts whenever they walk down the street? No, they actually have remarkable heads of hair uh, and uh, yeah. sounded pretty good. Brains. Not those zombies. Not the Sven zombies. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Sven can carry a, a decent tune when he's got Freddy Boom Boom Cannon on his side. What about that? You know, you've talked in the past about stooge tests. Could something become a stooge test inadvertently? Possibly if, if, if the person who knows what the real story was then was to make up a story and only tell it to one person and that story then got out and was repeated, then that person that was told that story flunked the stooge test. And there could be one of these floating around in there somewhere because how many different stories can we get? And generally the wilder ones and or the ones that Uncle Dave puts all the flowery language in and the supposition and the assumption and all the rest of that stuff, they're, they're a little bit ridiculous rather than the simple version, which, hey, you got a problem with me? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Ah, here you go. That's what I'm going to do about it. That's generally the way it happens. I what, got some what, breaking what? news here. Dave Meltzer reporting after the oh, incident boy. where he lunged at Tony Khan, CM Punk was seen in catering where he cut the line and lunged at a salad. <laughs> He's out of control, this CM Punk. 
And I understand that later on he was seen throwing puppies off the roof of Wembley Stadium. He must be stopped. He CM must be stopped <laughs> at all costs. All right. Hello again, friends. The great Brian Last here. You there. We're back with another special edition, a breaking news edition of whatever show this is. And of course, joining me, Mr. Jim Cornette. <laughs> tell, him, tell him what's actually going on. There's so much we're going in, on. We're in the middle of recording a podcast where we're talking about all the goddamn wrestling that they're foisting off on us this weekend alone. And this is not that podcast because we've stopped watching that wrestling and recording that podcast, the Jim Cornette experience, by the way, for those of you who are so inclined to listen, to record this podcast that can't wait because <sighs> the moral of the story, Brian, is that sometimes the bad guys win. I think back to a song that Mama Cornette used to sing to me when I was just a little boy, and I would do something that, that would flummox her, and she would be verklempt, and she would say, they're coming to take me away, ha ha, hee hee, ho ho, to the funny farm. Of course. And there's the phone ringing. <laughs> Who could this be? Wait a minute. Hello, caller, you're on the air. If you can identify our 93.5 song in the next five seconds, you'll win $5,000. They can't identify it. Oh. oh, well. Anyway, where were we? They're coming to take me away, haha. -ha. Oh, he, 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 he oh, oh, to the funny farm, yeah. All the way there. Because, yeah. <sighs> It is enough to make a person question their sanity, the things that go on in that snow globe of a wrestling company that Tony Khan, the real-life Richie Rich, has put together based on his teenage fantasies of when he apparently... I thought everybody that had a billion dollars or at least had a family that had a billion dollars could get, like, regular pussy and and jet off to the fucking Riviera and do drugs with Mick Jagger. He was sitting in his fucking basement collecting action figures and booking them. And now he's found out that with the $100 million that his dad gave him so that he could see him spend it and have fun with it before he died, that he's collected the real-life action figures and they don't just fucking do their kung fu grip when you press the fucking button on their back. They're really interacting with people like normal fucking wrestlers. And he can't handle it. And he can't control it. And now he's fucked around and dumbed himself out of his biggest star and the only one that was moving the fucking ratings. And the only one that was moving the pay-per-views. He has basically dumbed himself out of, out of the business. He's killed Chicago. They booed him like a goddamn terrorist, for fuck's sake, when he was out there on stage trying to tell those people his tale of sorrow and woe. And nobody's talking about his company doing 80,000 people anymore. They're talking about him being an idiot and fired his biggest star because he fucking front face locked a preliminary guy. Under, I don't know. I don't know if that's right the reason. I, I don't know if that's the reason. Considering we're now hearing that he lunged at Tony Khan and the statement from Tony Khan. Oh yeah, yeah. That yeah. may not be the reason that Tony Khan well, fired him. No, the reason Tony Khan fired him, and we're going to play this hostage statement that was... By the way, we should probably say that. What we're talking about here is, and we have the statement, we have a written statement and a statement you could hear, various other things, but Tony Khan, AEW, have fired CM Punk. We didn't say that yet, did we? No, we, you just went off. We just assumed that everybody would know. Because that's the only thing that anybody's talking about, about this fucking ridiculous romper room of a company. So yes, he's fired CM Punk hours before the collision at the United Center that was to set up the pay-per-view that is, as we speak tonight at the United Center, Punk's hometown. 
that he is now killed as a market for AEW when it was maybe their best one because of Punk. It was the first one. And he he makes it a couple of hours before the show on the internet and then opens the program, stood up against the green screen, reading from the teleprompter, a statement that whoever really made this decision has written out for him. And we obviously, by the wording, it's the attorneys, it's the legal staff. Also, but we know it's the AEW legal staff because the wording is fucking, the syntax is tortured and the grammar is disemboweled. But he read it like he was reading it for the first time because he didn't make this decision because it was all worded by the attorneys because they are apparently convinced in their minds that Punk is going to sue their fucking asses and they're trying to set up a defense already. I disagree with you. This is absolutely Tony's decision, but he's letting the legal team write this because of the threat of the lawsuit. We're at this point now because Tony decided this is the point. Well, so Tony finally made a decision, you think. I thought whoever really calls the shots over there is the one that would make a decision this big. Well, the one, we know the one who really calls the shots is Tony's dad, and he's not involved. Well, that's why I thought somebody may have put the fucking foot down. Or, uh, you know, I'm thinking, because Megan, you know, Megan, the head legal beagle over there, she's been involved in this since the start, because she was one of the people that burst into his locker room along with the buckaroos and their ilk and started the whole goddamn deal a year ago. And we know that Megan is close to the Bucks, not as close as she is to some of the boys. Why don't you actually She's, say your name so people know who you're talking about? The head of legal, Megan... Mega. What, it's not Megan. Mega. What's her last name? Parik. Well, I thought it was Parrot. Megan Parrot. But nevertheless, like I said, she's close to the Bucks, closer to some of the boys. Some of the boys are so close, they're almost coming out the other side of her, from what I understand. But nevertheless, that's who has been leading this charge. Is she on the, the discipline legal... committee? Well, hold on. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. She's been leading the charge. She's been the one that was screwing up contracts because she's in charge of AEW legal, trying to throw stumbling blocks in the way of bringing Punk back with messing around with the A Steel employment and et cetera. She's the one who's been trying to collect evidence for her friends, the Buckaroos, all along. And she's the one who I'm sure had a big hand, or whatever other appendage she wanted to put in, in wording this so that a jury, when the lawsuit eventually happens, will go, oh my God, Tony was so scared. Tony was so scared. The night that he saw his first fight. It was traumatizing for the boy. See, that's the biggest problem. We'll get to, there's so many different things to talk about here. CM Punk has plenty to be blamed for. The Elite had plenty to be blamed for. Jungle Boy has plenty to be blamed for. But at the end of the day, this is all Tony Khan's fault. Tony Khan could have stepped in and done something a year and a half ago. And he didn't. He could have done something before... And after All Out last year, he didn't. This all comes back to Tony Khan allowing this to happen, possibly wanting it to happen, and then not being able to deal with it when it happened. And it happened right in front of him. And he still had to do an investigation. And uh, boy, I'd like to see the written notes of all those interviews and the investigation that was, that was done by the independent legal team of who and who. Who were the independent legal people in charge of this investigation? What did this investigation consist of? And, and, do, and do they work for your father? And do they work for your father? And who's the one that interviewed Tony since apparently he was sitting close enough to be scared about the whole thing? And I, before we go into any other of what actually happened, let me just say this. And this is without hyperbole or exaggeration or comedic effect or whatever as a booker as a promoter what would i have done if i'm sitting at the gorilla position and this happens 
from the Jungle Jack Perry screaming into the camera, hey, it's real glass, cry me a river, all the way through to him coming back and the interaction with him and Punk and Punk putting a front face lock on him and knocking a bunch of shit over. Here's exactly what I would have done. I would have had somebody find me a room where I could go sit down with both of these fucking morons, whoever it may have been, and I would have said, hey, number one, you, Perry, what the fuck are you doing? We already had a goddamn issue, and I thought it was resolved over the glass spot. Now you're fucking mouthing off on camera something that none of the fans would give a shit about or understand except for if they read the newsletters, and it has nothing to do with my business except detrimentally. So what the fuck are you doing? And you knew he was going to be standing here and fucking watching it because you're a shit disturber. He's my biggest star. You're not. Now, Punk, what did he say to you to make you put the front face lock on him? Well, I asked him if we had a problem, and he fucking was a smartass to me. Okay, Perry, sounds like you're lucky that he only front face locked you instead of mashing your nose all over your face. I remind you, he's my star, and you're not. Get your shit and go to the hotel, and don't do this shit again, or I'll fire you. And punk, not only don't front face lock anybody else, but don't knock over any more of my monitors because they're expensive. Go have your fucking match. Then go back to the hotel. And then go back to the hotel. What, what the fuck? What else do you need to do? What else do, would you need to do? They're wrestlers. If you're going to run your fucking mouth about another wrestler, if the other wrestler comes and fucking does something about it, well, now we're even. It's only if the other side didn't get to do anything that we're not even and that shit's going to fester. So you ran your dick liquor and you got put in a face lock for it. I assume we're all done. Can, can one of you tell me we're not done? If the one that says we're not done, okay, then stand back up and see who can get the next fucking face lock. Otherwise, we're done. Does any of this happen if Jungle Boy doesn't send a message into the camera? No. What, wh why would Punk have, have picked that particular point if he'd have just gone out and had his match, Perry, and come back, why would Punk have picked that point to say we got a problem? Or what the fuck? Why? No, he wouldn't have. Right. <clears throat> Here's another thing. When they had the original fucking beef over the glass spot, we've already established and now Uncle Dave's trying to put out the story, oh, it was cleared by AEW. Then why did all those fucking AEW personnel come up to Punk and say, hey, this fucking little entitled ass wipe won't listen to us. Go fucking tell him what we're doing. So that happened. Do you think that Punk immediately the next day or whenever it was had to go over and say, oh, I got to go tell every journalist, every reporter, every news outlet what I had to do to stop dickhead here from going through a fucking windshield the other day no because it was a insignificant part of his fucking life and he didn't give a shit there was no reason for him to go so who how did the story get out story got out from whiny boy whining to his other whiny little bitch friends who then whined to their little bitch friendly reporters well we don't know how this story got out there do you the original the punk, original glass story i'm not saying it's punk but we don't know where story. But we don't know where. How else does it get out? It didn't come from Punk's point I'm making. It is, then it, if it didn't come from Perry, it came from the other people that are goddamn fed up with dealing with Perry. And once they say, Jesus Christ, we had to go get Punk to tell him not to do this shit. The point is, in every room right now, in AEW specifically, but maybe even WWE, someone's immediately running and texting someone to tell them their perspective of what's happening or their view of what's happening. Or the view they want people in the public to have of what's happening. Or the view that benefits them. Yeah. So that's, again, if Perry hadn't fucking mouthed off and just gone and done his garbage pre-show match, then nothing would have happened. And if nothing would have happened, 
then Punk would be on the pay-per-view tonight in the United Center in Chicago and people wouldn't be fucking all over Twitter and all over Chicago and all over the wrestling world going, Tony Khan is a fucking dickless pussy. He's brought this on himself. And I said at the top of the thing, sometimes the bad guys win. It's actually, it's a win for everybody except the fans and Tony. Punk doesn't have to put up with these fucking children anymore. He's old, he's tired, he's hurt, and he works with children. Well, he don't have to fucking work with children, and he don't have to get hurt anymore from working with the children. He'll still be old, and maybe he'll get better sleep. So he's going to improve his situation. And now the buckaroos and the Camp Cucamonga and all of the friends and relatives know that they can do anything they want. They can wipe their feet. They can wipe their ass with Tony Khan. And it doesn't matter what's best for business. It's just what they want. And as a result, the the talent that AEW will be signing heretofore will be one of two categories. Either the Chris Jericho category, I'm going to, on the downhill side of my career, bilk this billionaire for a ton of fucking money. Or the guys who have no, they want to be on TV and they want to play with their friends and they have no choice and they're going to fucking, but the guys who are in the prime of their career, the Cody's who already left, any young talent from the WWE that's been used in any fashion that has any kind of name, that has any kind of future in wrestling, that could be potentially a draw for AEW, they don't want to go there because the buckaroos and I don't know if Kenny's even in on this. I think he's too much of a wishy-washy douchebag to even be mean to people. But the buckaroos and the hangnail and all of their ilk, if you're a bigger star than they are, if you're a better talent than they are, well, there's a lot of those, if you're a more serious wrestler than they are, they don't want you around because they don't want anybody bringing any level of professionalism into that goddamn daycare center. But that's not the thing that keeps people away because they get along with enough people that there are people that would go there. And even the people that they don't get along with, there's other people to work with. I think what you may see keeping people away, people who have options, let's put it that way, yeah. not people who are waiting for any offer they get, is Tony. Because we talked about it early on. There have been episodes like the one we're witnessing right now where it really explodes and people see it. But from the very beginning, there have been structure issues with AEW, management issues with AEW, lack of leadership with AEW. Quite frankly, the guy who owns the company or partially owns it with his dad wants to party with the wrestlers and be pals with the wrestlers and hang out with the wrestlers and then book the wrestlers. But that doesn't necessarily mean he wants to be a boss, and he can't be. So you have... Something where you may make a lot of money and have some great moments like Wembley and then the next week you can go and play a half-empty room in Chicago or you go to WWE. At least there's structure. You'll get frustrated, but you kind of know the order of things. In AEW, it's just chaos and it's a mess. The CM Punk issues may die down now. That doesn't mean the AEW issues are going to die down. No. And and he was just the lightning rod because when you when you have these and you know the buckaroos are the classic K. Hey, you're gonna look at Maddie's face, old pie face, the smarmy, self indulgent little fucking grin that he has on his face. They're convinced that they are revolutionary talents in this business in their minds. And then you've got a guy like Punk who. <laughs> has absolutely no patience for bullshit and is not going to let somebody get away with saying or doing anything to him if he can do anything about it, which I admire. And they're fucking polar opposites. And then they've been setting this up because now we find out that there was supposed to be a meeting. Another in-person meeting was scheduled with Punk and the elite to settle the issues right before Wembley and guess who canceled it? The Elite at the last minute. That, that story has come out now. Jim, I have an article here. House of Wrestling, Nick Houseman, 
You have to wonder if the Nick Houseman business may be going down now that CM Punk's out of AEW. But here's the article. CM Punk and the Elite meeting was canceled days before AEW All-In exclusive. CM Punk was terminated by All Elite Wrestling today following an internal investigation into a backstage altercation between him and Jack Perry at AEW All-In London. His termination from the company comes just a few days before the one-year anniversary of his infamous AEW All-Out media scrum. <laughs> Wait, I don't know about the summer of punk, but the ending of every summer becomes the summer of punk. Le- the Labor Day of punk is fucking great. Where he denied rumors he held Colt Cabana back in AEW and took aim at the elite, who he perceived as not capable of leading the company. Following the scrum, punk, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, and others were involved in a locker room brawl that resulted in those holding titles being stripped of them, and all included being taken off TV. In the months since, tensions between the elite camp and CM Punk's have remained frosty, at best. While Punk has been open to clearing the air, he has been told by lawyers that no communication is welcome. Yeah, remember when he tried to, uh, what did old Twinkle Toes? Yeah. He tried to uh, send out a message to him and got uh, a message back from legal. Don't try to talk to Kenny. And not like a message like, hey, I'm going to kick your ass. A message like, hey, when can we talk? Yeah. House of Wrestling has learned that a sit down with the relevant members of the elite, CM Punk, and Tony Khan was scheduled to take place last week ahead of AEW All In London but was called off at the last minute by the elite's camp. From what we understand, it was going to take place in Atlanta, and Tony Khan would have been present. The summit was intended to bury the hatchet between both sides, ahead of the historic AEW pay-per-view, and the cancellation of it appears to have added to Punk's overall frustrations with the situation heading into the event. This is interesting, because... The timeline we were previously given for the incident where he didn't have anyone at the airport to get him was that he flew from Atlanta to spend a day with his wife and dog and then flew to London. So that means that Atlanta trip, which we assumed was him filming Heels, he was supposed to meet with Tony and the Elite there. And and this is this is also so perfect because we uh we recounted the problem he had when he landed there, he had nobody to pick him up. The car was not there that was supposed to be there. The number he was given for the car bounced back. He had to t- he couldn't get Ubers in fucking London with a weekend of Wembley. He had to take the fucking tube train where he got lost and fans were helping him find his hotel. This follows him going to Atlanta for a meeting with these yahoos for them to call it off. No wonder he went home, spent a couple of minutes with his wife and dog. And have you seen this? Now some of our, uh, the better detectives are on, on Twitter and on the internet, the fans, instead of the investigators Tony has, they have found out the guy who apparently does the travel for AEW, the, the car services and the, the planes and the pickups and the transportation. He's a goddamn Young Buck Jock Sniffer. He has pictures on his social media of him dressed up with the posing with the the young buckaroos, and he's one of their disciples. Listen, if you want to talk about people who work behind the scenes in AEW, a lot of them are. Yes. And that's why the place is a fucking mess. Yeah, my wife can handle the merchandise for a nationally televised wrestling promotion. Hey, how about my buddy that picks me up in his pinto? He can handle transportation. Give him a couple hundred grand a year. He'll do it. You fucking moron, Tony. You have been bilked, hornswoggled, taken, shystered, canoodled. So they set this up. They send him to Atlanta for a meeting. Then they cancel it. Then they fly him across to fucking England. And they stick him at the airport with no transportation. Then he gets lost on the goddamn subway. Then he goes to the biggest show of all time and he has to sit there and watch some fucking curly headed fucking entitled little prick mouth off on him on television while he's standing there. 
What'd you think he was going to do? I'm surprised he didn't football kick Tony in the fucking pussy. <laughs> God damn it. And Tony is not even smart enough to see what his own little fucking minions did under his nose. And because Tony has only in his wildest dreams ever been a part of a wrestling locker room and his fantasies, he sees a fucking skirmish and he sees a guy get front face locked. He's like, oh my God. He wasn't really, even Tony couldn't have been scared for his life. That's lawyer speak. That's verbiage. They're setting it up. They know something's going to court. They're trying to give Tony some kind of defense. In the process, they don't realize that they have outed Tony Khan to the, I don't know how many there still are, wrestling fans that are actually grown to fucking adults that want to see men fight instead of kids play. They've outed Tony that he's a pussy. How can you be scared for your fucking life? Oh my God. As a matter of fact, we haven't even got to that. The uh, Tony's little statement that he made on collision that was written for him by the attorneys, uh, that's my favorite part. That was, when I saw that, I tweeted it. I said, I, in, in 50 years, in a business filled with hyperbole and exaggeration, I don't know that I have ever heard one sentence so filled with more of a metric fuck ton of complete bullshit than the one I heard tonight from Tony Khan's lips. I was scared for my life. Well, Jim, we'll play the audio in a second, but I do want to say I disagree with you. I think Tony could have been legitimately scared. How many times in Tony's life do you think he's ever actually been punched in the face? Okay, well, then they've outed him as a big pussy. But I'm serious. Okay, here, but here's the thing. He's in a small but crowded environment at the gorilla position. There are other people around. Even if Punk lunged at him, he's open. He's got nothing in his hand. What's he going to do? Hit Tony with the goddamn open palm death strike that the Chinese kung fu masters killed Bruce Lee with? How's he going to fucking kill him that quick? It's not, about, it's not about reason. If Tony wasn't the son of a billionaire... And afforded oh, I, all, I thought you were going to say son of a something else. No, no. And afforded all the privileges that he has. The football team, the NFL football team, AEW, his analytics business, all these various things. He'd be at home on the computer all day on wrestling message boards. Because he's in social situations and he's socially awkward, that doesn't mean he would be that person if he didn't have all the money floating him. So when you look at him and you think, oh, he shouldn't be concerned about this and other, he is, in a lot of ways, you know, we make fun of all the Bixes out there. He's kind of one of them. So the reaction to any violence anywhere near them, I could see, who knows, but I could see him having a little bit of a meltdown because I doubt Tony Khan's ever been punched in the face. And I doubt Tony Khan wants anything to do with a fight, whether he's in it or not. Do you disagree with that assessment? I get, you know, when you lay it out like that, I mean, obviously it's lawyer speak because he wouldn't word it this way, but maybe he no. told him, oh, I was so scared. It's and they say, hey, that's good. Write it down. It's absolutely lawyer speak. And again, right before this is when it all of a sudden leaked out. We have not even released the clip yet. That's how soon this has happened from the story that he lunged at Tony Khan. That story just came out a day before all of this. So again, all the timing of all these things is yeah, always but interesting. The question is, when, this, when all these other stories came out the day of and the lunging was left until six days later, did, did somebody just think, hey, lunge would be a good word, instead of him turning around and pointing his finger and going, this is your fucking fault, I quit. Take this company and shove it up your ass. Is that a lunge? What is a lunge? Because a lunging, like if you told me someone lunged at someone in my eyes, if I closed my eyes and thought about it, it's kind of what you described as goozling someone. I'm going for their throat. Yes. You're going to get them like that. That's lunging at them, not taking a step in their direction yelling. Yes, I, I would go for a full-on crossbody as a lunge. <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> Off the I'm table? Lunging. Yeah, okay. yeah, over the table or whatever the fuck. 
and again, important note, all of this apparently is on video. And I believe the UK laws, if Punk wanted to, he can get it and release it. So whatever is out there that happened is on video, and the parties involved can let us all see it if they wanted to. But I mean, you know, and here's another thing. It's it's another example of if Tony would be that frightened by anything like that happening, and he has been a wrestling fan for this long, and he never dreamed anything like this would happen. He's he's taken a job he's not prepared to do because he's not mentally or emotionally equipped for it. And yeah, it's hey, the first fifty or sixty times that some of the fans punched me in the face or fucking came after me or fucking bloodied my nose or gave me a black eye or goddamn I was drugged down onto the ground while the cops were trying to pull everybody apart. That's frightening. But that was not people that I knew personally that I was paying millions of dollars to that I employed in a company that I'm the fucking owner of. I wouldn't have been that scared in that situation. It was random, strange people, probably drunk, that I didn't know that were trying to kill me not having a fight in my general area. And again, nails lunged at Vince McMahon. They were in a room by themselves. Damage could be done. This CM Punk Tony Khan alleged lunging, if that's what we're going to call it. Samoa Joe was there. I guess Jack Perry would have still been there. Whoever well, now, the f- come on, are you, are you asking... I wouldn't help if if the only person attacking me was Harley Quinn, I wouldn't rely on Jack Perry for help. Just in terms of how many people were there, at least five sources, right? Brian Alvarez said five sources who saw the thing said this. So there's a bunch of people there. I wonder if he was counting people or the number of eyeballs. So that way each person gets two. So, I mean, that's the thing. How scared was Tony? And like you said, I think he probably could have been really scared because I think any sort of violence at all would scare him. I don't think he's ever had any sort of conflict like that in his life. He's not prepared for it. But with that said, we have a written statement and we have the statement that was released on Collision. Should we just play the audio? What do you think? I, th- I think the, the written statement is a little dry. The audio is, is what's, to me, so entertaining. So, Jim, a couple weeks ago, with everything that happened with Cash Wheeler, people tuned into AEW Collision, and there was no reference of it. Things just continued on and still have on AEW TV. This time with this, this being such a big story, and word breaking, the statement was issued, I believe, 4.33 p.m. And and, and by the way, he uh, also broke precedent because there was never anything mentioned on television about the first brawl last year. It was never discussed, ever. He never named who were suspended, right? He just said the champions, their titles are vacant. Yeah, so this is breaking precedent on advice of his legal team preparing for war. So less than four hours before this is when the statement went out on Twitter and through various social media sources, I assume. But here is the way AEW Collision on TNT opened up. Today I had to make one of the toughest decisions of my professional career. Today, I terminated Phil Brooks, CM Punk, for cause. This stems from a backstage incident at AEW All In last Sunday. The incident was regrettable, and it endangered people backstage. That includes the production staff, the people who helped put the show on every week, innocent people who had nothing to do with it. I've been going to wrestling shows for over 30 years. I've been producing them on this network for nearly four years. Never. In all that time, have I ever felt until last Sunday that my security, my safety, my life was in danger (laughs) at a wrestling show. I don't think anybody should feel that way at work. I don't think the people I work with should feel that way. And I had to make a very difficult choice today. It came at the recommendation of a discipline committee here in AEW, (laughs) as well as outside legal counsel who delivered a unanimous recommendation and i have followed up on that recommendation i'm sorry to any fans who are upset by this i'm sorry to anyone who's upset by this despite that we're going to have a great show tonight on collision and we're going to have a great aew all-out pay-per-view tomorrow here in chicago last weekend was the greatest weekend in aew history this is the greatest week in aew history we're going to continue the great momentum here tonight on collision and tomorrow night on all out pay-per-view well there's the uh the hey, statement take a drink every time he uses the word cause or the word great and in 90 seconds you'll be crocked 
Well, cause was certainly put there by the lawyer, so over and over again he's saying he had a reason to fire CM Punk. Yeah, and, and that, that's what, for cause, uh, is a, a term that can be used legally. It's like, he's the one that fucked up, we had to do it, right? But that's, that's our defense. And... Now Go ahead. I was going to say, Tony also tried to give a very similar statement in front of the live audience in Chicago at the United Center, and very similar phrasing. Obviously, there were terms and phrases that he was either told to memorize or told to say or remembered from the cue cards. I don't know. But instead of 90 seconds, because he wasn't reading it off the teleprompter, it took him about six minutes also because the people were booing him out of the building like the hunter that killed Bambi's mother. And he sat down in a chair, and I believe it was six minutes in total. Six minutes of that while the people were booing him. Like Spalding Gray with no self-awareness. It, and first of all, the discipline committee, not even the disciplinary committee, but the discipline committee. AEW has a discipline committee. First, we've all heard of it. Has anybody ever been disciplined before? And who is on this discipline committee that made this unanimous recommendation? Is it Megan? Is it Maddie? Is it Nikki? Is it Jack Perry is on the discipline committee? Who knows who it is? Because there isn't one. They made it up for this occasion. And <laughs> then he said, I feared for my, not only I feared for my life, but my production people, the production, like Punk was back there with a goddamn hockey stick, waving it over his head like a helicopter blade screaming, I'm going to take all you motherfuckers with me. He snatched a fucking jer jerk and put a face lock on him. How is that going to harm the production people? Which of the production people has he been known to threaten or been uh, observed threatening? Did he pull some type of projectile firing implement out from his tights and was firing at random rubber bands or fucking those little discs he used to shoot out of the plastic guns or whatever the case and say it was going to put somebody's eye out? The only production person we ever heard that got maybe a minor injury was that guy Topher in the original All Out locker room brawl. He was the guy in there. No one ever named him or anything, but he got, I think, like some... Scratches, maybe. So the point of what in the fuck? It's like that he's talking about a full-scale gang fight. Nobody was going to get hurt that wasn't involved in it. Tony may have been scared, but I don't really think that Punk would have knocked him out. I think he would have told him off, flipped him off. Because this is all Tony's fault. Again, to go back to that. Whether Punk is right or wrong about any of these things, or whether you agree with him or not, it's all Tony's fault. Tony allowed all this to happen. He let it all fester. He wanted it to happen at times. And if you're frustrated coming off a week where... I'm just thinking about how I would feel if I was Punk. The meeting's canceled. The meeting that potentially could lead to... Company, not saving, but company some boosting business. Some resolution. Resolution of the issue. Resolution and also potentially something great for the company, quite frankly. That gets canceled at the last minute. You fly to London, you think there's going to be someone there for you, there's no one there for you. Turns out someone who's friends with the Young Bucks runs that department. Interacts with a lot of fans on the way there, no one's had a bad story about that. You get there, you're a gorilla. You're watching the monitor, because what else are you going to do? You talk to Samoa Joe a little bit, you guys know what you're going to do. You're watching the monitor, and there's Jack Perry looking right into the fucking camera, <laughs> saying, Real glass, cry me a river. You're like, what the fuck? Right then and there, if I'm CM Punk, that's when I turn to Tony and say, what the fuck? Seriously. He may have. He may have. We don't know about that part, because would he have gone over and leaned down with Tony on with his headset on, and what he said, what the fuck is this fucking little jerk doing? Because it's not just about Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy's a part of their locker room. Yeah. He's one of their, their prime stooges. If anything happens, he's on the fucking he phone. He's texting Kenny right away. Yeah. So the question becomes, why did he feel comfortable enough in doing that? Or to do that? They know how volatile CM Punk is. We all know that. Whether you take his side or not, you kind of know what to expect. 
you had to know what to expect if you were Jack Perry. He felt comfortable enough to do that because he knew whose locker room he was going to be in. And, you know, basically, again, Tony's sitting there. Tony should have been meeting. If Punk called it to Tony's attention, let's say Tony was at the monitor but didn't see that particular thing. Somebody else is whispering at him. If Punk called, called his attention to it, Tony should have been the first one to meet Jack Perry coming through. But he's not going to do that because he's not going to fucking tell anybody when they do something wrong. And if, if Tony saw it, then he should have been the first one. But same thing. So it's left again to Punk to go, all right, this little fucking prick. Not even a goddamn guy that allegedly is being presented on my level, but just some mid-card fucking goof that thinks he's hot. I'm surprised he didn't just fucking drop him when he came through. By the way, I'm watching now. I had not seen this. You retweeted it, actually. Very Shawn Michaels 1997-esque. After Collision went off the air, the Young Bucks went out for a victory lap? Yes, I... Somebody in Chicago? Tweet, <laughs> yeah, somebody tweeted that. That here, It's apropos of this is how CM Punk's run in AEW ends with the Young Bucks taking a victory lap in an empty building. Do you agree... <sighs> because of a variety of circumstances from all parties that this is the best outcome. This is the right thing right now for everyone. Yes. Because as I said, sometimes the bad guys win, they got what they wanted. Tony's too feckless to do anything about it, but at least punk doesn't have to put up with these fucking people anymore. And he can move on to, whether it's the Survivor Series or the Royal Rumble or whatever, the, the termination with cause, we have to investigate whether there's any non-compete as a result of that or whether that may be tied up in court or whatever. But he can go on because now he's the hottest wrestler in the business as far as people talking about him. And he can translate the momentum that he had and the news that he made and the the attention that he got on WWE television in front of a much larger audience into more money. And he will not be having locker room fights with goddamn people because they don't do that there. Because they know who's running the fucking show and it won't be him or anybody he's fighting with. But as long as they give him, I would think, the in, the level of input that they give the Cody's and the Romans and the whoever the fuck else. Then Eddie's got history with Heyman. I don't know how they are these huh. days. I mean, you can't do it with Heyman because he's with uh, Roman Reigns, but he well, got he got fired with cause. So let's play with the idea that he's. But free. hold on, I didn't mean with Heyman. No, no, no. I know, I know, I know. But, I know. Okay. But what I was going to say is, if it was with Heyman, it'll be perfect. But you can't, let's just say if it happened right now, you couldn't really do it this way. But if he was fired with cause, I wish Bobby Heenan was here. You just have someone show up at the end of Raw and say, I have here the championship of the real world the champion. The real world champion. He never lost that belt. The real world champion, CM Punk. But, the, but that's what it's, it's, it's better for Punk because he just needs to move on and, and do two years in with the big boys. And he doesn't have to put up with all that bullshit anymore. It's better for the buckaroos and their ilk because they don't have somebody that's going to show them up and get in their way and stop them from doing the stupid things that they do and or just show that they're not the big names in the company. The only people that it's detrimental to are Tony for all the business reasons and us and all the fans because now we can't even watch a good show on Saturday night. Are we that, still going to watch Collision? I don't know whether anybody's still going to watch Collision. Because it was think, rough. It was rough this past week. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Let's give it two or three weeks to see if it turns into Rampage, and we'll know by then. But it, and we'll all, it'll also be interesting to see if they're applying their Wednesday formula to Saturday, the Saturday program that's been holding its audience, will that happen, or will the same thing happen does on Wednesday? They go, okay, I've seen... 45 minutes or an hour of this fucking same old shit, I can leave now. We'll see what happens to their numbers and to their patterns and to the quality, which we already are 
seeing. But it, it penalizes the fans and it penalizes us that has to watch it. But it's best for everybody that was making money out of the situation. <laughs> Maybe Punk could run his own show in Chicago. He can call it Somewhat In. Ooh, I like that. Or how about this? He could do two shows every year. One is See Him In, and the other one is See Him Out. Well, I guess they're going to have to take place Labor Day weekend if we go based on his prior successes with these events. That would be the one where he sees him out. Any final thoughts on this? I mean, it's been such a crazy turn of events. Every time something happened, another thing was reported. Every time you talk about that, another thing happened. It was snake bit from the start, and they knew what they could do. They knew that they could get away with anything because of Tony. Um, and they, I mean, the, the, the Cucamonga kids, the lollipop guild, they didn't want him there to begin with their good friend, Cole Cabana. Oh, Cole Cabana, Cole Cabana. And they have sabotaged this since the start. It didn't help. The, it had helped them that Punk got injured because he was gone. The first time he was gone for a while. And if you're out of sight, out of mind, but he comes back and he's still bigger than they are. So. They've been engineering this ever since, and they finally got their way. And, you know, that's basically that Tony Khan is going to go down in history as a guy that spent more money than anybody's ever had before, or even close to before, to start a wrestling promotion, had all these gifts given to him in terms of the right context and, and time for Wembley Stadium and the TV with TBS because now they're starving for viewers and the whole nine yards. And he ends up looking like the star of a German Bukaki flick after all the guys get finished with him. This is Gordon Scazzari times a hundred. Gordon Scazzari spent a million dollars. Tony spent a hundred. And I was, when they had Gordon Scazzari just had a goddamn pack of checks in his hand with no register and no checkbook, just writing guys checks and tearing them off as quick as he could that night. I, I witnessed it. I said, I got to get out of here and never see any of these people again. And it's the same thing 30 years later with a guy with a hundred times more money. And it's, so there you go. Well, there you go, and this has been a special edition. We're going to drop this as a special episode and get right back to recording the episode we were recording. As all this happened, there are still about nine pay-per-views this weekend and a multitude of events to watch, but I think we can close the doors on the CM Bunk Bunk, the CM Punk <laughs> beat for the week, or the weekend. I don't know. I think he's going to flip. I think he's going to be out there throwing puppies off the top of the United Center. He's in Chicago, isn't he? Well, he, he has a home there. They're in Chicago. I'm, I'm thinking I'm, he's going to have a sack of a dozen puppies, and he's going to climb to the top of the United Center and start throwing them down to see if he can hit the fucking bucks. Hey, one last question for you before we wrap this up. Based on the limited feedback you've seen already on social media and whatever you've seen in your emails, the people who didn't like CM Punk, the fans I'm talking, who were just all about the Bucks, or maybe just not about the drama, whatever it was, they didn't want CM Punk there. Do you think they're as happy as the fans who feel disappointed and upset with either Tony's decision-making or what Collision now is or the promise of AEW, whatever it is? Are the people happy that Punk is gone happier? than how upset the people or disappointed the people who are disappointed are. I don't know. I don't think so. Me I, neither. Me neither. I, because a lot of people, um, you know, uh, obviously the, the buckaroo bonsais out there didn't want punk and they're happy he's gone, right? And he was the root of all evil and, oh my God, he let violence solve something in the wrestling business. All that, whatever. But there are so many people now that even if they were on the fence or whatever, this statement and Tony, if, if, if most of their audience, I would think is male and every adult male is good. You were scared for your life, dude. Seriously. 
and the discipline committee, and just that Tony comes off like such a putz. He's a wishy-washy, no bass in his voice, you know, distracted-looking fucking guy. I'm sure he, you know, he's very nice and friendly. But a lot of people are making fun of him now because, it's, again, scared for your life, and a discipline committee, and... Let's see the video. Here's something else. The, he did not tell what the incident was. He made it sound like, I don't know if Punk might not have a case for slander, because when he made it sound like that people were scared for their lives legitimately and production people were in jeopardy, it sounds like he pulled out a goddamn assault rifle. It nope. sounds like there was chaos going on. It sounds like he's telling Punk's lawyers all the various people that need to be sat down and talked to in a deposition is what he sounds like. Yes, but but what I'm saying is you, the viewer that didn't read the internet will think, my God, what did this crazy man do? It sounded so ridiculous. Or it sounded so over the top. So a lot of people are making fun of Tony because I was scared for my life and it just he's just such such a Casper milk toast motherfucker. A lot of people are pissed off that this couldn't be handled or settled. A lot of people are, oh, wait a minute. If you have, think about this. They have backstage attacks three or four times on every program and nothing ever happens. And they never even get mentioned again sometimes. But this time, the biggest star in the company that a couple hundred thousand people are, are tuning in to see, the owner comes out and says, they got to fight backstage. I had to fire him. We were all scared for our lives. Goddamn, show me that on the show then. It must have been better than the shit you show me normally. It None of it makes any sense to a variety of people. Grown adult men think Tony Khan is a pussy and a coward. Uh, fans who wanted to watch for CM Punk or just wanted to watch for a goddamn decent wrestling show are disheartened and disgusted. And everybody looks like a complete idiot. They made bigger news than drawing 80,000 people to Wembley Stadium, and nobody even saw it. How stupid do you have to be to do that? And this is why WWE doesn't take Tony Khan personally seriously. Bingo, the kid. That's what I've been saying all along. And that's why six months into this thing, the WWE stopped offering everybody a fucking fortune not to go because they saw what it was and they saw who he was. And they said, okay, we've been through this before and it was a stiffer fight then. We got nothing to worry about. How big will Cody versus Punk be in WWE? It'll be ginormous. Those two promos, are you kidding? I, I can't. Who else can the WWE bring in that will cause more stir and draw more attention and provide us with a little, uh, any more entertaining promos in the wrestling world today than CM Punk? That's uh, Hulk Hogan. Or, or maybe Shibata and his missing brain. He, it's not missing. Again, we have to go through this. He has the brain. All right. So Shibata comes in and brings the brain in a box or a wheelbarrow or whatever. It's in his head. It was returned to his head. It was returned to him. I'm sorry. I forgot. It was overdue. They had to pay a uh, overdue fee. But yeah, who else, who else in the world of wrestling? I'm, I'm just going to, this yeah. is my comment. Who else in the world of wrestling can the WWE bring in to legitimately do big business with and try to make money with and not some past their prime broken down Japanese legend or some indie darling that everybody's going to turn their nose up and fart at. And the answer right now in this environment is CM Punk. Well, we will see what happens. There's some background noise. I apologize for that, but we weren't supposed to be recording today and we won't be recording much longer. This is the special edition update. CM Punk fired F I R E D as they say in professional wrestling. But until, I guess, the experience... Until somebody else gets fired, we're going to go back to doing the show we were doing a while ago, and the experience will come out before you know it. That's right, or before someone knows it. But for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! They had about 10,000 people in the place because it was a pay-per-view, and the tickets went on sale months ago. 
And when with AEW running the Chicago United Center, one would imagine that everybody that bought a ticket, whether they bought it for him or not, pretty much assumed they were going to be seeing CM Punk. Would you think that's not the case, Brian? I would think anyone who bought a ticket within the last two months minus the last week thought that CM Punk was going to be there and more than likely in one of the featured matches. Yes, and then they find out the day before that he's not going to be, and there was a smaller crowd for Saturday night for Collision. They weren't happy. And then they have 10,000 people come and see. You heard what they did before the pay-per-view when everybody was coming in, right, with the shirts? I've seen several reports of this, and it seems so ridiculous that I almost, like, I want visual confirmation. It just seems preposterous in Chicago with all of this happening that they'd be confiscating shirts or signs. Well, they, they, weren't, they weren't able to take people's shirts away. They were confiscating the signs. But if you came with a CM Punk sign, they would take it away. And if you came wearing a CM Punk t-shirt, they would make you turn it inside out or deny you entry to the building. And think about this, on that whole pay-per-view in Chicago, in the United Center, and this is the hottest topic, not only in the company, but in wrestling, did you see a CM Punk t-shirt? I thought I did. I actually thought I saw a few. That's why I was surprised when I saw these reports come out. I didn't, you didn't see any CM Punk signs, did you? Except for the one guy in the front row that said, Tony Khan cured cancer. They made sure to leave that one. No, there was another sign I saw... I don't know if it was Collision, I thought it was the pay-per-view, it said, Cry Me a River, and then someone, it almost looked like they wrote in after the fact, CM Punk, maybe because they couldn't get the sign in if it said CM Punk. But I don't know, I mean, that's, that's it. he's you their biggest no merch Punk mover, signs. he's their biggest merch mover, I believe, up until, you know, they fired him, I'm guessing they can't sell his merch anymore. But, you know, WWF got killed in the Observer by those readers years ago for when they would make people who showed up in a Four Horsemen shirt like, you had to switch that shirt. You could not sit within camera view in a Crockett promotion shirt. And that's what Tony Khan's doing now. Well, except, I'm sure Except now they're his own shirts. That's the funniest yeah. part. Well, now it's going to be, in the, in the Observer, it's going to be, oh, he was just trying to keep the peace amongst the locker room by letting, not letting the fans stir stuff up or some shit. But anyway, so they thought they might be safe. Well, Jim, speaking of athletes, we have some AEW news that we should get to here. Word has oh, come yes. out overnight. <laughs> in a surprise move, Tony Khan and AEW have announced that Ace Steel has been promoted. Vice <laughs> President of Talent Development, they're giving him a facility in Florida to train people. <laughs> I'm shocked by this, but what an interesting move. Uh, well, in a, in a bizarro world where actually AEW is the bizarro world. So in the bizarro world of AEW, where everything is normal, that would probably be what is happening. Uh, but in actual fact, what they did was they fired him. And apparently the, the, again, we all know the history of this, so we'll try not to go into granular detail. But after the brawl for all last September was settled to everyone's tenuous grasp on satisfaction, where that it was agreed that Punk would come back and he'd be going over on Saturday night, and the little fucking Cowards would be still over on Wednesday night so that nobody got scared. A Steel was supposed to be coming back to Saturday nights to collision to be Punk's producer as he was before he was Punk's producer. Guys had 25, maybe 30 years experience in the wrestling business. So what the hell, right? Why not make him a producer since he's been around the business longer than most of those fuckers have been alive? And then, when Punk was about to come back, and they were about to announce the Saturday night show, we all remember the brouhaha, when after they had gone through all the trouble of negotiating another deal with A. Steel, to put him in the, in the back of the producer's position, to give him back pay for the time that he was unceremoniously fired beforehand for defending his friend and wife, and everything was fine and everything was going to be swell and this was going to be the deal and that's what Punk was told and that's what Steele was told. 
Then you'll recall that at the last minute, A. Steele's contract was screwed up. Wonder who was in charge of AEW Legal would be in charge of executing these contracts and making sure that they matched the deals that Tony Khan had made with these people. I wonder well, what in the world, because AEW Legal's a crack staff. We know that. A number of their staff is cracked. Well, also HR would be involved because for an employee to come back or an employee to be hired, you would need human resources involved. Yes. So why couldn't all this be translated properly that they were about to announce the big debut of Collision and suddenly they're trying to fuck a steal around on his deal and Punk says, well, I ain't going. And they have to get past all of that and get everything settled again. And then as soon as they make the deal, still... And still, they were basically ended up with, they gave A. Steele his job back, but said, you can't do it. We'll pay you for it, and that's your job, but you have to work from home because people don't want you around because of all of the backstage brawls that you've been involved in in your 30 years in wrestling, all one of them. They were scared of him, so they were paying him to work from home. You can't be a wrestling producer from home. And again, they were lied to and misrepresented to, and still Punk finally agreed to come back and try to save that fucking sinking ship. And Steele agreed to fucking work from home. <sighs> you know, we and we talked about for four fucking years. Tony wouldn't fire anybody. The the he had wrestlers without all of their proper god-given appendages he wouldn't fire him he had the worst wrestlers of the indie scene that couldn't even be shown on television he'd pay him for two three years he wouldn't fire him now in a space of a week he not only fires the biggest star he's had the whole time he's been running this fucking joint but how do you fire a steel over this by the way he's a steel's a steel's now been fired twice by aew he's the iron yes. sheik of aew and, and again, they just gave him his job back. They just said, okay, you're back. We're paying you. You work for the company. You're going to do something. You can't come to TV, but you're going to do something. This deal has been made. And A. Steel wasn't in London. A. Steel didn't front face like Jungle Boy. A. Steel wasn't even there. It was punk, punk, front face locked him. But all of us, as soon as now they feel brave enough that as soon as they get rid of the evil CM Punk, this guy who had put up with everything else that they'd fucking done to him and was fucking making him sit at home and not do the what he was supposed to do and the time that he was maligned publicly because he was helping his wife and his friend and then as soon as they feel like, okay, Punk's gone, now we can just fire him again. He didn't do anything new. If you gave him his job back a little while ago, well, he ain't done anything else. He wasn't even there. They're just liars and fucking backstabbers. Not Tony, the people really running his company. The fucking legal team and, and her buckaroos. I'm sorry, I'm just cranky today. No, I mean, that's the big thing. If Ace Steel was rehired and hasn't done anything, he hasn't interacted with anyone, he hasn't been there to cause trouble, whatever job they're asking him to do, I'm assuming, I'm assuming he's doing it, that it's not just a, we'll pay you to stay home kind of thing. What did he do to be fine? And, you know, it's now being reported, it's public, and we had heard this, at least I had, beforehand, that Tony Khan was about to open a wrestling school or a maybe not a school, but just a place to train people. Training facility. With Ace Steel. That Ace Steel was either going to run it or be the top trainer or something. And then all of a sudden that all changed. So. Because he spent quite a bit of time around Harley Race's wrestling school. And he spent quite a bit of time around various different training programs. So that would have been, a, once again, something they need over there. But here's the problem. You can imagine that the buckaroos and their ilk 
don't want somebody training people how to be professional wrestlers because it wouldn't involve gymnastics and trampolines. So there's, oh God, last thing we want is another bunch of guys that can outwork us. So, you know, I'm sure they were highly against that to begin with, just from a uh, philosophical standpoint. But again, you know, it, it, the only people he has ever fired are his biggest star and his biggest star's producer twice. One time for fucking retaliating and coming in and making a save, and the second time for sitting at home minding his own business. You know, he fired Jimmy Havoc and well deserved. Oh, I forgot. Well, I no, forgot. no, but well deserved. How come he didn't fire Excalibur for choking out Jimmy Havoc in front of him? That <laughs> happened in front of Tony Khan. He wasn't afraid of his life then. I forgot. He he's already seen a choke out. Well, he was probably too drunk at night. He doesn't remember it though. Well, he likes to hang out with the boys, you know. He's one of them. He considers himself one of them. But anyway, so that it's a sad state of affairs now that, again, this guy is not even hardly two weeks removed from running the biggest attended wrestling event of all time, and the only thing people are talking about about his company is who he's firing. And as, as a matter of fact, more people are talking about who he's firing than watching his television program, we talked earlier about the collision ratings plummeting off the edge of a cliff. Our YouTube clip talking about Tony firing CM Punk did more downloads than viewers of the show where Tony announced it to begin with. Because everybody's talking about, and by the way, I got the numbers as of as of yesterday afternoon, 412,000 to 345,000. But the point is, everybody's talking about who AEW is Just fired, on YouTube, but, just on YouTube. And, and that's just on YouTube, by the way. But nobody's actually going to AEW to fucking hear it from the source. They're, everybody's talking about them rather than watching them, for fuck's sake. We beat Rampage, too, by the way. But that's part of the problem. The drama around AEW is more interesting than everything they have on TV. And it has been for at least a couple of years. Nothing they put on that show is as intriguing as their self-induced drama. WWE has plenty of drama on their own. And then the shows happen, and it kind of, after a while, things go away. AEW, it's one thing after another after another. There will be more. We'll see who the next bad guy is. But that's the thing. They let the drama overwhelm everything else that's happening there. And then they complain about everyone talking about it. Fucking you guys get off Twitter and work on your locker room. You know what, though? I've just realized this is all a carefully orchestrated plan. TNT drama. They're trying to, they're trying to go along with the fucking uh, branding of the network. I guess it's all so. been a it's all been a massive web of lies and work. And now everybody's going to come out and take a bow on stage. Punk will be in the lead. Well, there it is, Jim. A long road it took to get here, but an important story to tell. And we tell it here in chronological order. CM Punk and AEW year two. Final thoughts on something that will probably, as time goes by, be a year that a lot of people look at what went right, what went wrong. Well, a seer and soothsayer once said, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. And it took him a long, circuitous journey through fantasy land for CM Punk to finally return home to be the hottest and probably one of the highly, highest paid, is that a word? Highest paid stars in the wrestling business, courtesy of Mr. Tony Khan. Amazing journey, but we haven't got there yet. Maybe we'll we'll have that on the next year's omnibus. Uh, that now, at that point in time, we can announce that Tony Khan fired a WWE champion. Well, there will certainly be more omnibuses and more story to tell with AEW, with CM Punk, and of course with the Cult of Cornette. Listen to the drive through and the experience wherever you find your favorite podcasts. But from all of us here to all of you there. Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, 
Anything else, Jim? That's right, it's a great one. Tally-ho!